Well, good morning, everybody. It is 8 a.m., so if you could take your seats, we're going to get started. I don't think we've ever had this many people at 8 a.m. Uh, at the Sondrager Symposium before, so that's a great sign. Great start to the day. Right. Well, uh, my name is Dan Truckee. I'm the director of the Bowmere Upper Peninsula Heritage Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 23rd Sonderager Symposium here at Northern Michigan University. Uh, 23 years of incredible presentations that some of you, I don't know, has anyone ever been to all of the Sonderager Symposiums? It's kind of like Hiawatha. Russ has, because he started it. Uh, <laughs> I've been to most of them. Uh, and, uh, and it's always a great day of presentations, and we always learn something new uh, and, uh, and have wonderful speakers. Uh, I want to thank uh, members of the Sondrager family are here today. Um, this, this whole thing is made possible by a donation from the Sondrager family in honor of their father, Richard Sondrager, who is the head of the history department here at NMU. And we really appreciate that, making it possible to put this on so you could all have breakfast this morning and uh, have seats to sit in, but also some of the speakers who uh, we've, we're bringing from as far away as Washington, D.C. and Ottawa, Ontario to be uh, presenting today. So we really appreciate that. Uh, today, some of you may have seen the title for this year's Perspectives on 1820 and Beyond and wondered, well, what's such a big deal about 1820? And isn't, you know, shouldn't we have done that in uh, 2020? Well, 2020 was a different year altogether, wasn't it? Uh, didn't think of it in 2020 because I hadn't got here yet, uh, mentally. I, be, I was here already, but <laughs> mentally I hadn't got to 1820, and I regret that. Because uh, it was in 1820 that an event happened in the Upper Great Lakes that I think changed it for all time. And that was the expedition of Lewis Cass. Uh, who was the territorial governor of Michigan. And you're going to learn a lot more about Lewis Cass and the people involved in the expedition and, and also the impact that that expedition had on the Great Lakes in general and the formation of the state of Michigan uh, and eventually the state of Wisconsin, Minnesota, but most importantly, the settlement of this region uh, by people from the United States and other parts of the world. Uh, are, I like to say, in, in talking about this, people have asked, well, why is it so important? And I'm like, well, I, I am here because I'm a beneficiary myself of what happened after this expedition. My family came here from Canada, Finland, Germany, all these different places to live in the Upper Peninsula, to work in the mines, in the lumber industry, and in the railroad industry, and it's all connected to this, believe it or not, because this was the first official expedition to the United, uh, put on by the United States to the Upper Great Lakes region. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in my presentation. Um, I just wanna show you this map to get it started. This is a map that was created by Henry Schoolcraft in 1821, showing the journey they took. The red line is the actual line of the journey, which started at Detroit and worked up the coast of Lake Huron, up the St. Mary's River to Sault Ste. Marie, across Lake Superior all the way to the end of the lake where Duluth is now, and then all the way up to what we now call Cass Lake, which they believed was the uh, source of the Mississippi River. It wasn't, and Schoolcraft would uh, later figure that out 12 years later. And then down the Mississippi River all the way to the Wisconsin River, and then back up the Wisconsin River to the Fox River to Lake Michigan, down to what is now Chicago, and then back. 
though Cass went across land on his way back. They did this journey in five months by canoe, which is an incredible feat in itself. Uh, and it says, it says a lot about what they were trying to do. They didn't have time to stop and really appreciate a lot of what they were doing. They were there to claim it. And this is all now in our ex exhibition at the Beaumier Center. So if you want to learn more about the expedition itself, that's where you're going to go. I hope if you have time today, if you take some time off from the sessions or if you want to come back in another day, the exhibit's up through uh, January 27th. And we called the exhibition Claiming Michigan because that's really what this was about. This was not a journey of discovery. Nothing that they saw hadn't already been seen by generations of Native Americans, generations of French voyageurs and traders, British fur traders, and other Americans involved in the fur trade or just exploration. This was a journey of claiming, of saying, this is ours now. This is the United States. And unlike the French and the British, the, the Americans wanted to settle it. They wanted to exploit it. The French and the British were mostly interested in the fur trade, that form of exploration or exploitation. In the case of the French, they were also interested in saving souls. And the British did that as well. The Americans wanted to create something new. They wanted to expand. And expanded did. And it's the reason why I'm here. It's the reason why many of you are here today is because of what happened after over the next 100, actually not even that, the next 20 years, the next 30 years, 100 years, and now 203 years. So I felt it was a great time for us to take stock of that. Who were these people? What were their motivations? What was here before? Or what did we know before? And what was the lasting impact that it had on this region, both positively and negatively? So that's what today's uh, symposium is all about. And I can't think of a better way to start this than with the guy who started this symposium back in 2000 and who has been the leading advocate for it for so long when he was running the Center for UP Studies and the Department of History. Uh, and that is Dr. Russell Minyagi. So I'd like to welcome Russ up to the stage. All right, you're all set. Okay, thank you. I can okay, as I guess I would say, uh, the granddaddy of the Sonderegger Symposium, I have some additional general comments uh, to make. Uh, and I too welcome welcome everybody, and we've had over the years. Uh, you should remember that we've had uh, literally dozens and dozens of presentations, papers uh, that would have never been presented. Some of them have gone on to be published. Some are available electronically, and it's uh, what what you find is and. It continues to be a problem. Uh, once you cross the bridge, the people downstate, I'm sorry, don't care about the UP. And you can argue that, yes we do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've seen it happen too often, uh, personally, and in general. And so the Sonderegger Symposium is the only uh, conference that brings the whole Upper Peninsula uh, together, presents it uh, to the public. And uh, as I said, we've had, uh, well, you can go on online. I have a, uh, I'm the editor of Upper Country. It's, it's available online. And one of the, one of the uh, recent um, articles listed all of the uh, presentations from the beginning. And you just go through that, and it's uh, amazing in terms of uh, the people that came, 
and the various presentations that uh, that were put on over the years. And as I said, the, well, the uh, Historical Society of Michigan puts on a uh, summer conference, and there's a number of uh, papers and so on dealing with the UP, but this is sort of the grand uh, presentation of the history of uh, the, the heritage of the, uh, of the region. Now this morning, I'm, uh, uh, Dan mentioned, uh, mentioned some points. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about what we knew about the region that the Cass expedition would come into. And uh, we can go back to, um, we find that uh, prior to the Cass expedition of 18, uh, 1820, there was a great deal of knowledge about the Upper Peninsula, Lake Superior, uh, the area of Wisconsin and so on, uh, that had been known going back to the time of Jacques Cartier, 1535. And at that time, uh, Cartier had been sent uh, by the King of France to explore uh, this western country, uh, but primarily f uh, trying to find a, a route to the Western Sea. That was one reason. The other reason was to find gold and silver. So how to, uh, how to find some instant wealth and also the route to the Western Sea, the Pacific, uh, that would bring them to uh, Asia and the, the, markets, uh, the markets in Asia. Uh, at this point, uh, they hadn't quite got into the, into the fur trade. So you're going to find that Cartier uh, talks to the, to the native people about what is in this country. I, is there gold and silver and so on? And they do point out that there's a red metal uh, far to the west, and they talk about a sweet water uh, sea, Lake Superior, or Lake Huron, Lake Superior. Uh, so we get, at that time, in the 1530s, we get the first uh, inf uh, general information about the country that the Cass expedition would uh, would visit. Uh, the Jesuit missionaries then uh, become the next chroniclers of the of the region. Now the Jesuit missionaries um, were many of them were they they were trained as re religious, but they also had usually had a master's degree in some other non-religious uh, subject, uh, mathematics, uh, geography. Uh, they all learned the languages of the Native Americans that they were going to encounter, so they didn't need a translator. And so what you have are kind of a core of, wait, shoot. Okay, there we have Jacques Cartier, let's see. Okay, the, uh, so the, the Jesuit missionaries uh, wrote really dynamite reports from the 1660s uh, forward and they detailed uh, the environment and the people of the region. And what they were, what they were doing was uh, obtaining information uh, as to where the native people were, what the environment was like, what they would have to encounter as they moved into, in this case, the Lake Superior country. And they went into uh, detail about, uh, about Lake Superior uh, and the environment, uh, the clarity of the water, the tremendous storms that could arise on the lake, and so if you just use their accounts, you get from the 16, uh, 1660s and after, you get a very detailed uh, study of, the, um, uh, of Lake, Lake Superior and the region. Um, as a matter of fact, in 16, uh, 1671, a rather accurate map uh, of Lake Superior was published from observations that were made by uh, Claude Alloway and Claude Dablon, uh, two Jesuits, and they, at different times, they went around the lake, they circumnavigated the lake, and in their bouncing canoes, 
uh, went and drew a map of the lake. You have to remember, when you look at this, there is no other map of Lake Superior. This is it. This is the first map of the lake. And I first came across this at a, at a uh, talk at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And the fellow went and took a NOAA, a NOAA map, so a very accurate map of the region, and placed it over this map. And except for, I think, uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula tilting a little to the east and a few other minor, minor points uh, on the map, it is an accurate map. Uh, some people uh, will ask the question, how did we get Isle Royal? Isle Royal is off of Thunder Bay. It's, and if you look at a map, it's, um, um, it should be in Canada. And what happened was in 1750, a uh, cartographer in Paris, I guess, decided that, you know, what is this Lake Superior? Who knows what it is or if anyone's going to go there? And so he decided to ingratiate himself to his boss or bosses. And so he creates a fat, I, I don't have a map of it, but he creates a fat map of Lake Superior with a bunch of islands. And the islands were all named for, in many cases, the wives of uh, the, uh, the uh, people in the um, Department of the Marine. So he was ingratiating himself, and that map is the map that they used uh, when they decided the boundary after the American Revolution. And the map has Isle Royal to the south of where it is. So it makes sense when they drew the map, they just drew it to the north of Isle Royal. A hundred years later in the 1850s, the British re-surveyed uh, uh, or it didn't research, they surveyed the uh, Lake Superior, and my oh my, Isle Royal is north of that, north of the original boundary. Uh, so that's where that, uh, that came from. Uh, that, that came from. Um, uh, the, other, um, the other development, uh, and the, um, the Jesuits then published all of their uh, letters and reports and so on in the Jesuit relations, which are available um, online today. The Peter White Library has a collection of them, if you want to look at a hard copy. And uh, all of their reports uh, were published. Did they actually get to the general population? Probably not, but uh, officials and so on were familiar with uh, the uh, 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 with the inf uh, with the information, um, okay. We had uh, we have some pictures of uh, some of the Jesuit scientists and so on. But there was a, a very interesting uh, Jesuit that shows up, a fellow by the name of Louis Nicol uh, Nicolas, and the thing about him is he came to. Uh, he came to the to the new world. Uh, didn't want to be a missionary. He was interested in the environment, and he and you see on the the right side here, uh, he um, is going to draw the uh, the people, uh, the animals, the the plant life, uh, the environment of Canada, and in many cases, Lake Superior. He was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie and then over to the west at the uh, Mission of the Holy Spirit in modern day uh, uh, Ashland, Wisconsin. And uh, the Jesuits weren't were very happy with him because he uh, felt that uh, there should be a better life for him. And for instance, when he said mass, he wanted to dress in, despite the season, he wanted to dress in gold vestments, which wasn't part of the Jesuit, uh, Jesuit routine. Uh, and uh, he then uh, spends most of his time not evangelizing, but creating this fantastic collection of pictures of 
the uh, Canada and we were part of Canada at that time. Uh, here you have a picture of a beaver, uh, an Ottawa Indian. And what happened is kind of interesting as to what happened. Um, this uh, document, which is a thick book, which I th either the Historical Society or the Peter Wright Library has a copy of it. I donated a copy to them. Uh, it is a large book that got lost. And uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Nicholas uh, left the Jesuits. I think they opened the door and, and pushed him out. They were glad to see him go. And he, um, so he had this book of drawings he gave a copy to uh, Louis XIV, the king at the time, and the, um, the book then got lost. The author got lost, and it just floated around, so we have to be careful. It wasn't readily available to very many people, but it was there. And it uh, was finally picked up, uh, purchased by the um, Gilcrest um, where is it here? Yeah, the Gilcrest Museum. The Gilcrest Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has a thing called the Codex Canadiensis, uh, this book that, that uh, uh, Louis Nicolas created. And it is just filled, and it was published, though. The important thing is that it was published in 2011. And here he had done all this work in the 1600s. And it was this document, a document had gotten lost. Um, uh, so if you get a chance, you might want to uh, might want to look at, or just go online, and they have a lot of the pages from the book uh, uh, online. You can see the the type of work. And he was not a obviously not a uh, uh, developed artist, and so on. Uh, the, the other thing that the uh, Jesuits uh, reported on in a tremendous detail uh, were the copper deposits in Lake Superior, in the Lake Superior region. Um, we have in, in the 1720s, Pierre uh, Charlevoix uh, described the uh, Upper Peninsula. It's interesting, he described the uh, peninsula of the Upper Peninsula as dismal. Uh, he wrote, though, there were, when you got to a place called the Manistique River, they had great sturgeon. Uh, in that area, and he was really hot about that, but this this place to the north, and he was traveling along the southern shore of the Upper Peninsula, uh, it was dismal. Uh, and he did write, it was kind of interesting, uh, in, in 17, uh, 1721, he wrote of an earlier Jesuit, unfortunately he didn't name him, but he was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie, and he had been a goldsmith before he joined the Jesuits, and he was working uh, crucifixes, uh, censers to burn incense, uh, candlesticks out of locally obtained copper. So you, you begin to see these uh, connections, not only talking about copper, but you have some Jesuits actually um, uh, working with it. You also had lay, um, okay, they also talked about they also talked about the size of the fish, the amount of, uh, the amount of fish, uh, and even some of the early maps of the Straits of Mackinac show uh, uh, labeled across the area white fish in big letters. And so you're going to have, uh, you're going to have all, of this, uh, all of this detail uh, coming out at the time. Uh, an interesting, one of the early explorers uh, and uh, he writes about he writes about the region Radisson. Uh, he writes about the region in poor English, and so it becomes rather difficult to identify specific places that he's talking about. But he talks about he travels along the southern shore of uh, uh, Lake Superior, and he also writes about buffalo in Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, and I went and I, when it was brought to my attention, I missed it over the years, and then a friend of mine pointed this out, 
uh, that he had written about it, and I checked into it, the word he used for buffalo and so on, and he was using, so you basically say that some distant buffalo found their way from the plains, though buffalo did, they bypassed Michigan, they went through uh, Wisconsin and Indiana, Ohio, to at least the Appalachian Mountains. So uh, were they here? Yes, and whoops. Well, we lost it, I guess, okay. Um, so you had, you had lay uh, observers uh, writing about the, the Native Americans. There were other explorers like Baron de Lohatan and uh, Sieur de uh, uh, Levendre, uh, uh, who wrote reports about the region uh, to the French government. Uh, what? it out, so okay. just hit that button. Okay. Have to be careful here. Uh, in the 1730s, uh, Louis Denis, uh, Sieur de uh, Durand, uh, was the first uh, white man to develop copper deposits in the Ottenagan area. And in 1735, his shipwrights constructed the first decked vessel uh, to sail Lake Superior to explore, to use for mining. And this was done at a place called, okay, uh, Point, uh, point op, uh, op, Opin, or Point op, uh, a Pine Point, which is about uh, uh, five miles on the Canadian side, five miles uh, 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 northwest of Sault Ste. Marie. It's still there, it's out by the the airport at Sault Ste. Uh, at Sault Ste. Marie, um, it's a big vacation place. Uh, but if uh, but on the map, it's protected from uh, it, uh, the peninsula. Kind of curves around and protects it from the from bad weather. And there were a lot of uh, uh, pine trees in the area. And you're going to find that uh, 1735, they build the first first ship. During the British regime, uh, shipbuilding site continued to be used. Other large uh, ships were constructed. There was the Athabasca in 1780, uh, 1786, the Otter in 1793, the Invincible around 1802. By 1807, the red and white pine along the sandbanks were noticeably, noticeably gone. However, the northwestern uh, and that was part of a fur company, shipwrights continued to build ships in the area. And Alexander Henry, Englishman, uh, builds a uh, first air furnace at the point to assay minerals. Various British visitors and writers informed audiences of the uh, environment of Lake Superior. Jonathan Carver, Massachusetts born, was a colonel in the colonial Army, and he was an explorer and writer who went through the West seeking the Northwest Passage. In 1778, he published Travels Through America in the years 1766, 67, and 68, and it became a popular journal of the region and was wi widely read by Henry Schoolcraft, who will be on the Cass Expedition. Um, the uh, popularity of Carver's work provided Americans and Michiganders uh, with insights into the region and the quality of its land and people. Uh, Schoolcraft pointed out that he found the book uh, useful and indicated that from his personal experiences, Carver had visited uh, the places he had wrote about. Uh, the, geographer, the American geographer uh, Jedediah Morris published someplace, well, they're floating around. Uh, he published The American Geography, or A View of the Present Situation of the United States in 1789. This classic work was read and studied by many Americans. In it, he described the copper and fishery of Lake Superior, uh, the beauty of Sault Ste. Marie, although he inaccurately located the copper deposits in the Tequamanan area and on islands in the eastern end of Lake Superior, he did provide a route for its passage to 
the passage of copper to uh, New York. Uh, he concluded by saying the cheapness and ease for which any quantity of the ore may be procured will make up for the distance and expense of transportation. Of the Lake Superior fishery, he continued, this lake abounds with fish, particularly trout and sturgeon. The former weigh from 12 to 50 pounds and are caught almost any season of the year in great plenty. The terrible uh, savage storms of the lake were described as making navigation uh, particularly dangerous. Uh, Morris concluded uh, with a note for the tourist, the entrance into this lake is from the Straits of, Su of St. Marie, uh, affords one of the most pleasing prospects in the world. So he's an early promoter of tourism uh, into Lake Superior. At approximately, approximately the same time, John Long visited uh, the Lake Superior region as a fur trader, and in a work, Voyages and Travels of an Indian Interpreter and Trader, published in 1791, uh, he described aspects of the Upper Peninsula, went into detail about Native Americans, especially in the Lake Nipigon, which would be in the northwest corner of Lake Superior. He noted that Indian corn and hard grease were the food all traders carry into the upper country. He, also, he was also impressed by the abundance of fish, pickerel, trout, and whitefish of uncommon size in Lake Superior. He also wrote of the great size of Lake Superior and noted that its water, water was so clear that sturgeon could clearly be seen to a great depth. The land which became the state of Michigan remained in British control until the Uh, let's see, until the ratification of the of Jay's Treaty. Uh, according to the terms of the treaty, the British uh, agreed to evacuate their military posts in the Great Lakes region by June of 1796, which they did. And then American control over the region was slowly imposed. Mackinac Island continued as the military, governmental, and commercial center of the Upper Peninsula. So at this point, you have an American presence, uh, but as we'll see, that does not, uh, there's still a reason for the Cass expedition. Even at this early date, many Americans, including government officials, uh, became acquainted with the resources of the region. A map of the United States, I guess it's up there, a uh, map of the United States produced by Samuel Lewis in 1795 showed copper mines to exist on the south shore of Lake, uh, Lake Superior. Four years later, New York Congressman William Cooper had specimens of this uh, metal in his possession and brought them to the attention of Congress. The assayer of the United States tested some of the samples and reported that this copper was pure malleable copper fit for manufacturers. At this time, the economy of the nation needed a local source of copper because an Anglo-French war had restricted importation of British copper. Congress authorized President John Adams to send an expedition to Lake Superior to confirm the presence of copper, and if true, to arrange a treaty with the Indians in order to obtain copper-rich land for the United States. Due to a series of um, unfortunate Delays, the designated leader of the expedition, Richard Cooper, the son of William, uh, never set forth. Um, very interesting, uh, he, they were Federalists. And Thomas Jefferson was not a Federalist, a Democrat. And even though Thomas Jefferson sent out the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore the Western country, uh, his political feeling got in the way here, and he can't, when he became president, he canceled the expedition that was kind of the Cooper expedition that was kind of sitting out there, and it hadn't it hadn't been undertaken. And they they took the government took all the uh, the equipment and the boats and whatnot, and not back uh, uh, back. Uh, later in 1801, due to political considerations, yes, okay. Um, so that 
there was a knowledge of Lake Superior copper in uh, Philadelphia and Washington, but it remained untapped. Alexander Henry, one of the earliest uh, fur traders, uh, known as peddlers from Quebec, uh, came to the Lake Superior country, and uh, he publishes in 1809, he published Travels and Adventures in Canada and the Indian Territories between the years 1766 and 1776. Uh, this is a classic. Uh, this is classic travel literature, and was popular and read by many, thus expanding the knowledge of the reason, uh, region. Uh, Mackinac Island entered the federal system, uh, and kind of became a uh, uh, official outlet for the federal government. When in 1808, uh, the Indian factory or government trading post was established. Uh, on the island, and it uh, was created to attract native trade away from the British, and it lasted until the War of 1812 was never revived. Uh, an interesting uh, individual comes on the scene here, uh, Dr. Francis LeBaron, a surgeon at Fort Mackinac, and he was the next individual to question whether the copper of the Upper Peninsula could be exploited. He, ban he began his correspondence on the subject in 1809, and by September 1810, he addressed a letter to the Secretary of War, quote, on a subject which has long since occupied my mind relative to the probable existence of rich and valuable copper mines in and about Lake Superior and its navigable waters. Uh, from a long residence in the region, Dr. LeBaron had not only heard of copper deposits in the region, but had seen specimens from different locations. He concluded that with government assistance, these copper deposits could become, quote, an inexhaustible source of wealth to those who engage in the working of them, an unparalleled prosperity to this part of our Western uh, position, uh, possession. Uh, Dr. LeBaron uh, also sent specimens of copper uh, in the western Upper Peninsula to John Davis uh, of Boston and Colonel uh, Porter, a member of Congress. Nothing seems to have developed from uh, LeBaron's inquiry. However, in 1810, uh, Secretary of Treasury Albert Gallatin wrote, a, uh, wrote in a report, State of Domestic Manufacturers, that information about copper had appeared in library journals and other publications, and there were wide, widespread expectations for its development by Americans. Settlement in the Great Lakes country, especially in, on the southern shore, however, was slow because of the Indian hostility led by uh, Tecumseh and the Shawnee Prophet. Uh, the coming of the War of 1812 brought settlement to the region to a complete halt. However, specimens of, un, of Upper Peninsula copper continued to be assayed in reports written on its purity and potential industrial use. The uh, William Eustace was uh, minister to the Netherlands uh, uh, from 18, uh, 1814 to his uh, uh, retirement in 1818, during his stay in the Netherlands, he sent specimens of Lake Superior copper to an assayer in Utrecht. Uh, a portion of the assayer's glowing report uh, stated, from every appearance, the piece of copper seems to have qualified for rolling and forging. And that is, ex and its excellence is indicated by its resemblance to the copper usually employed by the English for plating. The report continued that copper, uh, quote, had, has proved that it does not contain the smallest article of silver, gold, or any other metal. So it was pure copper. Later in 1820, Schoolcraft further noted that some of the Lake Superior copper that had been sent to the University of Leiden for analysis was found to be of uncommon purity. Uh, I could go into more detail about LeBaron, but LeBaron is going to, so he's technically a government official, though he's a medical doctor, uh, but he keeps uh, promoting the idea of the development of the copper deposits in the Lake Superior region. 
And you have to remember that at this time, uh, there were Americans that were very concerned about the Western country and developing the Western country and its assets, developing the economy, and as, as Dan pointed out, uh, developing the mines and eventually settling, uh, actually settling the area and bringing this area into the United States. So it was kind of out there, people knew about things, but it hadn't been sort of brought into the United States. And LeBaron continued in one of his reports, uh, quote, in a few years, a colony would be formed of a hardy, industrious, and brave people attracted to the United States and forming a barrier on that frontier which would give confidence to new adventurers, adventurers and would produce a speedy settlement of the immediate territory between the shores of Lake Superior and Detroit. And he then goes into more detail about, uh, about uh, developing these copper deposits. So when you, when you talk about Cass, the people that are on the expedition, many of them were familiar with this. And this is going to be the reason for going into the area, to put that official uh, US government stamp and have an official report go out. Uh, mineral resources of, of the region were not the only items discussed, discussed in scientific publications. In the summer of 1810, a youthful botanist, Thomas uh, Newtel, uh, visited and collected specimens uh, in the vicinity of, Isle, uh, of Mackinac Island. He eventually published his findings in 1818 under the title The Genera of New, uh, New American Plants and a Catalog of the Species to the year of 1817, uh, here he described three, uh, three species new to science from the Upper Peninsula. Uh, a dwarf species of I iris uh, found on the shores of uh, northern Lake Superior in Huron, a large-headed tansy named for Lake uh, Huron, and, a thimble, and the thimbleberry occurring in the northern Great Lakes and found in the west. Uh, Mackinac Island and its fort and settlement dominated the region as the major settlement in the, in the upper country. In 1815, John Jacob Astor of the American Fur Company operated... Uh, uh, ...operated a store on the island, and for the next dozen years, the American Fur Company dominated the fur trade from the central location. At the end of 1815, on December 29th, William Pothoff established uh, the Mackinac Indian Agency on the island, predating the domination of Amer Native Americans that took place after the Cass expedition. Uh, by this time, information about the Upper Peninsula began to appear in a variety of popular publications. Uh, Andrew Miller's Immigrant Guide, titled New States and Territories, uh, in 1818 labeled the region of the Upper Peninsula as the Northwestern Territory and stated that, quote, it lies west of Michigan Territory and Lake. It is bound by Lake Michigan on the east, Superior and Grand Portage north, Mississippi River west, Illinois Territory south. As if to paraphrase early chroniclers, Miller wrote, the territory derives its chief importance at present from its mines, wild game, fish, fowl, and wild rice. Uh, vir virgin copper, he continued, has also been found in several places and iron ore. In 1819, uh, Daniel Blow published a geographical, commercial, and agricultural view of the United States, uh, again calling the Upper Peninsula the Northwest Territory. Writing about Point or Pin, uh, he noted that shipbuilding continued to be carried out there and that there were places along the St. Mary's uh, River that had the potential of becoming mill sites. Uh, neither Mackinac Island nor the copper deposits were forgotten. He noted that his British audience should not be surprised to learn that Americans were finally entering the region to work the copper deposits and that the British should take heed of the possibilities finally wrote that in, the, in November 1816, a company was formed in the United States to develop these deposits, 
which, in, quote, ensures the future commercial consequence of this territory. Uh, the third and last descriptive study of uh, the Upper Peninsula to be reviewed uh, was a uh, pedestrian tour of 4,000 miles through the western states and territories during the winter and spring of 1818, a result of a trip by uh, Eswick Evans. In his work, he described uh, Mackinac Island, praised its fish. The, Mackinac, the Michelin Mackinac trout are bred in Lake uh, Michigan and are celebrated for their size and excellence, sometimes weighing 60 to 70 pounds. Uh, he continued the tract of country lying between Lake, Superior, uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior is rather sterile. The falls of St. Mary, uh, situated in the strait between Lake Huron and Superior, are mere cascades. In this strait, there are, many, there are several islands. Uh, below the falls is situated the site of Fort St. Mary. In this strait are caught fine fish of many kinds. Uh, he went on to write of the Native Americans and ended up saying, uh, the, vicinity, the vicinity of this place, Sault Ste. Marie, is a perfect wilderness. So what, what you have occurring here then is a great deal of knowledge uh, coming, to, uh, coming on the scene and much of this knowledge was uh, understood by American officials uh, all sorts of people, manufacturers and so on, uh, who wanted to develop the United States and open it. And uh, you have all sorts of uh, reports and, and discussion uh, uh, between Cass and, uh, and other officials, uh, uh, John Calhoun, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of War, uh, saying that, that they want this expedition to go out and to, to make sure that everything that has been written and so on gets sort of the U.S. government seal of approval and that the area be, uh, be developed. So uh, as was pointed out and as you'll see in the exhibit, uh, the Cass expedition was not like the Lewis and Clark expedition that went out to, a, uh, to an unknown territory, but they were going through a territory that was known and had been known for a long period of time, but they just were giving the official stamp of approval by the, uh, uh, by the federal government. So I don't know, do we have time for some questions? Thank you, Russ. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Russ? Uh, Use the microphone because we have people watching online. Uh, you mentioned that the expedition was five months. What was that five-month time period? What were the months? They left in May of 1820, returned in September of 1820. Any other questions for Russ or myself? Well, I'll talk about that more in, my next, in the next presentation, but does anyone have any questions for Russ or comments? Russ, I have a question. The ship that they built at Point de Pine or Pine Point, how large was that ship? You know, uh, those uh, the, uh, the specifics about a lot of these ships are are really unknown. Uh, they didn't keep any records, and a lot of times they're mentioned at about that time that they were sailing on Lake Superior. But it was uh, they would the the ship the one in 1735 was to be large enough to carry uh, copper because. Uh, Iran was developing copper at uh, Antnagan. His idea was that the fur traders were busy in the summertime gathering furs. The winter they had nothing to do. They could become miners and mine copper. And then in the spring when the ice broke, uh, send the ship to Sault Ste. Marie and, and get the copper out of the area. So it would have been large enough to carry a profitable supply of, of copper, frequent supplies of copper. After that point, were there always, I mean, was that the only sailing vessel on Lake Superior for many decades, or were there more that were built and used over well, the they, next decades? Well, they did build one in 1780, uh, 1786, the Athabasca. Uh, what was happening was the British and the Northwest Company, uh, operating out of Montreal, 
had established, they kind of stayed on the north side of the lake, and they had established a, uh, a major post uh, at, um, what, oh, anyway, south of Thunder Bay, just across the- Fort uh, William, right? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, at the time it was Fort William uh, up in Thunder Bay, and they had Grand Portage. Mm -hmm. And they, and that, and then, uh, so the Northwest Company was providing information, developing the area, um, and then when the when they finally got the boundary uh, uh, you know, worked out, uh, they moved then to f then created Fort William, uh, several dozen miles to the north, beyond the beyond the boundary. But the Northwest Company was building ships and had active active fur trade. Uh, certainly between Sault Ste. Marie and Grand Portage. Okay, thank you. We got a question over here. I was interested in your comment about uh, the British French War interrupted copper uh, distribution. Who were the competitors? Where else was copper found? before we discovered it here in the United States. Is it all over the place? There were, yeah, there were numerous uh, sites and locations, you know, in Europe uh, where you had a supply of copper. What happened with that, with, with the war, you say, well, why was that a problem? You should have included it. The uh, bottoms of ships were lined with copper to try to control the, uh, the sea worms and whatnot that would burrow into the wood. And so it becomes a wartime material to cover your ships, especially your warships, uh, with copper. And so all of a sudden the British said, hey, we can't, we can't sell this war material to anyone. And so all of a sudden the United States, uh, who was using it, you know, using copper to make uh, utilitarian items and so on, and for ships, uh, didn't have a supply of copper, and this caused a big problem. Didn't the the uh, restriction didn't last too long? The war ended, and the copper uh, continued. Uh, possibly, if you know, and and that expedition, the uh, the Cooper the Cooper expedition. Uh, if that had been successful and they had developed it, developed all the, the settlement and all, uh, you would have had the development of the copper country uh, many, many years earlier, decades earlier. But the, the war kind of brought the demand to an end and as I said, President uh, Jefferson did not, did not want his political opponents, uh, the Federalists, to get any credit, and so his interest in the environment, the unknown uh, regions of the United States, all of a sudden were thrown aside for political reasons. Thank you. Are there any other questions? With uh, there being so much uh, French um, seeming influence in the region of Lake Superior with the Voyagers and the Jesuits. Was, uh, did France have any official or unofficial uh, policy about this area? The, uh, uh, the French viewed uh, the Lake Superior area, this area, as part of the empire. And as a matter of fact, in 1671, in June 1671, they had a major event, a very official event. Uh, there was a, a group of soldiers were there in their dress uniforms. They put up a cross. They put up the French standard. Uh, they had a Jesuit explain to the Indians what would happen if they didn't go along with this. And, uh, they, you know, uh, troops, the number of the stars in the sky will descend upon you from France. So join up, folks. And they brought many, many in, uh, Native American leaders to this event. And at that point, they officially claimed the North Country as part of France. And, and so it was, it was part of, a part of France. Uh, the Jesuits were, were never employed agents of France to uh, you know, find out about the environment and so on and so on, but the information that they provided 
uh, went into, uh, you know, into the French Empire. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, good. Is this or was this a class at Northern? Is it what? Uh, this like stuff about the UP and this history. Was it was it was it ever a class of Northern? I see you were a teacher at Northern. No, I didn't. I, I didn't get the one part. Was this ever or a class? Did you ever teach this this material at Northern? Yeah, I taught the history of the UP. Is it okay? It is a class. And it's. Uh, I've done I've done articles on many of the topics I talked about, and then I have a history of the Upper Peninsula that's available. Does it is it, is it still offered or? Uh, it's being offered in uh, the in the winter winter semester. Uh, Catherine Johnson is going to offer the history of the UP. So if you're interested, it's it's available will be available to you. Thank you. Yep. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the the Europeans and particularly the Jesuits were approaching this region with a a religious like missionary kind of background or like guiding ideal, right? Um, I'm curious, when the Americans started exploring this territory, and, and you talked about how it wasn't from like a discovery standpoint, it was more of a trying to find um, like copper and fur trade and like an economic standpoint, was there a religious aspect to American uh, interaction with the indigenous people as well, or was it purely we're trying to find copper, we're trying to find a fur trade, we're trying to get an economic value from this land. No, what, what's going to happen and, and uh, <clears throat> what is going to happen with the, with the Cass expedition, that's, and that's why it becomes very important. With the Cass expedition, uh, Fort Brady is established, so a military post is established at Sault Ste. Marie to guard the frontier, and there was a chain of forts uh, that went from Sault Ste. Marie all the way in a big arc to uh, New Orleans, basically New Orleans, guarding the frontier. And then at that point, with the coming of the U.S. government into the area, things changed. Relationships between Native Americans and the mixed blood people, the Meti and so on, uh, uh, comes apart. And uh, you're going to find that uh, the... Uh, the government then wants the Indians assimilated, so you be in there's a Reverend uh, Abel Bingham, uh, who is a Baptist uh, missionary, and he comes in as kind of the first Protestant missionary in 1827, soon after the uh, the expedition, and then you have other. Uh, you have other missionaries coming in during the American period. Uh, there are Methodists that come into the Sioux and establish a mission at uh, um, Lance. Uh, and then uh, you have later on, uh, about the same time, you have uh, Father Baraga, Frederick Baraga, a Catholic missionary coming into the area. So the uh, really the Cass expedition is going to then bring American missionaries, among other changes, into uh, into the area. But it wasn't a, it wasn't a primary goal from the outset for them. No, they, they didn't talk about it when when they're talking about the Cass expedition. There's no talk about missionary activity. The government the government only saw it when you were talking about settling the area and how to bring the Native Americans under to be assimilated and become Americans. And at that point, then the government would send in the missionaries as assim uh, assimilators, uh, assimilating the Indians into the American society, promoting agriculture, for instance, uh, uh, bring, uh, Reverend uh, Bingham uh, is going to have farms, he's gonna get the Indians to develop farms at Sault Ste. Marie, but that was not in any of the reports as they're talking about uh, the expedition that, that it was for religious reasons. It was sort of a secondary, secondary reason that, that developed. Thank you. Okay. Actually, Marty Reinhardt will be talking about that this afternoon, so you, you'll wanna be here for that. 
Well, thank you very much, Russ. Uh, we're going to take five minutes for people to get drinks and use the bathroom and or whatever, and uh, then I'll start up, okay? Thank you very much, Russ. Let's hear from Russ. Great job. Just pull this out? Yeah, just pull it out. We're good. Okay. Excellent.
All right. All right, everyone, we're going to start in a minute. So uh, if you could take your seats, that'd be great. All right, good morning and uh, welcome back. That was a wonderful presentation by Russ. Thank you so much for uh, setting the stage of what, we, what was known about this region uh, before the expedition of 1820 by Lewis Cass and party. Um, one of the things that led me to creating this exhibit itself, um, some people have asked me, so what did you come up with the idea of doing this exhibit about the expedition? And what was happening was I was doing research about various aspects of early history of the state of Michigan, the formation of the state of Michigan, and some of the individuals involved. And they all seemed to be converging back on that expedition date. Um, all these people seem to be connected to some way, or it all kind of starts there. And that's because of these two individuals. Lewis Cass and Henry Schoolcraft, who were so important to the formation of the state of Michigan, uh, uh, who met as a part of this expedition, and I'll explain that a little bit more. I'm going to read my presentation, but I will occasionally go off the page, but uh, I've got a lot I want to say, so. Over the past decade, there has been an increasing debate in the United States about what it means to be a hero. Some individuals, much heralded by previous generations for their great achievements and contributions to society, are now looked at from a more critical perspective, challenging what it means to be a great man or woman. Statues and monuments to these individuals in some cases have literally been toppled or their names re removed from buildings once named in their honor. Right here on the campus of NMU, we recently removed the name of Dr. Luther S. West, from the science building after his decades of educational achievement at the university were tainted by his unapologetic embrace of the theory of eugenics. Such reckonings in any society are difficult at times to weather for they create a wedge between traditionalists and progressives. Where certain values such as strength or conviction, courage, bravery, and intelligence always should be celebrated. Personal beliefs and antiquated views of society reinforcing race, racist, sexist, and homophobic ideals are no longer glossed over in the burnishing of their reputations. So it brings the question, who should we build statues of or create monuments to to celebrate if everyone is fallible and imperfect? How will future generations view the heroes that our generation lionizes? Should we lionize anyone at all? Are such monuments themselves a form of hero worship that is long past its expiration date? And this is the statue of Robert E. Lee that was recently removed from uh, view in Richmond, Virginia. Honestly, I just want to say there was a lot of discussion whether it should be removed, what they should do with it. I felt they should have left it exactly like this to tell the story not only of how it was created, but what happened. I personally felt this would have been a more fitting tribute than it being removed. Lewis Cass and Henry Schoolcraft are perfect examples of such individuals who were once much admired by people across the state of Michigan and beyond, but whose reputations have been tarnished by their own attitudes and actions, which are now seen as out of step with a pluralistic and inclusive society. Counties, cities, streets, lakes, buildings, and schools bear both their names. But in some cases, these designations are now being called into question. Some believe that this is the beginning of erasing their names from public memory, while others believe that it is a reckoning that is long overdue 
and that where their memory will continue, we should not be honoring men who obviously were flawed and out of touch with their current social views. The question, of course, is what did both of these men achieve and why are their achievements now being called into question? In truth, the idea of the Bomir Center's current exhibition on the 1820 expedition of Cass originated in my own research on he and Schoolcraft and their legacies on the state of Michigan. What I, has found, what I have found is that all roads led back to that expedition as it was that which brought these two individual, individuals together and began a long mentorship between the older Cass and the ambitious Schoolcraft. Now we'll begin with Lewis Cass, who in many ways epitomizes the American dream of ascent to greatness, well almost. That is because he did not succeed in his quest for that highest position of President of the United States, but more on that later. The son of a revolutionary war hero, Lewis Cass was highly motivated to make his own mark on the country. He was born in Exeter, New Hampshire in 1782, educated at the prestigious Phillips Exeter Academy which at that time was free to attend with the aims to teach young men in the great end and real business of living, to regulate the tempers, enlarge the minds, and form the morals of the youth. His father was an army officer who was relocated to Wilmington, Delaware, and, Harper's Ferry, and then Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, where he worked as a recruiter. In 1801, he resigned his commission and moved the family to Marietta, Ohio, where he and his sons built a cabin for the family. After arriving in Ohio, Cass embarked on a career of law, joining the practice of return Jonathan Meigs. It is here that we begin to see a division between Cass and his father, who was an ardent Federalist. Cass was becoming entranced with the political direction of Thomas Jefferson, which had much appeal to the younger generation. In 1806, he was elected to the Ohio House of Representatives. In 1807, named the U.S. Marshal for Ohio. When hostilities with Britain commenced in 1812, Cass was appointed the commander of the 3rd Ohio Regiment, which soon saw an action along the US and Canada border in the Michigan Territory. William Hull, the governor of the Michigan Territory and commander of Fort Detroit, and Cass's superior officer in rank, but not in military tactics. In fact, he would, it would be Hull's lack of military experience and incompetence that would hand the fort to the British in 1812. Though Cass stood positioned to attack the enemy, Cass would return to Washington to tell the story of, to the Secretary of War and, the blame, and put the blame firmly on Hull. A year later, as the aide-de-camp to General William Henry Harrison at the Battle of the Thames on October 5, 1813, with the recapture, you'll see this slide here, is of the, uh, the killing of Tecumseh at that battle. And it was actually this painting or drawing was done uh, in honor of Cass. Now, Cass is not the guy doing the shooting there. Cass is one of the guys up in the corner on a horse. He was a brigadier general, and the two other gentlemen are Commodore Oliver Perry and General William Henry Harrison. With the recapture of the Fort of Detroit, President James Madison appointed Cass the governor of the Michigan Territory on October 13, 1813. It was only 18, eight days later. Over the next seven years, Cass worked to promote Michigan as a place of settlement for Easterners looking to move to the state. Oh, myself. Um, though the Erie Canal would not open until 1825, there was a growing desire for land that had been off limits before the American Revolution. This meant that treaties had to be signed with various Native American tribes in the region. By the end of the decade, Cass was tasked with managing a massive territory encompassing all the lower and upper peninsula of Michigan, Wisconsin, and northern Minnesota. There were only 8,900 people living in the region, mostly comprising of the members of the many indigenous tribes across the territory, including the Odawa, Ojibwa, Potawatomi, Menominee, Winnebago, Ho-Chunk, Dakota, and others. He managed it from his 500-acre farm in Detroit the front of the Detroit River. He had several servants, including a slave named Sally. He also had a servant named Jeremiah Gazelle, who apparently was a fugitive slave that Cass apparently assisted with buying his freedom. By 1819, Cass had been administered an increasingly large territory, most of which he had not visited. After the creation of the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, 
The remaining part of the Northwest Ordinance was designated the Michigan Territory. However, most of it was still populated and controlled by the various indigenous tribes of the region, which had stronger ties to British Canada. With statehood already on his mind and that of many Michigan and that of many of Michigan's growing populace, he saw a need to gain not only greater knowledge of the extent and the makeup of the territory, but paved the way for expansion. On November 18, 1819, Cash wrote to the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, to request support for an expedition to the Lake Superior region the following summer. And then later, he laid out the following objectives. One, a personal examination of the different Indian tribes who occupied the country, of their moral and social condition, of their feelings towards the United States, and of their numerical strength. Two, to procure the, ex the extinction of titles to the land in the vicinity of Sault Ste. Marie, Prairie du Chien, and Green Bay. Three, an examination of the body of copper in the vicinity of Lake Superior. Four, to ascertain the views of the Indians in the vicinity of Chicago respecting the removal of the six nations to that district of the country. Five, to explain to the Indians the, view of the views of the government respecting their intercourse with British, British authorities at Malden and distinctly to announce to them that their visits must be discontinued. And 10, to ascertain the state of the British fur trade within that part of our jurisdiction. He concluded stating that it is very important to carry the flag of the United States into those remote regions where it has never been borne by a person in a public station. On January 14th, Calhoun wrote back stating that he supported the expedition and Cass spent the winter planning his route, ordering supplies and building his team to make this arduous journey. With the support of the War Department, which in the early 19th century was in charge of Indian affairs, and the reason why is rather than being uh, run by the Secretary of State, the tribes were not seen as sovereign nations. They were seen as largely combatants and enemies to some extent. So that's why the Secretary of War was in charge of the Indian affairs. Cass began planning the expedition. The key element was transportation. And though sailing vessels were now common on the lower Great Lakes, canoes were chosen as the mode of transportation. Because the goal was better to understand the landscape and the geology of the region, canoes would allow for better access to the shoreline for study. Also, they would need to travel up rivers as well, which would be nav wouldn't be navigable by boat. Cass ordered three canoes from the Saginaw Band of Ojibwa Indians for a May launch. These were large Montreal canoes using a wood frame, birch bark exterior, 36 feet in length and six feet in width. This is the one that we have on display in the exhibition, which is only 30 feet long. These canoes fully loaded with crew and goods could carry up to four tons of goods. However, this was not a trading expedition. So the main items that they needed to bring were food, shelter, weapons, scientific equipment. In addition, Cass brought goods not necessarily to trade, but to gift to Native American tribes and leaders that they met along the way. This is especially true for the treaty negotiations in Sault Ste. Marie and other places. Cass needed a large team to pull off such an ambitious expedition. First, he needed experienced canoers and guides who knew the routes and terrain, so he hired a group of 12 French voyageurs and 10 Anishinaabe, Ojibwa, Adawa, Potawatomi, and also some Shawnee uh, to be the main paddlers. Because he was representing not only the Michigan Territory but the U.S. government, he was authorized to recruit seven soldiers from Fort Detroit that joined the party as well. Because of the main purpose of the expedition was to assess the landscape and mineral resources, Cass needed both a mineralogist and also a topographer. Henry Schoolcraft had already distinguished himself in his survey of Arkansas and was selected by Calhoun. David Bates Douglas was an instructor at West Point and was given the leave of absence to study the landscape, navigate, and also be an engineer. And other people, Dr. Alexander Walcott, who was a, a physician, later became, I think, the mayor of Detroit. James Doty was the official secretary. He went on to become, I think, the territorial governor of Wisconsin and then Utah. Charles Trowbridge became a, a major uh, player in Detroit, uh, but also Trowbridge Park in Marquette is named for Trowbridge. So Henry Rose Schoolcraft was born in Gilderland, New York in 1793. He entered Union College, 
uh, at the age of 15 and then Middlebury College. He worked in his father's trade as a glassmaker but had a deep interest in geology and mineralogy. At the age of 25, he left home to explore the West. In 1818 and 19, along with Levi Pettibone, he conducted the survey work in the Missouri and Arkansas and identified lead depo lead deposits and then published his report, A View of the Lead Mines of Missouri. This brought him attention from the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, who suggested him uh, as the mineralogist for the expedition. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of depth about the expedition because you can go see that at the exhibit at the Beaumier Center. Uh, but this is, a, this is a famous painting actually done much later than 1820. This was done in the 1850s by uh, Francis Hopkins in Canada of an excursion. So be, even then they did like excursion trips for tourists in Voyager canoes. Um, but this would give you an idea of what it would have been like with the paddlers and then the, the leaders of the expedition not paddling in the middle of the boat. So they left Detroit, went up the coast of Lake Huron, which uh, Schoolcraft himself became bored with because it, it doesn't really change much. Uh, there's no real major rock formations other than the turnip rock at the tip of the mitten. Uh, and uh, other than that, it, it was pretty boring. And they were, by the time they got to Mackinac, they were really happy. Interesting enough that Mackinac, um, this is not a, a painting. It was done right around that time. It's not a painting of the expedition. At Mackinac at that time, there were ships, so they were resupplied by ships uh, at Mackinac. The reason they were in the canoes is because they had to go along the shoreline to do their study of the topography and the mineralogy and to meet the Native Americans along the way. They then traveled up to Sault Ste. Marie, up the St. Mary's River. One of the things that they did discover in this region was the great deposits of gypsum and limestone which would become incredibly important later in the iron ore industry because they were key to the smelting process. And that's why to this day we still have dolomite and limestone mines and quarries in the eastern upper peninsula. This is a drawing by uh, uh, Henry Schoolcraft that was put into his journals that he published in 1821 of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, again, he was neither the first nor the last to exaggerate the height of the mountains in Canada. Uh, and, uh, but it is still a great image in itself. Um, this was an incredibly important stop along the way and was really the only contentious thing that happened in their journey that I could find. Uh, Cass's task when they went to Sault Ste. Marie was to sign a treaty with the tribes there to basically get a large portion of land along the river. And the whole point of it was to uh, be able to build Fort Brady or a fort there and have a military presence. And everything would happen, of course, later on also uh, to make sure that trade was flowing through, uh, in particular when the copper mines opened up and then the, the Sioux locks eventually. His uh, main, uh, the person he was negotiating largely was Shinga Bawasan, uh, who's there wearing one of the medals that he received from a, one of the presidents of the United States because he signed many different peace treaties and they would get these medals of the president of the United States that they signed a treaty with. Uh, and Shinga Bowasa was the leader of the tribe there, but there was also another group there uh, that had a, a more younger group who were very much against signing anything away. Shinga Bowasa wasn't sure himself. He was a little bit concerned. Their main concern was not necessarily the land, their concern was if all these soldiers and Americans are coming here, what are they going to do to our people? They were worried about the security of their people. In the end, the, the other leader of the tribe or the band uh, basically walked away from negotiations, went back to his wigwam and raised a British flag. Cass walked over, took the flag down and took it away and they prepared for battle but uh, both uh, Jane Johnston Schoolcraft's mother, Susan Johnston, and uh, her brother, uh, I think it was Jim Johnston or Jack Johnston, went over and basically stopped any type of violence happening and they renegotiated and in the process, the United States government got a much smaller parcel of land to build a fort. They also gave up or, or allowed the rights of Native Americans to continue to fish and hunt in the area. This is incredibly important because to this very day that's still used as a precedent with the Sioux tribes and many tribes
were treaties that later were signed and then reneged on because those rights were taken away by states and by the federal government in some cases. They traveled uh, to Grand Island uh, along, and they were much impressed, of course, by the, uh, uh, the pictured rocks. Uh, stopped in Grand Island and uh, were much uh, celebrated by the Native Americans who were there. Uh, they had a big celebration for them. It was at this time that Schoolcraft, now this is going to be interesting, because Schoolcraft is going to make his name writing about Native American culture, storytelling, uh, their history. He writes in his journal at this event how bored he is. He says, they're dancing and they're singing these songs forever and we have to pretend like we're enjoying it. I think it says a lot about Schoolcraft because, as I'll talk a little bit later, that, you know, it's not that he's in love with this stuff. He sees an opportunity. And that, in many ways, his character and Cass's are much the same way. These are very ambitious people. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here's a picture of uh, the picture rocks done by Schoolcraft. They then went up from Grand Island along the lake. Uh, they camped at not what is Granite Point now, but Little Presque Isle in Marquette. And then uh, did the portage, uh, which was a river at that time, not just a canal, to Lake Superior and down to Ontonagon. Uh, this is actually uh, Schoolcraft's drawing of the uh, rock formations at Little Presque. So in Ontonagon, uh, they had heard about this huge piece of native copper that one could see. In fact, I like to call the what is now called the Ontonagon Boulder, I like to call it the, the wall drug of Lake Superior at that time. If you traveled around, along Lake Superior, you had to stop and see the Ontonagon Boulder because it was the largest piece of copper that anyone had ever seen, uh, pure copper. And so Schoolcraft, uh, well, actually, several of the people in the expedition headed up the Ontonagon River. This is quite an arduous trip at the time with Indian guides uh, and were led to the boulder. Uh, Cass didn't make it all the way. They got to a point where they had to hike up hills, and he just couldn't do it physically. And so he stayed back with the party and the canoes, and a couple, a few canoes made it to the expedition. And this is uh, Schoolcraft's depiction of the actual boulder. He lied. It's nowhere near this big. He even comments in his journal how disappointed he was with the size of it. Uh, and it had been gouged out by previous visitors and carved up. And so it wasn't nearly as big. He, was, he created this picture basically to spur interest in the region. That if they were pieces of copper this big, people wanted to go there. So that is why he made it so big, but he himself even said it was much smaller than that. This is gonna be a very important thing later because to this very day, the Ontonagon Boulder is still a contentious issue with the Keweenaw Bay Indian community uh, and, uh, and the Smithsonian Institution, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. From Ontonagon, they headed to the uh, lakehead or Fond du Lac, uh, where Duluth is now, and then traveled inland up to what we now call Cass Lake. It was called Red Cedar Lake by the Native Americans. Um, and at that point, uh, which is that far northwest part of the map, uh, they decided that this was the source of the Mississippi, even though Schoolcraft had his doubts and would later go back in 1832 to, to prove otherwise and then travel back down the Mississippi to Minneapolis, where they met with tribal groups, and then to Prairie du Chien at the mouth of the Wisconsin River, and then up to Green Bay, to Lake Michigan, and back to Detroit. All in five months by canoe. Approximately 4,000 miles, visiting Lake Superior, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, dozens of rivers, including the Mississippi, Wisconsin, Fox, St. Louis, and St. Mary's River. This is another painting by Francis Ann Hopkins from Canada at a later date. So what happens afterwards? Well, first of all, think of it, the Erie Canal opens in 1825. Michigan's population in 1820 is just under 9,000. By 1830, it's 32,000. By 1840, it's 212,000. 
there is a huge increase in demand for land and places for Americans to live. So this is one of the first things that happens. Lewis Cass would travel back up to the upper and western Great Lakes several times to pursue his ultimate goal for the US government and Michigan Territory, uh, the acquisition of land through treaties with the Native Americans. Look at my clock here. Sorry. OK. In 1822 or 1825, the Erie Canal opened, and soon a rush of migrants from northeastern U.S. were looking to settle. Uh, in 1821, the Treaty of Chicago, which was negotiated by Cass, and the U.S. acquired a large L-shaped tract of land, which is now southwest Michigan. In 1825, Cass returned to Prairie du Chien to achieve what he began in 1820, renegotiating a lasting peace and delineate boundaries between the regional tribes. The treaty was signed by U.S. officials and representatives of the Sioux, Ojibwa, Sauk, Fox, Illinois, Menominee, Iowa, Winnebago, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes. By doing so, Cass would now be able to negotiate with each individual tribe for lands that the United States wanted to acquire. A year later, Cass would return to Lake Superior and negotiate a treaty with the various Ojibwa tribes at Fond du Lac along the St. Louis River. Representatives from the following bands attended and signed the eventual treaty. The St. Mary Sioux, St. Croix, Le Pointe, Lac, uh, Le Coup de Ray, Lac de Flambeau, Ontonagon, Vermilion Lake, Snake River, Rainy Lake, Sandy Lake, Fond du Lac, and the Crow Wing Rivers of the Ojibwe people. Article 3 of that treaty stated that the Chippewa tribe grant to the government of the United States the right to search for and carry away any metals or minerals from any part of their country. But this grant is not to affect the title of the land nor the jurisdiction over it. So at this point, they weren't saying that the United States now was in jurisdiction of the land or taking it away. They just wanted the mineral rights. And that should tell you where their whole thought process was at that time. Now, along with Cass in 1826 was the Secretary of Indian Affairs, Thomas McKenney. During the treaty, a band leader named Jichish Kinwen stated, there is a rock there. I met some of your people in the search of it. I told them if they took to steal it, not to let me catch them. Another Ontonagon band leader said, on the subject of the rock, the father's is the property of no one man. It belongs to us all. It was put there by the great spirit, and it is ours. During this time at Fond du Lac, McKinney was visited by an Ojibwa who was looking for Cass. He was deeply impoverished and forlorn in his looks. It was Washpikabins, who was the same man who had led Cass and the party to the expedition uh, Ontonagon Boulder six years earlier. He told Cass and McKinney that he had been cast off by the band because they believed he had offended the great spirit by showing the expedition the way to the Boulder. He had since, su since suffered much hardship which he took as confirmation of his offense. With the treaty signed, McKinney returned to Washington but hired a party of 25 men to try and remove the Ontonagon boulder, now that the United States could claim it as its own. They were unsuccessful, even though they built a fire on top of it to try and soften it to be broken up into pieces. The boulder was finally removed in 1843 by a crew hired by Julius Eldridge, or Eldred, who had bought it for $150. And many scholars believe that the only reason the tribe sold it to him, uh, or the leader sold it to him, was because they didn't think he'd be, be successful in moving it. Unfortunately, he was. And this is uh, a sign at the reservoir in Victoria, the Victoria Reservoir, where uh, the Ontonagon boulder would have lain. It's all underwater now. And the actual boulder itself at the Smithsonian Institution which is now on display between two elevators because that's the only part of the building strong enough to hold it. So that's just as big as it is. Compare that to uh, Schoolcraft's uh, depiction. By 1831, Cass was a highly regarded territorial governor, but after 18 years in the post, his ambitions were pushing him towards more power and status. He had embraced the policy of relocation of Indian tribes to the west of the Mississippi River because he believed that it was impossible for American settlers and Indians to live in peace 
if the tribes insisted on governing themselves. In his mind, he was trying to protect uh, the future Indian tribes, but also believed what Indian has ever been injured by the laws of any state? We ask the question without any fear of answer. If these Indians are too ignorant and barbarous to submit to state laws or duly estimate their value, they are too ignorant and barbarous to establish and maintain a government which shall protect its own citizens and preserve the necessary relationship and intercourse with its neighbors. Such beliefs put him in good graces with President Andrew Jackson, and in August 1st, 1831, he was appointed the new Secretary of War, which gave him jurisdiction over all of Indian affairs. It now fell on him to administer the policies of the Indian Removal Act that was signed into law in 1830. During his tenure, he oversaw the removal of the Seminole and Creek people to Oklahoma as part of the Trail of Tears and also some from the Great Lakes region. And this is just some of the people in the trails that were taken to uh, west of the Mississippi. He believed, and many people believed, that this was good. Put them out there because no one's going to want to move out there. No Americans want to going to move into those prairies. There's nothing there. They were so naive about what was going to happen in the coming decades. In 1835 and 1836, a new treaty was being negotiated for the acquisition of the northwest part of the Lower Peninsula and the eastern half of the Upper Peninsula with the Adawa and Ojibwa. Leaders amongst the tribes, in particular the interpreter Augustin Hamlin, implored caste to not remove the tribes from Michigan. When the Treaty of Washington of 1836 was signed, reservations were created for the tribes to live on until time of relocation. These reservations still exist to this day. And it's probably due to their relationship with caste and also schoolcraft that they were able to ex uh, secure their permanence in the region. With his return to Detroit, schoolcraft began working on writing his journal about the expedition. And by 1821, he had completed and published the narrative journal of travels from Detroit Northwest to the great chain of American lakes to the sources of the Mississippi River in the year of 1820. Whew, that was the title. The book was a great success and elevated Schoolcraft's status as a geologist and explorer. By 1820, Cass was greatly impressed by Schoolcraft and on their journey named him the agent, Indian agent for the Michigan Territory. He traveled to Sault Ste. Marie to act as his base of operations. It was there he was reacquainted with the Johnston family who he had met briefly during the earlier visit and was invited to live with them. During the following winter, a romance grew between him and Jane Johnston Schoolcraft, who was known by her Anishinaabe lane, a name, Women of the Sound Rushing Through the Sky. They were soon married and this created for Schoolcraft an important connection to her Anishinaabe family, clan, and band. From Jane, a poet in her own right, and her mother, Susan, whose name translated into Women of the Green Glade. Schoolcraft began collecting Ojibwe and Odaba stories and Sue began publishing a magazine, The Literary Voyager, and then books compiling these stories. He, he is considered many the father of American ethnology for these collections and they heavily influenced Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. However, one of his most last lasting legacies was his role as an Indian agent where he worked to pave the way for the acquisition of tribal lands for the United States. The most important of these was the Treaty of Washington in 1836, which was the culmination of years of developing relations with the regional tribes. Comprising of the northwest third of the Lower Peninsula and eastern half of the UP, this was the largest treaty acquisition in the state and was crucial to Michigan, which would be granted statehood in early 1837. In 1841, he was dismissed as the Northern agent by the new administration of William Henry Harrison, his old commander, um, a former military colleague of his, uh, and this was for political purposes because he was in a different political party. He would go on to continue publishing his research and memoirs before dying in 1864 at the age of 71. Uh, also, before he, he left office or left as this agent, he was tasked by, this, by the territory of Michigan to actually name many of the counties, or it was the state of Michigan at the time, to name many of the northern counties, which he did, naming them after Native American uh, leaders who he had worked with and knew, uh, but also making up names. He loved making up his own type of names based on some uh, 
mythological ideal. And so a lot of them were named by him and then later were changed by opponents of schoolcraft. Uh, so they, they would change over time. I did a presentation about this at the Sondreger, I think three years ago. You can go online at our website and watch that presentation if you want to know more about it. With the opening of the first shipping lock in Sault Ste. Marie, 1855, commercial shipping of copper, iron, and lumber became viable. Though these goods were already being shipped, it was a costly process as goods had to be unloaded and then transported by rail or barge through Sault Ste. Marie to a waiting ship, or in some cases, the entire ship was portaged through town. With the opening of the locks and time and money were saved, and this opened the region's natural resources to greater exploration, this is a very early photograph of the first lock, and on the right is the Native American fishing village, which they were able to build because of the Treaty of 1820, and later was removed when they needed to build new locks. The US government removed them. This led to a boom of mines along the spine of the Keweenaw and the Market Iron Range. But the locks also brought people to the Lake Superior region to settle and work in the new towns popping up along the shore and inland. With the development of the mines and towns, there was an increased need for lumber, which was in great supply everywhere they looked. As the cities of the Midwest grew, the UP forest began to disappear as the need for lumber grew with each passing year. And by the beginning of the 20th century, the landscape of the Upper Peninsula was greatly altered. Its pine forests had largely been decimated, and the hardwoods would soon follow. Mining districts were greatly profitable, but were barren landscapes punctuated by small towns neighborhoods and trailing ponds or tailing piles. Along the shore, Lake Superior sprung lumber mills, stamping mills, pig iron smelters, manufacturing plants for everything from industrial chemicals to leather tanneries. Cass's accomplishments as the Michigan territorial governor set the region on the course of statehood, but it also helped him accomplish what he wished for most, higher office. He was a deeply ambitious man who saw his public service as an avenue to greatness. After serving as the Secretary of War until 1836, he was appointed, appointed the ambassador to France by President Jackson. He returned home in 1842 and ran unsuccessfully to be the Democratic candidate for president in 1848. In 1845, he was appointed a US Senator for Michigan by the State House. Um, his platform was dominated by his belief that it should be the citizens, not the federal government, that should permit slavery in a particular state or territory. Um, and this is what he coined as popular sovereignty, um, which was the belief that it should be up to the territories and states to determine whether they should have slaves. Leave it to the people who will be affected by this question to adjust it upon their own responsibility and we shall render another tribute to the principles of our government, furnish another guarantee for its permanence and prosperity. This is an example of his writing. He writes around issues like no one else. He, he wrote a 50 page speech that could have been reduced to like five pages because he, he never wants to get to the point. He wants to go around it and around it and then finally come to the point but also never to really put his feelings on the line. He was a great appeaser, and that was how he became known, not a compromiser, but as an appeaser to say, I, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. And so that's why he supported the idea that states should determine whether they have slaves or not. As I said about schoolcraft, he went on to become the superintendent of Indian Affairs uh, but then was taken out of office. From that point on, he really focused on his writing career and being a literary individual. Uh, and we're going to learn more about his relationship with Jane Johnston's schoolcraft in just a few minutes. So I'm not going to go into that. This is the Native Americans fishing on uh, the St. Mary's River, as the Treaty of 1820 stated they would be able to do so even though there were many times when they were prevented from doing so, including the destruction of their village. I think it's really important to think about what happened to many of the people who Cass relocated. Um, this is a, a group of Potawatomi who had been relocated from Michigan and uh, 
who were sent to Kansas to live on a farm. And this is a picture of their home. Uh, it looks like they're being fairly prosperous, but this is not their home. And across the plains are these tribes that all came from the eastern United States, including parts of Wisconsin and Michigan, Minnesota. Uh, and this is just an example of Cass's work. And probably the most prominent the young man asked earlier about the religious aspects, where Cass was not so interested in that, later on in the 19th century, it was American policy to re-educate and Americanize the youth of Native American youth through the boarding school system. This is the school in Mount Pleasant. In the end, one might ask, how should we celebrate and remember these two individuals? Are they heroes to be celebrated? Should we judge their actions and attitudes by today's standards? It is easy to say that they were just men of their time and did what any white man would have done at that time. In truth, that's not exactly true. One of the great American folk heroes of the early 19th century, Davy Crockett, himself a U.S. representative, opposed the relocation of indigenous tribes from the East. With regards to slavery, Cass himself was at odds with an insurgent abolitionist movement for political expedience, and certainly not on the right side of history. As for Schoolcraft, his work as an Indian agent, as benevolent as he may have thought he was being, would have lasting ramifications for the indigenous people of the Great Lakes. His appropriation of Anishinaabe culture for his own self-aggrandizement certainly was in step with his times, but shows that his ambitions far outweighed his sensitivity to others, including his often abandoned spouse. In the end, what I believe we should judge about these two men are their motivations, which were not altruistic or for the greater glory of their country and state. They were driven by their own insatiable desire for greatness, power, and vainglory. And I believe we are seeing that now. Uh, the state office building that was named for Cass was renamed in 2020 for, days, uh, for civil rights leaders Daisy Elliott and Melvin Larson. And to this day, Cass's statue still represents the state of Michigan in Statuary Hall. Uh, it's not the only statue that, there that could be called into question. There are also Native Americans who are represented there and, and various individuals, including civil rights leaders. Uh, but Cass still represents the state of Michigan. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to open it up if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. I'm going to pass the mic. You can pass it on to the next person. On your map that showed the uh, the route of the cast expedition. Yes. Uh, Isle Royal was circled. Did they go there? No, they did not. The thing about that map is that Schoolcraft wrote that this was drawn by him. He had to have based it on a lot of other maps because he didn't go to most of the places. So he must have used earlier maps and then drew the route along that map. He wasn't a map maker himself. Um, an interesting thing is that there's another big island in Lake Superior called Isle Filippo that's on that map. It doesn't exist. Now this is not uncommon for some of the early maps. That, that early Jesuit map was incredibly well accurate, but many other later maps would be very inaccurate and they would invent things, mountain ranges, islands, all sorts of things that didn't actually exist. So Schoolcraft just used somebody else's map really, and just plotted the, the route along it. Are there any other questions? Fred over there has a question. So I was curious about your population. You, you had mentioned that uh, there was around 9,000 people, I guess, 8,000, 9, uh, in 1920, I think. How many, that I presume that did not include the Native Americans? And could you talk a little bit about how many Native Americans there were? No, it, it did include the Native Americans. Yeah, they had done a survey. Um, and because there were people out there, and so they had done a survey, and they did, they believed that there were, but there probably were a lot more Native Americans in the region at that time. I was going to say that must But have been it did time. include Native Americans, as many as they knew. Um, so, yeah, it, it was indigenous people, but there, uh, at that time, the, the, the Americans and the Europeans that were in the region 
were largely in Detroit or at one of the forts that were located or fur trading posts that were located. So that was where the main population was being. Many of them were soldiers or fur traders. Well, I guess part of my, my interest in that was, um, you know, there's been a lot written about how dramatically the Native American population was reduced by the epidemics when Europeans first came to the East Coast. But I've not heard how much the population had changed in the upper Midwest among the in indigenous people because of those European diseases that were brought in probably a couple of centuries earlier. But uh, and, and actually even very recent at that time, and Marty Reinhardt, who's going to be speaking later, I think can speak to that more directly. But yeah, no, there were, there were many instances in the 1600s and 1700s of large-scale uh, disease killing many people in the upper Great Lakes, and probably preceded even Europeans coming here, because the, those diseases spread it very quickly mm -hmm. into, uh, across the, the continent after uh, Europeans came to the East Coast. Uh, one of your earlier earlier slides uh, listing the participants in the Cass expedition. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Native American paddlers, but also a dozen voyageurs. Were those voyageurs French Canadian descendants of voyageurs that settled in what is now Michigan and who had previously paddled that area? Absolutely, they were all based in Detroit, as far as we know because that's where Cass planned his expedition and recruited. And there were a lot of voyagers living there at that time because the fur trade was still very active. And Detroit was uh, a really important uh, center in the fur trade and settlement in general. And so there were a lot of voyagers living there who were descendants of earlier voyagers uh, living there since Detroit was founded as a uh, fur trading post and a fort in the early 1700s by Cadillac. Uh, and so uh, there was a long history uh, voyagers living there. And some of them, there were British voyagers as well, but they were primarily up in the north as part of the Hudson Bay Company. Um, actually, later today, uh, Dr. Sebastian Millette is going to be talking about the Métis voyager culture, and he can speak a little bit more on to about that. While I have, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Russell. While I have the uh, microphone, when you talk about the, the Indian population, and I think... Um, uh, it's Schoolcraft that points out, or it doesn't matter if he did or didn't, a lot of times the census taker would visit a, a, a village, but the male population might be out hunting at some other uh, location. And so they were getting a very limited uh, number of, of people. And that's one thing. The other thing you talk about, the, uh, the smallpox epidemic, uh, during the French and Indian War, the English sent out blankets that had been infected with smallpox. Smallpox is kind of comes off as crusts, and so they put it in the blankets and then pass them out. And we do have, uh, there's an article uh, that talks about about that and the number of Indians, it wasn't hundreds, but there were a number of Indians around the eastern upper peninsula that were uh, uh, infected by the smallpox and died. And that's only from the, from the church records uh, that we have the information. There were, there were obviously a lot more. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? With the five-month expedition that you're talking about, um, and you mentioned that they were having food supplies shipped along, but they also did a lot of hunting. Um, I was just curious, what kind of food did they take with them, and um, how much did they depend on their own food, and how much on hunting and other supplies along the way? They actually, basically, their diet was based entirely on what they could bring. They didn't really have time to hunt and fish. Um, they were so busy getting to the next place. Um, and occasionally, if they couldn't travel due to weather, they would try to hunt, but they usually talk about being very unsuccessful. They weren't very successful at it. Um, their diet would have 
primarily have been of dried goods, things such as peas or beans and salt pork, uh, which were really the standard fare for traveling parties like this on canoes going back to the 1600s. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the voyagers who paddled from Montreal to the Lake Superior region were called the manger de lard. They were the, the pork eaters because they ate salt pork pretty much their entire travels. And so I think that would have been a standard part of their diet, would have been, and probably uh, flour for biscuits or some type of hardtack or something of that nature. That was primarily their diet. Um, and, and also probably what the Native Americans would provide them. They would pick up supplies at the different forts and trading posts that they went to along the way as well. All right, well, we uh, need to make time to get uh, Sarah Daniels up here, so uh, thank you. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them later or at lunchtime or something. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, it's right there, man. In that white bag. So let me bring up your uh, email. Okay. We'll start at yeah, okay, in like I'm four minutes. So. so I'll start from the beginning. All right, there you are. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely.
All right, we're going to get started again with our next presentation. Uh, before our next presentation, someone reminded me of something during the break that I forgot to do. And I think it's a very important thing to do. I, I get sometimes too caught up in what's going on early on. And that, especially since a lot of our sessions are dealing with Native American culture and the people of this region, I did not do a land acknowledgement, which we typically do at events at Northern. So I'd just like to say that our university resides on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe. We are the first university in Michigan to have a Native American studies major. The first graduate set program graduated recently. Our core values as a university are inclusion, and this is about recognizing history and moving forward as one community. So we always want to, uh, to say that before we begin any event. So I apologize for not doing that at the very beginning, but I thought it was very fitting to do so before our next speaker, Ms. Sarah Daniels. Uh, Sarah is a candidate for a master's degree here at Northern, and I became aware of her uh, work on Jane Johnson's school schoolcraft when she applied for a job with me, only to find out that she didn't qualify because she already had a job. And uh, graduate assistants can't have two jobs on campus, for good reason. Um, and, but her sample, the writing sample she sent me was this wonderful paper about Jane Johnson's schoolcraft. And so I said, well, yeah, you can't have the job, but would you speak at the Sonderiger Symposium? And she said, yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, thank goodness, because I need somebody to do this. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome up Sarah Daniels. Good morning. Um, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay, awesome. I've been told I'm a quiet speaker, so I wanted to make sure. Um, but yeah, as, as we've said, my name is Sarah Daniels. Um, I'm an MFA program candidate here in creative writing specifically. Um, so one of the things I love most in life is poetry. Um, so I want to take a moment and just thank everyone for taking time out of their morning to come here and to listen to some wonderful, wonderful presentations that we've already heard so far, um, as well as to take some time to talk about one of the things I love the most, which is poetry right now. Um, and I specifically, I want to talk about a poet who I think is really important, um, both in terms of history and literary um, history in Michigan. And I think she's one of the most important voices in early Michigan history, um, and also one of the kind of least remembered or least talked about, unfortunately. But before I kind of talk about the name on the screen behind me, I do want to ask you a couple questions. So the first one is I want you to think back to your high school or middle school, maybe college experience and think about what poets and authors you remember being asked to read. Um, so maybe what, what was your 10th grade English class reading list? Or if you're anything like the classes I sat, sat through um, in middle and high school, what kind of poets did people like sigh at and roll their eyes at? So just keep those, those names in mind for a moment, if you would. Because my second question is, where have you heard the name Schoolcraft before? So if you've been here earlier this morning, you've heard it a lot so far, right, in the past couple of hours. But if you've lived in Michigan for any period of time, you've heard it outside of this room as well. Um, Schoolcraft College in Livonia, where my father graduated from. Um, Schoolcraft Road in Detroit, a major road there. Um, even Schoolcraft County, which is just a couple, or one county over, I believe, from Marquette County. So the name is everywhere in Michigan um, and in Michigan history. And most of us have heard it in several different contexts. And of course, it refers to Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, who we just spent time talking about, um, who was an ubiquitous figure in early Michigan history um, and contributed a lot in terms of ethnology and recording Native American histories um, and is well known for his contributions um, in the Michigan State Legislature, as well as the expeditions he went on. But fewer of us have, have heard of in any substantial way his first wife, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, um, it's a shame that we haven't heard as much about her because she's a really fascinating person and a really fascinating poet. Um, she was a poet. She wrote over 50 poems that have been recorded and saved. Um, and she also was one of the first people to write down um, these sort of traditional or oral, usually orally told Ojibwe stories. Um, and, and I want you to think back for just a moment to those names you thought of on the first slide. Um, the, the people you read in high school or middle school. You might have thought, you know, William Shakespeare, maybe George Orwell's 1984. 
I think I read um, Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby three separate times for different teachers. So a lot of the same names come up a lot. And it's something that a lot of schools are trying to change now, this sort of, these reading lists that are predominantly male and predominantly white and tell the same stories of the same groups of people who have been in power for decades in this country. Um, and I want to talk about Jane Johnson's schoolcraft because I think she's a good counterbalance to some of these more traditional reading lists. Um, her writings and poems weren't really quote unquote rediscovered until the, until the early 2000s, about a century and a half after she wrote them. But now that we have rediscovered them, I think it's time to, to try to find her authentic voice as a writer um, and as a figure in Michigan history. She's important for several different things. She was the first in many different categories. She's the first known Native American woman writer that we have in what's now the United States. She's the first known Native American literary writer across the board that we know of. And she's also the first known Native poet and the first known, again, writer of indigenous stories um, in which she's recording down these orally told Ojibwe stories. So she's really important in terms of literary history, but she also lived in a really interesting time. Um, she was born in the year 1800 in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and she was born to a powerful and influential family in that area. Um, her mother's side of the family was Ojibwe. Her grandfather uh, was a Ojibwe um, war chief and civil leader. And then her father was a Scots-Irish fur trader in the area. And between her two parents, they had um, really powerful connections across their community, um, both with the European fur traders, with the Ojibwe community living there, as well as with the Mati, who were a blend of indigenous and European ancestry. And because they had an extensive network and con of connections, they were of help to Henry Schoolcraft when he moved to Sault Ste. Marie in the 1820s as part of his role as an Indian agent. Um, and Jane navigated a world that encompassed a number of early American um, cultural kind of signposts, if you will. She, was, she lived among fur trading, um, the effects of colonization, indigenous lifestyles and traditions, as well as the Mati community. She was bilingual. Um, she grew up speaking Anishinaabe Moan as well as English. Um, and she was also fluent in multiple literary or narrative traditions. She would have grown up hearing Ojibwe stories from her mother, as well as reading um, in her father's extensive library, more European literary traditions. And in fact, as a young woman, she went actually to travel Scotland and Ireland with her father which you can imagine would be a really unique trip to take at that time. It's not something people usually did for fun, right? You couldn't really hop on a plane and, and jump over there. So she really, she occupied and was able to navigate a number of different literary, cultural, and linguistic spaces that make her just a really fascinating person to read about. And a great example of this is just the many names that she took on throughout her life. Her Christian first name, obviously, is Jane. Um, but she also wrote under several different pen names throughout her life. She wrote under the name Rosa, as well as Leelanau. Um, and if you're from Michigan, you might recognize the word Leelanau. There's Leelanau County. And actually, Henry Schoolcraft did name that after his wife. That was one of the counties that he named. Um, and it was a pen name that she wrote under. And also, as we touched on earlier, she had her name in Anishinaabe Moan, which translates in English to woman of the sound the stars make rushing through the sky, which is a really beautiful name. Um, but I think also emblematic of the way that she was able to navigate different cultures and languages um, and literary spaces, um, using kind of different personas and different names to represent herself. She's also a really important voice um, to remember because of what was happening around her and, and the kind of snapshot of life that she captured during this. She was born in 1800, but she didn't die until 1846. So that means she lived through a period of tremendous change um, in this territory. She lived through the 1836 and 1837 creation of Michigan as a state. Um, she lived through the early 1830s in which, I mean, we talked about the Indian Removal Act earlier, um, but she lived through the beginning of the Trail of Tears, right, which we now know as, as ethnic cleansing, um, in which 60,000 or roughly 60,000 indigenous people were displaced, and many, of course, died along the way. And she also lived on sort of these shifting lands. There was great change going on in her community and in um, her territory at the time. Um, in part, we'll talk about later, due to her own husband. Um, but we talked a bit earlier about the changing populations in Michigan at the time. She was born when there were you know, a couple, a few thousand people in this area. And then when she died, there were hundreds of thousands of people in this area. 
So it just goes to show you how much life is changing around her. Um, and the ways that she kind of provides us a really unique voice and perspective on a, a really fascinating time in American and Michigan history. So she's such an important voice and such a unique voice. Why haven't most people heard of her? Um, and I ask myself this a lot. And I think if, if we want to answer this question, we have to think a little bit about the word archive. Most of us know what archives are. Um, you could go to your local university one or the Library of Congress archive. Um, and in a lot of ways, they do really important work and are, are wonderful things, um, but they're fallible, like, like most things. And archives don't always capture the full story. Um, they actually, the word archive comes from the Greek word that means the house of the ruler. So the way that we preserve history and document it has always been bound up in ideas of power. Um, you know, you've heard the, the victor tells the story type of, of slant, saying before, and that's true in archives too. A lot of times the documents that are preserved and the stories that are preserved, both in archives and just in like our general collective histories, are the stories of people who were in power um, and groups who were in power. And those are the, the stories and the documents that often get chosen to be preserved um, and studied as we, as we uh, move forward. And that leads me to this idea of what we call archival silence. And archival silence happens um, when there's a gap in our collective histories, when there's a voice or a perspective missing because it either hasn't been preserved in terms of documents or it's been distorted or, you know, in term, in falsified in some way. And one of my favorite writers, Carmen Maria Machado, writes about this idea in her memoir. And she says that something very large is irrevocably missing from our collective histories. We're missing a lot of indigenous history um, and voices in our historical perspectives. We only have to think back to those reading lists we thought of at the beginning of this presentation um, to realize just how many voices are missing in, in our education system um, and in our kind of general collective histories of the United States. And part of the reason that Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's voice is kind of obscured um, is her husband and she had a really complicated relationship with her husband, Henry Schoolcraft. They were married in 1823, um, and they were married for over 20 years before she passed away. So over two decades of marriage together. And in a lot of ways, it was a loving marriage. Um, their letters to each other are often affectionate. Um, they seem to have a level of respect and affection for each other. But it was also a lonely marriage. Um, Henry spent a lot of his time traveling. He had a lot of duties. Um, to the Michigan government and to the United States that brought him out to the East Coast and away from Jane. And in many of her letters, she wrote to him expressing this loneliness um, and, and feelings of alienation. At the same time that he was her romantic partner, he was also her, her literary partner. He published um, many of her, her works that we have access to today. This wasn't really a traditional publishing. Um, he and Jane created this sort of handwritten literary magazine together that we saw a picture of earlier um, called The Literary Voyager. And this handwritten magazine they would send to their friends and family, as well as Henry's connections on the East Coast and in Detroit. So it was pretty localized, but it, it was a, a physical record of Jane's work, um, which has allowed us actually to continue to study her today. Um, so at the same time that he was her publisher, in some ways he was also her translator. Um, she wrote in both Anishinaabe Moan and English. And in some of his publications in the literary magazine, he would translate um, her original Anishinaabe text into English. And we'll talk more about his translation later. Um, he was, yeah, definitely um, an exaggerator of, in many capacities in his life. But at the same time that he had this personal relationship with her, he also had um, a complicated professional role that, that really kind of puts into conflict his personal relationship with her. He was on the 1820 expedition with Cass, and then he went on another expedition 12, later, 12 years later um, in which he found the true source of the Mississippi River. And as part of these expeditions, as we've talked about, he was part of an expanding colonial US force um, that was looking to develop this land, right? Um, it was looking to further the country's economic interests at the cost of the indigenous people who were living there. As well as, um, his time serving on the Michigan State Legislature and as an Indian agent, he helped negotiate roughly 15 million acres of indigenous land out of indigenous stewardship and into the control of the United States. So he was a large contributor to those shifting lands that Jane Johnson Schoolcraft lived on um, and to that increasing colonization that she lived to see. 
Um, and even his translations and publications of her work are complicated because they're not always faithful translations. Um, as he wrote down her poems and her stories in The Literary Voyager, he took an approach that he called free translation. And he used this word free um, to sort of give himself permission to alter her original text and intentions behind her text. His poems are drastically different than her initial um, writings of them. In fact, her, her works really weren't rediscovered until the early 2000s, and they were stored in his manuscripts in the Library of Congress and other archives. And people really only rediscovered them by looking through his things in the Library of Congress. Um, and as a result, her, her voice is kind of filtered through his, even as we've tried to understand her in her own right. Um, there are modern translations of her um, Anishinaabe Moan works that are much more faithful translations. Um, and we can luckily use those to kind of see the inconsistencies and inaccuracies in Henry's translations of her work. And I would like to argue that rather than his free translation, as he calls it, it was more of a co-option. He did more to take over Jane's voice than he did to really translate it into English. And of course, we know co-op means to absorb something into a larger group or to take over. And the definition kind of echoes this idea of colonization in which you know, the United States government forcibly absorbed swaths of land and peoples into, the, into their United States colonial context in the same way that Henry, in many ways, absorbed Jane's voice into his own and took over her original intentions in her writing. And one of the best examples of this is her poem that she wrote called On Leaving My Children, John and Jane at School in the Atlantic States and Preparing to Return to the Interior. Jane and Henry had four children together, only two of whom survived. And the two surviving children, Henry really wanted to go to this boarding school on the East Coast of the United States. Um, we can presume because education maybe would have been more established or formal there. Um, but Jane was really against this. Again, this is not an easy trip for a mother to make. She, it's not like she could see them very often. And communication would have been fairly irregular. Um, despite her protests, though, Henry insisted that these children go to this boarding school. And this poem she wrote as a response to um, having to leave behind her children so far away from her home. So I'm going to read a modern translation of this work, a more faithful translation of this work, before talking a little bit about how Henry made changes to it. So this is On Leaving My Children. As I am thinking when I find you, my land, Far in the west, my land, my little daughter, my little son, I leave them behind, the faraway land. But soon, it is closer, however, to my home I shall return. That is the way that I am, my being, my land, my land. To my home I shall return. I begin to make my way home, ah, but I am sad. I'm not going to read Henry's free translation, mostly because I want to focus on Jane's voice, but also because it completely changes her original text. He changes multiple aspects of it. He changes the meter, the rhythm, the rhyme scheme, as well as the content. Um, you'll, you'll notice in the reading of it, um, the English translation doesn't have um, the same sonic or the same sounds um, that the Anishinaabe Moan version would have. But he, in his English translation of this poem, inserts this really rigid meter and really rigid rhyme scheme that kind of changes the musicality and like the shortness of Jane's original writing. You'll notice her, her original poem is quite short. It's only four stanzas long. The lines are really only a few words at a time. But he transforms the poem until it's six stanzas long with these really lengthy wordy lines. Um, and he inserts these different lines that were never there to begin with, um, as well as erases ones that were really pivotal to the poem. <clears throat> Some examples of how he kind of shifts the focus of this poem. Um, she writes about her personal grief, right, and leaving children behind. And he shifts the focus of this poem until it's more political in nature. Um, he inserts this political slant that just wasn't there to begin with. Jane's poem is powerful because it's so personal and because it's so intimate. We see this in the first person language she uses with, throughout. My little daughter, my son, my land, my home. And it's intimate because she addresses her home, the land, directly. As I am thinking of you, she writes in the first line. But Henry shifts that into a more political stance. In one of the stanzas he sort of inserts into the poem, he writes, there roved my forefathers in liberty free, 
There shook they the war lance and sported the plume, ere Europe had cast over this country a gloom. Jane makes no reference to Europe or war or violence in her original text. Um, these are things that Henry sort of invents or inserts. And ironically, even by acknowledging colonization in a negative light, which he is doing, he perpetuates it. He writes in references to the, to the United States and to colonization that Jane doesn't focus on in her original text. So in a way, he co-ops or even colonizes the voice of his half-indigenous wife in order pri to prioritize his own complicated feelings about their relationship and his role as an Indian agent. It's possible he knew that maybe she had negative feelings around um, the colonization of this land, but it's not his place necessarily to insert her feelings into this poem, especially when representing it as a translation. He changes other things about the poem. He changes the ending to name one. Um, in, he in Henry's ending of her poem, he writes the stanza, I return to my country, I haste on my way, for duty commands me and duty must sway. For there I must leave the jewels that I love, the dearest of gifts for my master above. And Jane's, in contrast, reads, my land, to my home I shall return. I begin to make my way home, ah, but I am sad. One of the things that strikes me about this change um, is just one word. He changes land to country. And there's something about the framing of her home that he changes here. She conceptualizes it as this land, right, that she has an intimate relationship with. He views it as the nation, as his country, that she sort of owes a duty to. He references duty multiple times, both in this final stanza and throughout the poem. So by the end of the poem, Henry has sort of reconciled or resolved Jane's grief with, by having her acquiesce to her duty to both her husband, as well as her duty to her country and to God or the master above. Jane doesn't make any reference um, to the country or to God or to even the word duty that doesn't come up at all. In fact, Jane doesn't resolve her grief in any way for us by the end of this poem. She ends on, but I am sad. So despite her returning to home, despite her acquiescing to her husband's wishes, she still feels this complicated, unresolved grief. And as a result, her poem is much more interesting. It's much more complex but he rewrites the ending so that she sort of gives in to this idea of duty to country and to home, which speaks both to the misogyny that she would have faced as well um, as the racism and anti-indigenous sentiment that she would have faced. And I think one of the most egregious ways that Henry co-ops Jane's voice is not in what he adds to the poem, but in what he takes away. There's this really pivotal line in Jane's original poem that reads, the way that I am, my being. And it's her most explicit reference to herself and her, her identity and her personhood. And Henry takes this line out of the poem entirely. The closest approximate line in his free translation of her poem makes another reference to her duty in her country. So essentially he has taken her out of her own poem and replaced this reference to her selfhood with references to the United States and to her duty. Um, he has written her out in many ways of her own poem while still presenting it as something that she wrote and she created. He co-ops her identity as an indigenous woman and a writer in order to further his own personal feelings or agenda. Um, and in this way, he co-ops rather than translates her work. And this co-option extends far beyond just this one poem. He translated her other works too, um, a number of poems and stories that she wrote, which of course calls into question how faithful of a translation are these other translations. Um, and as I mentioned, as, as we both mentioned earlier, Jane wrote down a number of Ojibwe stories and was the first one to kind of put these into a permanent record or a writing. Um, Henry took these stories that she wrote and published them in several of his own books and collections of stories and often unattributed, unattributed um, often did not give credit to his wife, who was the one who taught him these stories. Um, and then when Henry Longfellow published A Song of Hiawatha, which was a really famous epic poem in the beginning, um, in early Michigan history. If you've ever driven by the Hiawatha National Forest, by the way, in the UP, it was named in part after this figure that Longfellow writes about. But Longfellow took inspiration largely from the, the stories that Henry Schoolcraft reproduced. 
So in many ways, one of the sort of early bestsellers of Michigan history um, is largely owed to Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, who gets very little, if any, credit for her participation in it. And there's this sort of story that I, I discovered as I was reading about Mary um, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft and researching her life that really sticks with me as an example of the way that her voice was co-opted um, outside of her poetry even. When Jay Johnson Schoolcraft died in 1846, Henry Schoolcraft remarried a year later, um, and he married a white woman from the American South named a Mary Schoolcraft. And Mary Schoolcraft was also a published female author, which was rare at the time. Um, so we can imagine they also had a literary relationship, just as Henry and Jane did. But Mary Schoolcraft's work was a little bit different than Jane's. Um, she's most known for the book The Black Gauntlet, which was a literary response to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And most of us are familiar with Uncle Tom's Cabin as an abolitionist piece of literature, one that depicts the horrors of everyday slavery. Um, she wrote The Black Gauntlet and co-opted that, that sort of slave narrative, um, instead depicted enslaved people as happy with their material reality and happy and content with their lot in life. It was a horrifically racist book. It was pro-slavery. Um, and the first person that she thanks in her foreword to this book is her then husband, Henry Schoolcraft, who she said supported her in this. And I'll remind you that Henry Schoolcraft has two um, part indigenous children. Mary Schoolcraft was vocally, vocally against um, the mixing of races. Um, she was outspoken throughout her lifetime and had, as a result, Henry Schoolcraft's relationship with his children largely deteriorated after marrying her, as we can imagine. Um, but in her thinking of him in the foreword of this book, the first word that she uses in this entire book, which by the way was a bestseller at the time, um, she misspells, she does a mis phonetic misspelling of the Ojibwe word for my husband. Um, and so we can imagine that she didn't grow up around many people who would have spoken Anishinaabe Moan. Um, she likely learned this word from Henry, who was fluent in it. And we can imagine that Henry was probably called my husband, often by his first wife, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. And so it really um, represents this moment in which she misspells this word and misrepresents this word um, as the first word in a horrifically racist book. Um, it really represents to me the way that Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's voice and language was sort of taken and misconstrued and misused over time. But there are ways that we can remember Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's authentic voice um, and who she was as a professional and a writer and a human being outside of her relationship to Henry. One of these things is just supporting language revitalization efforts in general um, in Michigan and across the United States. Um, we owe it to the people who continue to speak and learn and teach languages like Anishinaabe Moan that we have more accurate translations of her work, um, that we don't have to fully rely on Henry's trans free translations of her work. We can also push school, school boards and teachers that we know to start integrating her into their classrooms. She's such a crucial part of Michigan history. She's such a crucial literary voice um, that to not have her taught, especially in Michigan schools, is really a, a, quite a sad thing. And then the third thing we can do is really just probably maybe the simplest and most manageable thing, which is to read her work and to share it um, in its most faithful translations. You can find her work usually in archives or libraries, as well as just by Googling her online. Um, she really has been rediscovered and, and kind of brought to the forefront more in the past several decades. Um, and I'd love for us maybe together to kind of help preserve that memory um, and further her legacy even more. And so on that note, I, I would love to end with her voice rather than my voice or Henry's voice or anyone else's to give her the spotlight that she really deserves. Um, I would just invite all of you, if you're interested, um, this QR code links to one of her works that I'm about to read right now. Um, I'd invite you to, in some way, either read it later tonight or send the link to someone you think would like it or share her voice in some small way so that we can remember Jane Johnson Schoolcraft um, for who she was and her contributions to literature and history in Michigan um, outside of her husband, Henry. So in a moment, I think we'll have time for questions, and, but I, I do want to end on, on Jane's voice. So this poem is called Lines Written at Castle Island, Lake Superior. And it's translated from the, um, the original Anishinaabe Moan. Here in my native inland sea, from pain and sickness, sickness would I flee. And from its shores, an island bright, gather a store of sweet delight. 
lone island of the saltless sea. How wide, how sweet, how fresh and free, how all transporting is the view of rocks and skies and waters blue. Uniting is a song's sweet strains to tell, here nature only reigns. Ah, nature, here forever sway, far from the haunts of men, away for here there are no sordid fears, no crimes, no misery, no tears, no pride of wealth, the heart to fill, no laws to treat my people ill. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you. That was excellent, Sarah. So questions, uh, Russ has one. Now, just make an observation. The uh, Northern, uh, Northern uh, Michigan University Archives has the whole collection of Schoolcraft's papers uh, on microfilm. So if anyone's interested, and I think the, if I'm not wrong, I haven't done any work on it, but there, there are the letters between Schoolcraft and his wife, and I don't know how deep that gets into if there's the poems or anything are, are in that. But anyway, we have, the, uh, we have that on campus. Yeah, awesome, so that's a wonderful resource. Thank you for sharing, yeah. Yeah, it's impossible to read too. Because <laughs> yeah. it's an old microfilm and it's Henry scribbling, so it is unfortunately really hard to read and to find stuff in. I, hopefully they'll digitize it someday uh, at the Library of Congress. Any other questions for Sarah? Yeah, just a second, let me cross through here, it'd be easier. So if you're looking this up, how can you distinguish the, the original versus the, you know, translated yeah. via husband? This is a great question. So how can you find the original text, right? Yeah. Um, there's a source I have actually on the resources page here. Um, Robert Dale Parker was the person who really kind of rediscovered Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's writings. Um, and he was the first person to publish a kind of a full length book focusing specifically on Jane. Um, it's called The Sound the Stars Make Rushing Through the Sky, The Writings of Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and if you were to read that, he includes her more faithful translations of her original texts. Um, you can also, there's a art, great article by Bethany Schneider um, called Not for Citation, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft's Synchronic Strategies, and she includes original versions of the text as well. Um, also, if you just Google Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, um, poetry.org has a number of her poems published, and I believe those are more accurate translations as well. Yeah, but great question. Any other questions? Marie's got one. Dan get his exercise today. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was just a uh, similar question. Uh, even if we have Robert Dell Parker uh, trying to be a little more faithful, how, how do we interact with the idea that these folks are all language learners? Was there a first speaker that uh, translated the original at some point that these folks are drawing on? Because I, I noticed the, uh, a lot of it is it's written in phonetics. Like I, I can, as a, la a language learner, I can yeah. pick it out and see things that she was saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would interpret it or translate it the same. Same way, So right. that, I'm wondering who, who made that judgment call? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one I'm not super able to answer right now, but I think it's a really interesting point. Um, that even with modern translations, a lot of these people are language learners who are, who are translating it right. So even with the more faithful translations that we have, um, it's good to, to keep asking about how faithful they really are um, and, and in different ways that we can, they could be read potentially or could be translated. Um, and that's, I feel like that's one of the interesting things about translated pieces of literature in general is how, what kind of choices do translators make as they're trying to stay faithful to intent and to sound um, and to rhythm, especially with poetry. Um, so I wish I could answer that in a better way. Um, I'm not aware of anyone, um, any one source a lot of them drew from, but I, I mostly just took mine from these sources, yeah. Okay, miigwech for that. I had another question too. Sure. Uh, so as with many of the firsts in history, you know, we laud them because they're the first, right? 
Yeah. And so we assume the positive about them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we delve deeper into their history, we find out some things that are not so flattering about them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Suzette LaFleche, who is lauded as the first Native American uh, physician mm -hmm. and female, and so you know everybody like oohs and ahs over her, but she was really assimilationist. Mm -hmm. She was like, hey, you know, Native people assimilate into white society as soon as you can so we can be saved. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, you know, delving into a woman who married a man who was very pro-assimilative and yeah. racist? Uh, what are your thoughts about her in that, in that way? Was she someone who thought, Jesus, we Indians, we got to get on the bandwagon and lose our culture? Or, or was it something different? Yeah, so it's another thing that makes Jane really interesting to study, I think, is the fact that she does have such a complicated marriage. Um, and she definitely, Jane was definitely Christian. She definitely believed um, that people should be Christian, essentially. So in, in some ways, she was assimilationist in that, in that sense. Um, and she more, we don't know 100% her personal feelings about a lot of these things, because again, she's so filtered through the letters that we have with her husband um, and his translations of her work. Um, but we do know that she did care deeply for her husband, and so in some ways um, was supportive of him and his career, right? Um, and that would make, that's what makes her in part so complex and, and worth studying, I think, is because she has this complicated relationship um, to the Michigan becoming a state, to being married to an Indian agent. Um, and her, her works being first are important because in ter be there first, but also because um, they give us an insight in kind of the, the kind of the complex the complexity that she would have had, um, and I'm not sure 100 percent about her personal feelings towards things like colonization, but I do know she she did support a lot of what Henry did, and she was Christian if that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we got one over here. I'll come get you in a second. Fred. So my question is, did Henry Schoolcraft translate her letters to him? Yeah, great question. So she, she was fluent um, in literature in both Anishinaabe Moan and English. So she, she wrote the letters in English. Um, she, just was, she was a bilingual writer in that sometimes she liked to write in Anishinaabe Moan, um, and other times she wrote purely in English. Um, so the only times he would have translated her work um, were really specifically with poems that she wrote initially in Anishinaabe Moan. Yeah. Are there any sources where we have uh, native speakers reading her poems yeah. so that we can hear what they sound like as she wrote them? That's a great question. Um, I didn't include any here, but I think there are some accessible like through YouTube if you were to look it up, um, some, some readings of them in their original, original sound. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious too uh, uh, about why she didn't Write, write at least the stories, I suppose, in the English. Uh, do, we only, do we have any writings outside of her letters that mm. uh, survive in English? Because it seemed like she could have translated her own poetry. Yeah. I suppose that's a hit, and I'd be curious of your thoughts, or guessing as to sure. why she didn't. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so she did have writings that survived in English. Um, the stories that she recorded that are you know, traditional Ojibwe stories she wrote down in English largely. So those we don't have to guess at as much. Um, she wrote poems both in English and in Anishinaabe Moan. And I, I guess I'm not sure why she didn't translate some of them on her own. I'm, I'm guessing be just because she more wanted them in the voice and language, um, res the respective voice and language when she wrote them. And then Henry would have taken his own initiative in translating those. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but. Oh, there's a question. I'm sorry. I was talking to somebody in back. I feel like Phil Donahue. <laughs> uh, a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, you know, taking the time to discover uh, maybe not so much the poetry, but the, the suppression and the translation to take one vision and in reinterpret that person's vision another way through the husband basically. Um, we see a lot of that happening in the world today where those in power are suppressing uh, voices <clears throat> and trying to change the narrative in their own, their own view. Uh, my question to you though is, um, 
You know, there's a plethora of opportunities to write about. What brought you to writing uh, this, this story? Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy you asked this. Um, I had a really wonderful professor during my undergraduate degree at Central Michigan University. Um, it was my women's writers class that it was the first time I'd ever heard of Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Um, and so really it's thanks to her that I've ever heard of her, really. Um, and her story just kind of struck me right away um, as one that's really fascinating. Um, and it's just a person who I think deserves recognition for her literary contributions, um, kind of beyond just being associated with her husband. And so it was important to me to maybe look into her and try, try to discover what I could about her on my own, um, because she, I do think she deserves, in her own complexity, to be understood in her own right. Um, so I hope that answers your question. But. Are there any other questions? Um, one difficult thing, and, and I think I read this in, uh, in Parker's book, mm -hmm. is that she became addicted to laudanum later in life, and uh, many believe they may have been what attributed to death. Would you comment on that to some extent? Yeah, so she did, um, she died in Canada with her, she was with her sister at the time, um, and in, like many moments in her life, Henry was not there while she died. Um, again, their, their marriage was in some ways strained by his duties to the government um, and to his job in which he was often apart from her. And so um, she did die without Henry there. And she was sick for a while before she had passed away. For years she'd been battling with different illnesses. Um, and in part to medicate for that, she did take, yeah, she did become addicted at some point to laudanum. Um, and yes, yeah, people do speculate that this contributed eventually to um, the causes of her death as well, um, which I think just makes her even more of an interesting person to study in terms of the number of things that she experienced um, and adds another layer of complexity to her marriage, um, which was alienated enough that she did die apart from her husband. But, yeah. I think that was very common at that time of women who were suffering in their marriages often became addicted to laudanum. Often it was prescribed to them because they were becoming difficult mm -hmm. in their relationships with their husbands, and it was seen as a way to solve the problem that they were having with their husbands. Yeah. I'm on my way. Do you have any information as to how, did she have any further relationship with her children that went off to school? Yeah, I mean, she maintained, I, I believe, like letters with them as well, um, and a relationship with them. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure on their age when she passed away, um, but they were, I mean, they were young enough that they got to know Henry's second wife, Mary Schoolcraft, and and had a deteriorating relationship with him specifically. Um, their relationship, as far as I know, remained strong with Jane throughout her life until the end of her life. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, Sarah, thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thank really you excellent. so much. Um, we have 15 minutes until the next presentation, which is the keynote with uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary uh, Newland, who I believe should be arriving any minute. So uh, there is some coffee left and water. I'm not sure what happened to all the breakfast stuff. Did we eat it all? Or did they just take it away? We ate it all? Well, good. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Uh, after his speech, there will be some food next door. I don't think there's a lunch, a full lunch for everybody who's here. I wasn't sure how many people we would have. I should have guessed more. But there is food. Go over there and see what you can scavenge afterwards, uh, after the keynote. Thank you.
so they were easier for the for, for, for
All right, everyone, if you take your seats, Secretary Newland is here. Well, uh, before we get started, I do uh, want to remind you that there will be some food next door in Ballroom 4 if you're hungry. I'm not sure how much, but we'll see how many we can feed. If not, there's the Wildcat Den downstairs that you can go to as well. Uh, it is a great honor that we have uh, Brian Newland here, the Assistant Secretary for the Interior and Indian Affairs. Uh, I, I want to thank Deanna Hemela, uh, who is our government liaison officer uh, at Northern who really made it possible for him to be here. Um, it's not easy to get someone as busy as him to come to a place to give a talk like this. In fact, he's headed to New Orleans directly after this, so wow. I'm jealous because I love New Orleans. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm so excited that he came and is here to speak uh, on this topic. Brian Newland is a citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community, Ojibwa, where he recently completed his tenure as the tribal president Prior to that, Brian served as the chief judge of the Bay Mills Tribal Court from 2009 to 2012. He served as a counselor and policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Interior Indian Affairs, and he is a graduate of Michigan State University and Michigan State University College of Law. So, would you please welcome Brian Newland? All right. Good morning, everyone. Who's you? This is uh, my kind of weather, I tell you. Uh, so I uh, apologize for uh, being a, a little bit late. I was up in uh, Baraga, Lance, actually, uh, earlier this morning, meeting with leaders from the Kuna Bay Indian community, um, where uh, three of my four grandparents uh, grew up and lived most of their lives uh, up in Lantz, Berga. My grandfather was actually superintendent of Lantz schools uh, for a period in the, in the 80s. <clears throat> um, my grandmother taught there before moving back down to Brimley, uh, where she taught me music and band. And then uh, my other grandma uh, grew up in Ziba there on the res. Um, so it's really, really nice to be home. Um, I had... Uh, a couple of hilltop cinnamon rolls uh, already this morning, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to grab a couple of pasties on my way out of town, because uh, before I go to New Orleans, I'm actually stopping back in D.C. to get a new change of clothes, <laughs> and uh, my wife and daughter will be very happy for, uh, for the pasties. Um, I want to say uh, miigwech, thank you, uh, to Northern Michigan University uh, for having me here today giving me an excuse to come home to the UP. Um, and uh, I, it's a real honor to be here with you. Also to mark uh, National Native American Heritage Month as well. <clears throat> um, and I know um, that it's a federal holiday uh, the weekend before deer opener. And so the fact that there are so many of you sitting here and not out getting your camps ready uh, means a lot to me. So thank you guys very much. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know what uh, the Department of the Interior is or know uh, even more about the bureaucracy and what the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs does. Um, but the position that I now occupy uh, was actually established after President Nixon. Uh, of, uh, of all people, people are surprised to learn President Nixon was a, a forceful advocate for Indian country um, and tribal self-determination called for the creation of an assistant secretary of the interior for Indian affairs. Uh, and so uh, I am the 14th person to serve in this role. It is a Senate confirmed position. <clears throat> and I am uh, now in this role responsible for um, uh, helping to develop and administer the president's policies with respect to Indian Affairs and oversee the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Education, the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration, a whole bunch of other stuff 
uh, that I won't bore you with. Um, <clears throat> but it's a real honor to do this. And I'm only in the history of this position, actually only the third person to serve in this role after having been an elected tribal leader. Um, and it's been a, a real interesting to have worked in this office, come home and be tribal leader, and then come back here. And I've had a 360 degree view of federal Indian law and policy. I've also been Indian my whole life. And so I have, uh, <clears throat> you know, know what it's like to live on the res kind of uh, at the whims of federal policy. But one of the things that I'm responsible for in this job is being the leading edge of the federal government's trust relationship with 574 federally recognized tribes. Each tribe is a sovereign government uh, with its own government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. So some tribes are massive. Navajo Nation uh, geographically is larger than the state of West Virginia and it has almost a half million tribal citizens. Cherokee Nation has uh, about a half million uh, tribal citizens. And there are some tribal communities that uh, might only have a few acres of land and a couple dozen tribal citizens. Uh, they span from the north slope of Alaska all the way down to the southern tip of Florida in the Everglades um, and uh, everywhere in between. And so it's um, a, a, a big honor to be responsible for that government-to-government -government relationship. Uh, I mentioned, and it was in my bio, that I grew up <clears throat> at the Bay Mills Indian community where I served as tribal president. Um, Bay Mills was one of the spots along the route of the Lewis Cass expedition back in 1820. Uh, and along with so many tribes in the Great Lakes, our own history is intertwined with that expedition, which I know is part of the symposium here today. Um, that expedition and the activities that it encompassed had huge ramifications for the first inhabitants of Michigan and the Great Lakes. Uh, for the better part of two centuries, the federal government, <clears throat> following on from that expedition, used its federal powers uh, to decide uh, what life would be like for Indian people, for Alaska Native people, and decide what, was, what would be in our best interests. And they did this, we did this, I'm now a federal official, I have to remind myself, uh, without consulting tribes. Um, often using coercion and other, uh, other means to force compliance from Indian people with federal decisions. The federal government used its powers to wage war against tribes, take their lands, break their economic systems, forcibly remove Indian people from their homelands, establish reservations to confine tribal people, and prohibit people from exercising their religious and cultural beliefs to unilaterally abrogate treaties and to even terminate the legal existence of Indian tribes. Now during his time as governor of the Michigan Territory, Lewis Cass negotiated uh, many different treaties with Indian tribes on behalf of the United States. Uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, so I'll give you just a, a, you know, a, a little sampling of my first, uh, what would be like the first day of my uh, class in my Indian law class when I used to teach. Um, but uh, treaties, if you look at the United States Constitution, Indian tribes and Indian people are referenced explicitly in the US Constitution three different times. There is no other ethnic group, racial group, or social group, uh, except for lawyers, uh, that is explicitly mentioned in the Constitution like that. So the relationship with tribes as sovereigns is actually a constitutional relationship, which is why sometimes you see Supreme Court decisions with folks that 
uh, might surprise you, you might consider to be ardent conservative constitutionalists writing some of the most pro-tribal uh, opinions in the Constitution uh, uh, from the Supreme Court about Indian tribes, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but the Constitution also includes this other provision called the Supremacy Clause and the Treaty Clause. And the federal government has the ability, the United States has the ability to negotiate treaties with sovereigns. The United States doesn't negotiate treaties with the city of Marquette. It doesn't negotiate treaties with the Rotary Club. Uh, it negotiates treaties with foreign nations and Indian tribes. And the Constitution says that those treaties are the supreme law of the land. They preempt state law and local law. So Lewis Cass, when he was governor, negotiated a number of these treaties um, with tribes uh, in the Great Lakes area. Uh, and many of those uh, treaties resulted in tribes handing over their lands to the United States. And in fact, how many of you know what year Michigan became a state? S shout it out. 1837. In 1836, one of those treaties, the, United, the Treaty of Washington, was negotiated with Ojibwe and Odawa people here in Michigan and ceded uh, about 40% of the lands that would comprise Michigan. So if you'll bear with me, I'll get my handy Michigan map here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's about this area from Alpena down to the mouth of the Grand River and then everything east of the Chocolay River here in the UP. And that land session actually allowed, facilitated, Michigan becoming a state in the United States. And so uh, in that treaty, the tribes reserved rights to themselves. This is a structure those of you who are familiar with the Constitution know that the Constitution uh, delegates powers to the federal government and reserves powers to the people and to the states. Treaties work much the same way. And the courts have said whatever tribes didn't give up in their treaties, they kept for themselves as sovereign power. So these tribes through the Treaty of 1836 ceded much of the land in Michigan and allowed Michigan to become a state. And so you'll often hear people from uh, Indian country talking about treaty rights and the rights that tribes reserved. And that's important. Uh, and it's also important to remember that a treaty isn't a one-way street. It's an agreement between two sovereigns. And Indian people aren't the only ones who have rights and benefits under those treaties. We all have benefits and rights under those treaties. The state of Michigan and the people of Michigan benefited from this treaty by having the land that became our great state. And so Lewis Cass helped to negotiate uh, that treaty, but he didn't always necessarily respect the sovereign status of tribes or believe that these negotiations were agreements between sovereigns. And <clears throat> many, in many instances, as you all know, the uh, state governments, local officials, private actors, the United States uh, didn't always live up to the treaties and the commitments made in those treaties or um, actively work to undermine them. And that continued here in Michigan um, all the way up into the 1970s when we had a lot of legal battles uh, over fishing here in the Great Lakes. I see Dave Nyberg here, my good friend from back at MSU. Uh, we've, uh, uh, in his work with uh, the governor and in the state, you know, when I was tribal leader, we had a lot of conversations about these issues. So that work, and I'm giving you this history lesson, this, that, all that stuff that happened flowing out of that Lewis Cass expedition and uh, the treaties that followed on from that um, are part, are one chapter in the story that we're all living today here in Michigan. We're all directly connected to those things. Um, my grandparents, uh, my grandma who lived in Ziba, used to fish illegally in Lake Superior at night. Uh, they would wade into the water in the dark um, when it was illegal. Um, often they would have one of my aunties or uncles sitting behind in the truck 
with a shotgun to protect themselves in case anybody was coming to do them harm for fishing without a state license. The state of Michigan cited one of our tribal members from Bay Mills for fishing without a license. They seized his fishing net uh, and brought him, uh, prosecuted him in a case that went to the Michigan Supreme Court, ultimately reaffirmed that these treaty rights for tribes to fish still exist. <clears throat> and uh, just last week, I believe it was, uh, in a continuation of all of this history, all this story that we're living, Governor Whitmer actually returned that fishing net to the tribal president of Bay Mills Indian Community, who's the granddaughter of the man who set the net in the first place. Um, so we're still living this, and the past is never actually in the past. Um, so one of the first ways Going back to that, that time of Lewis Cass, uh, the federal government um, pursued this policy of acquiring, taking Indian lands through these treaties, and also forcibly assimilating Indian people. And so at the Department of the Interior today, under Secretary Holland's leadership, we're working to shed light on this past. Not for some gratuitous effort to just make people feel bad. Um, because we're still living in this story, we're still living this history, it's necessary to understand it and to have a shared understanding of this history so that we can heal from it and move forward. Remember, in my job, I'm partially responsible for this nation-to-nation -nation relationship that the United States has with sovereign tribes. And so we're engaged in this work to understand this history, to have an accurate accounting of it, so that our relationship moving forward between the United States, and we're all citizens of the United States, and the citizens of Indian nations, uh, that that relationship in the future doesn't look like what it looked like in the past. <clears throat> so early on in, in the President's administration, Secretary Holland announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. And this is the first time in the history of our country that the federal government has ever accounted for its role in these boarding schools. And last year, we released the first volume of a report about what these boarding schools were, where they were, how many there were. This was the first time in the history of this country that we've done this. And Secretary Holland is the very first American Indian to ever serve as a cabinet official for the President of the United States. And this is, you know, this is the landmark stuff that happens when you bring all Americans to the table to engage in this work. So our report <clears throat> uh, had a number of findings. Uh, and at the top of the list, uh, we were able to demonstrate that these boarding schools were part of a policy of forced assimilation that was really aimed at taking land from Indian people or, or severing the connection between Indian people and their land. So a little bit about why that is. Uh, we're all in the UP, so we all, uh, I, I think, get along pretty well up here uh, these days. We're not without our disputes now and then, but um, you know, many of you are at least familiar with um, Anishinaabe people uh, who live up here and know the connection between Indian people and our homelands. And it's a, it is a cultural belief and it's a way of life. And so if you, uh, the federal government's thinking back in the early days was if we can sever that connection, the Indian people won't need all this land. And if they don't need all this land, it's available to us. <clears throat> uh, I'm. I'm not yet uh, old, but I don't think I'd call myself young anymore either. But we all know that as we get older, it gets harder to learn new things, right? And the federal government quickly found out, well, we can't take all these middle-aged Indian people and uh, change who they are. So we've got to get them young. And we've got to force Indian children to be different. And so these boarding schools were aimed at forced assimilation to, to disconnect Indian people from their lands, and it was a policy deliberately targeted at Indian kids. 
In all three branches of the federal government were involved, the executive branch, Congress, and even the courts. And multiple generations of Native kids were forced by the federal government to uh, attend these schools. They were taken from their parents and their families without consent and sent to these schools. And the Supreme Court found that this was a lawful exercise of the federal government's authority under the Constitution. So before we began this work, we consulted with tribes about how they wanted us to undertake this investigation. Um, we identified federal records uh, that we would research, and we began to develop the first official list of federal Indian boarding schools and trying to also identify where they were and burial sites at these schools. So we keep these records, actually the federal government keeps these records in an underground cave in Lenexa, Kansas. And I've been to this place. Uh, it is a massive facility. It's not unlike uh, that scene from Indiana Jones at the very end. I mean, you, you can drive big trucks down there and there's just rows upon rows of boxes of files. And for this work, our team reviewed over 98 million pages of documents. Um, and, and that was just for this first report. So we showed that between 1819 and 1969, the federal government operated or supported 408 of these boarding schools in 37 states or territories, uh, including five here in Michigan, uh, one of which was St. Joseph's in Barriga, where my great-grandmother attended, uh, along with many other people from Bay Mills Indian community. Our report identifies uh, all of these schools by name and location. Some of these schools operated across multiple sites. Uh, and while there were uh, tens of thousands uh, of Indian kids who were taken to these schools, uh, many of them never made it home. Many of them died at these schools, uh, were buried at these schools, often hundreds uh, or even thousands of miles away from home. And in fact, I was actually uh, a few weeks ago at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which was the site of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, uh, and uh, was there with uh, folks from the, the War College uh, because there's a cemetery there that is filled with Indian kids uh, from all over the United States. Uh, and they are working now with tribes to bring some of those kids home so that they could be buried in their homelands. We've identified uh, through our work so far that there were at least 53 marked or unmarked burial sites. Uh, and in our continuing research, uh, and we'll be reporting on that later, uh, I expect that that number will increase. Um, our research and investigation shows that 50% of federal Indian boarding schools received support or involvement from religious organizations that includes funding, infrastructure, and personnel. And the federal government at times actually paid religious institutions on a per capita basis for Indian children to enter and attend these schools. Our investigation also shows that the federal government used money held in individual trust accounts to fund Indian kids attending these boarding schools. So uh, you might want to know what, be asking, well, what does that, what does that mean? When the federal government uh, broke up Indian reservations under allotment, it assigned uh, 160 acre parcels of land to individual Indians often. And then uh, any, any activity occurring on those lands, if somebody was drilling for oil or grazing or farming those lands, they would pay rent. The federal government would hold that rent and then pay it out to the landowners. That practice still continues today. Uh, and we hold that money in trust at the Department of the Interior. And so what the department would do oftentimes to pay for the cost of these schools uh, would say, I know you're supposed to get this money to uh, put food on the table uh, for your family, but we're actually going to hold this money, take your kid, send them hundreds of miles away to this boarding school, and that money will pay for our expense of doing that. So not only were people deprived of their property, 
uh, through the allotment process, their kids were taken and then they paid for that privilege as part of this policy. Um, our federal records also show that, uh, you know, as, as I think many people are aware of with these boarding schools, that they also worked really hard to keep kids from learning and speaking their own language. And that's one of the reasons why today, why uh, there are so few native language speakers um, in Indian country. And that a lot of the education that occurred at these schools was focused on skilled trades and not reading, writing, and arithmetic. So that the people who would leave these schools could be bricklayers and domestic servants and, and uh, working class uh, and not advance in their academic uh, education. In our research and in our investigation, we also found that through uh, ongoing uh, studies, known as the running bear studies, that the present day health of Indian people uh, was affected by people in their family who went to these boarding schools. So uh, people who uh, didn't attend these schools themselves, but maybe their mom or their grandma or their grandpa did, suffer negative health impacts today because of their family's experience. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but our, uh, you know, our work on this has been pathbreaking. And we haven't confined ourselves to this cave in Lenexa, Kansas, uh, looking at federal records. We also went out, uh, Secretary Holland and I did, um, on a tour over the past year and a half uh, across the country called the Road to Healing, where we would sit in large rooms, often high school gyms, and hear from people who went to these schools and hear from their family members about their experiences. Um, this is one of the hardest things that, that I've done in my career, uh, to sit and watch somebody stand in front of an audience and talk about the worst thing that was ever done to them. Many of them sharing that for the first time. Uh, we were at, uh, we did one of these 12 stops in Pelston, um, down by Harbor Springs in Petoskey, and heard speaker after speaker talk about uh, the Holy Childhood School there and some of the abuses uh, that, that were carried out. Uh, one story I want to share with you just, just to illustrate why this is relevant today um, was at, at one of these stops, <clears throat> there was a woman who got up to speak. She was about my age. And she said, I didn't go to the, one of these boarding schools. Um, and growing up, I always had a hard relationship with my mom. She was really hard on us. And we were never close, and I could never understand why. Why I, I never had a good relationship with my mom. And she said, I, I was working at this urban Indian health center out west, and a letter came in. And be, just by nature of her job, the letter came to her, of all people. And she said she opened it up, and this woman uh, was trying to find her best friend from boarding school from when she was a kid. She was an elder, and she wanted to reconnect. Um, and she heard that her friend might be living in this area. And so she sent the letter to the Urban Indian Health Center, thinking they'll, they'll be able to help me find someone who knows this person. And so the woman who was speaking said that the, in that letter there was a picture and it was a picture of her mom. And her mom had attended boarding school with this woman, uh, and uh, she never knew. Her daughter never knew. Her mom went to boarding school. And it clicked. She said her whole life, everything up until that moment made sense because she knew what her mom had gone through. And then her mom stood up to speak and for the first time in her life, shared her experience at that boarding school and the abuse she suffered. So this isn't just in the past. When, when people went to these schools, their families were separated, 
They were disconnected from each other. It affected their relationships with their kids. We heard over and over stories like that. My parents were mean to me. My mom was abusive. I never got hugged. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, people my age, people younger than me, uh, living today. We heard these stories over and over again. Um, and this was all carried out under the banner of the federal policies of the United States. And it affects people today, which is why we're doing this work. So we're finishing up our second volume of this investigative report. And we're going to try to uh, identify a few other things. One is we're going to try to put a number on how much money the federal government spent on these schools. We're going to try to identify how many kids went to these schools and how many kids never went home. And we're going to try to find where those burial sites are. A lot of them are now in private ownership. Um, a lot of them are unmarked. And so obviously, like all of us, uh, we want to protect the final resting place of our ancestors, particularly our ancestors who were kids. And so that's something that we're working on. Um, and you know, we're trying to pave the way with recommendations for the future on how to address the legacy impacts of these schools. So I know that uh, in these times, it's often uh, challenging to have public discourse about our history. Um, people, uh, people say, why are you trying to make me feel guilty? We're not trying to make anybody feel guilty. But for people that we met along this tour, to have the United States of America recognized and affirm that their own lived experiences were real means something. And for the United States to affirm that their own lived experiences were carried out as a public policy of this country, that's been cathartic for many people. Um, and we can begin to work together to heal, to do things like reunify Indian families to help Indian people reclaim their languages, to improve the relationship between the United States and tribes and, and local communities with their uh, neighboring native communities, and to really have a good relationship between Indian people and the United States. And we've already seen that our work has borne fruit. So the United States Supreme Court earlier this year ruled in a case, there was a challenge to a law called the Indian Child Welfare Act, which, you know, this is, uh, I don't have enough time to, in this symposium to get into all these different permutations, but there was a challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was a law passed just a few years before I was born that said, we cannot no longer take Indian, Indian kids away from their families um, it, without involving the tribes. And so people were challenging this and saying that's, illegal racial discrimination to favor tribes in, in foster care child placement. So the Supreme Court actually upheld this law. And it surprised a lot of people because the people who brought this challenge, they thought, well, the politics have changed, so we're going to win this case. But that decision was rooted in the Constitution that I was talking about. It crossed party lines. Justice Gorsuch was aligned with um, you know, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. Uh, on, on this case. And at the oral arguments, I, I was able to attend that. That was the first time I'd ever been to the Supreme Court for oral arguments. And it was scheduled for an hour, and it went almost four hours. It went over three hours. And there were so many questions about boarding schools. If the federal, and questions along the lines of, the, if the federal government had the legal authority that we've already said they had to take Indian kids and change their culture, don't we also have the legal authority to protect those Indian kids and their ability to stay with their families and their communities and their culture? And the Supreme Court said yes. And in their written opinions, they cited to our boarding school report many times. Um, I mentioned earlier that the historical policies of, of taking Indian lands and forcibly assimilating Indian people, um, and it's really hard to overstate the modern impact of those policies that we're living with. I've just described that for you. There's not a single Indian person today 
in this country who isn't affected somehow by those policies. Every single Indian person that you've ever met is carrying around the legacy of that, whether it's not knowing their language or being separated from their families or having a diminished land base, all of those things. And so we have now entered this policy area in the United States where we've said, with the Indian Child Welfare Act, we refute that. We repudiate that policy. Our policy now is tribal self-determination. Our policy is keeping Indian kids with their families, and our policy is one of cooperative federalism on a government-to-government -government relationship. And that policy occurs on a bipartisan basis. It's not a democratic policy. It's not a Republican policy. It's the policy of the United States. That policy has been instituted and carried out by President Reagan, President Bush, President Trump, as well as President Obama, and the president I work for, President Biden. Um, so in contrast, it's a marked contrast now from the era that we're talking about with the Lewis Cass expedition, where we're talking about forcible assimilation and taking Indian lands. We're now talking about this self-determination, supporting tribes, governing themselves. And this is all rooted in our trust responsibility, which is rooted in the US Constitution and all the treaties that were negotiated between the United States and these tribes. And it's fundamentally different from other relationships in this country. It's not like the relationships that cities have with counties. It's not like the relationship that counties have with states or states have with the federal government. It's unique unto itself. And so, you know, when I was growing up, sometimes people would say, you Indians, you always think you have these special rights. And I learned to say, yeah. <laughs> and? Um, they're special because this is a special relationship. It doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's something we should be proud of, that our country our, our, in here in the United States has the capacity, our founding documents as a country, has the capacity to recognize this special relationship and turn it from something bad and dark and painful into something collaborative and cooperative where we have a shared project and we recognize the unique status of one another and respect it instead of trying to erase it. And so we're working now in President Biden's administration to make sure that we carry forward this new policy era to make sure that tribes are not just the country club full of Indians, that it's not the, the rotary club full of Indians, that tribes are recognized and respected as sovereign governments within our constitutional structure and that we're working to make life better for Indian people like we do with all Americans. So we've done a lot of work in this administration uh, to uh, carry out this new policy under uh, the uh, American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we've been able to invest $45 billion into Indian country. Um, so for some perspective, the annual budget uh, for the Bureau of Indian Affairs is uh, one fifteenth of that amount. So in two years, this administration has invested 15 years worth of BIA funding into Indian country. It's an unprecedented amount of federal investment in Indian country. And that money goes to things like schools, health centers, bridges, roads, all the stuff that uh, governments need to do to take care of their people. Um, and that money is also going, beginning to flow to things like native language revitalization, going to support tribes in their work, and we were talking about this with Kiwana Bay leaders this morning, supporting efforts to keep tribal languages alive, because those languages aren't just the way that we communicate our ideas, that we uh, express our excitement over the Detroit Lions beating the Green Bay Packers. Um, these, uh, our language, no matter what culture you're in, your language carries forward your cultural values. It carries for, forward your way of life, your way of relating to one another, your way of interacting with the world. And so if our trust responsibility at the United States 
federal government is to protect the existence of Indian people uh, and their ability to exist as Indian people, we've got to make sure that Indian people can continue to exist as Indian people. And that includes making these investments in tribal language revitalization so that those cultural teachings, those knowledge, the way of relating to one another, that we, the United States, worked so hard for two centuries to erase, uh, we've got to undo that. And we're beginning to do that work with some of this funding um, that I just described. <clears throat> um, so I uh, want to make sure that I, again, express my gratitude to all of you um, for the opportunity to come talk about this work. It's some of the most meaningful work I've ever done in my life and probably ever will be. Um, and I've got my uh, partner here, Sam Cohn, in the back. He's a policy advisor in our office who helps uh, advance a lot of these policies. Um, this, is, this has been rewarding work, and, and not only rewarding work to do as a, as a, just, as a Ojibwe guy from the UP, it's rewarding work to do as an American um, because this is healing work um, to make our nation a better place. Um, and so I know that this symposium is focusing on Lewis Cass, and I'm not here to tell you all the ways that all the bad things that he did because history and people are complex, uh, but it certainly his work changed the course of life uh, in existence for our country and that includes the first peoples here as well. Um, and uh, you know, we are working to, if you think about the arc of history over millennia, you know, the last two centuries is pretty small. Um, there was a lot done there, but it makes us optimistic about the potential for what can be, right? Because uh, there's, there's a long period of peace and good relationships, there's this period of conflict and now through this work, through understanding our history, acknowledging it, and working to heal from it, we can make this arc of history, this time span in history going forward, uh, a peaceful one, a one of good relationships so that this bad stuff that nobody likes to talk about or think about is confined to this narrow band of history. And so I think this symposium is an opportunity to uh, reframe that, to think about it, acknowledge where we've been, and commit to doing better in the future. So I want to say miigwech, thank you to all of you for your time, for having me here today, for listening, and uh, I think we've got time for a few questions. Um, yes, we do. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I don't have my hearing aids and I can. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I was doing some ethno history work in the far western UP with the Lakview Desert tribe, mm -hmm. and I found out that many of their uh, children were sent to Harbor Springs uh, Holy Child mm -hmm. uh, School. Far away, distance really was problematic for these kids because it separated them. But I was wondering about the boarding schools in Verga, where the children were in relative close proximity to their own communities. Mm -hmm. uh, did that have a different effect where they were able to still maintain cultural ties? Um, th you know, th that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I've learned going through this experience is that the, the experiences of communities around the country was, you know, there were some common threads, but there were, there were differences um, as well. Uh, and uh, what, one of the things that we heard a lot of and we've seen through, through our team's research is that uh, the choice to send kids to schools far away was often deliberate because uh, at many of these schools, kids would, would want to run away so if you made it hard for them to run away to go home, um, it was more likely that they were going to stay there. Um, but there were places uh, where, where kids were sent to these schools in their communities or, or close by. I, I can't speak to any specific example about whether that enabled them to retain their language or their culture better. Um, I suspect, if anything, 
I mean, I, I'm assuming many of you are parents like me that it just uh, gave some assurance to their families knowing they were close by as opposed to far away. But, um, uh, you know, it was different in each one. Uh, just an, another example from, that, that prompted me to think of another example from our, our history or our work, um, listening to folks across the country. A few weeks ago, I was in Anchorage, Alaska. I travel a lot. <laughs> I get, my hair was, was really dark when I started a few years ago. Um, we heard uh, from people up there uh, describe that in a lot of these villages, uh, the adults would talk about how quiet the villages were because all of the kids were gone. And you know those are things that we don't think about. So I imagine if your kids were taken to school down the street, as a parent, that probably feels a lot better than your kids being put on a boat or a train and shipped across the country. But I, I don't have any specific examples of folks that I can recount for you. Uh, Buju Brian, uh, Marty Reinhardt, Sault Ste. Marie. Hey, Marty. Uh, so uh, my question is about <clears throat> your anticipation of reparations uh, to the, the victims and their families uh, for these wrongs that have been done, whether it was boarding schools, sterilizations, I mean, the list goes on. And I know that that's something that probably you've thought about. You, you've had to have uh, thought about just compensation and what that actually means in our, our context. I just want to get your thoughts about that. Miigwech. Sure. Miigwech, Marty. It's good to see you again. Um, you know, in our, in our listening sessions going across the country, um, I can't recall any speaker getting up and saying, I want to be paid, or you know, I want compensation for this. I heard a lot of people stand up and say, I want my kids to know our language. And I heard a lot of people say, I, want to, I just want to have this truth that I know acknowledged. Um, and I, I don't know that uh, on that one, I don't know that you can put a price on that. Uh, when it comes to language revitalization uh, and family reunification, we can make uh, these investments and we're working to do that. But the, it, I, I can't recall a speaker at any one of these standing up and making a, a demand for reparations because I think, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not discounting you know, folks who, who wanna talk about those things, but I think that uh, for most people across Indian country, in my experience going through this, people wanna uh, heal from it and want a, a better relationship. And, and I think there's an acknowledgement that that, that, take, that takes more than money, it takes work in a relationship. And so, um, you know, we, we've heard what people have said too about, you know, I want my kids to, to speak their language. Um, but I will add, you know, just the, I thought I knew, you know, I thought I knew a lot of stuff about this, this subject uh, coming into this work. And when I took this job, we weren't anticipating necessarily taking this on the way that we did. Um, you know, growing up over in Bay Mills, uh, we went to school in Brimley. Uh, the school is half native, half not. And uh, when I go home and talk with people I grew up with who aren't native, it's amazing to me, like how many people I've known my whole life never heard of this, never heard of it. And, and I, I, it boggled my mind because just a few miles down the road in my, my community at Bay Mills, like it's just common knowledge. Everyone had relatives go to these boarding schools, and then my friends I grew up with, it's, it wasn't malicious, they just, they didn't know. And I think about that, um, and it, it makes it click for me what a lot of people have said. So, you know, talk about wanting people to affirm their truth. Like, think about all the times in your life when you know something to be true. Like, you've seen it, you've touched it, you've experienced it, and somebody says, I don't believe you. Like, that's maddening. Right? When you say, this, I experienced this thing. I was in the woods and I saw Bigfoot. <laughs> Maybe not that, but, you know, like I experienced something and nobody believes me. And that makes you feel less than. 
It makes you, it, it robs you of your dignity. You don't have to be Indian to know what that feels like because we've all felt it at some point in our lives. And for a lot of Indian people going through this road to healing, having a cabinet secretary of the United States federal government stand up and say, this happened. That's, people have been waiting their whole lives for that. With intermarriage and complicated mm -hmm. genealogies, who qualifies as an Indian? <laughs> That's a great question, and it's one we were um, <clears throat> talking about in the car ride over here. Um, in Indian identity is, is complicated. Um, and I think first and foremost, the first people who should get to decide are Indian people. Um, and tribes have different standards for um, what we call tribal enrollment or tribal citizenship now. Um, and there's, a, you know, as sovereign governments, like any sovereign nation on this planet, they have the right and the authority to define the terms of their citizenship. But Indian country is a really diverse place, too. I mean, it, we often think of intermarriage. That there are people, when I travel, they say, you don't look Indian to me. Um, and uh, Indian people look like a lot of things. There are uh, people who are um, Indian, native, and Hispanic. There are people who are native and black. Um, there are people who are light-skinned. Uh, my son uh, has a really good friend from Bay Mills. They're both the same blood quantum. You would look at my son and you would never guess that, maybe never think that he were Indian and he'd look at his good friend and say, oh my God, that guy's full blood. He must be like, you know, he, he must go way back in his family. But this, you can't determine these things by the way people look and identity um, or by the language, uh, you know, whether they speak their language or whether they practice their traditional uh, religious uh, practices and ceremonies because of this history that I just walked through, um, it's complicated. And so the, the best, the place to start is to allow Indian people and Indian tribes to determine those questions. <clears throat> uh, question, is the report that you're talking about, mm -hmm. is that online? Is it a yes. hard copy? Uh, Both. How is it available? It's available on the website of the Department of the Interior along with the list of all of the schools. Um, and we're working to you know, provide more information. Um, I have to say our team of researchers, so uh, I, sometimes I, I wish I could spend all day talking about these things, but our team of researchers, most of the people at the Department of the Interior who are doing this work are Indian themselves. Uh, and the folks who are going through these records and page after page of, you know, Indian kid, you know, dead, dead, um, it has been incredibly hard on them. So you think about the physical task of going through 98 million pages of documents. Some of them are onion skins, so they have to be, like, you, you can't pick them up. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the, and that's to say nothing of the subject matter of, of these, um, the work that our team has done on this has just been remarkable. And it's been an emotional uh, labor for them as well. Um, and to sit and listen to people tell their stories um, it is just, it, it's, it's an incredible story, and I think the people who've done this work um, to, and to, to get to these reports that are publicly available, um, I can't commend them enough. I'm really proud of them. <clears throat> it's such an incredible honor that you are here, Secretary Newland. Thank you so much, and to Dan Truckee and everybody, what an incredible honor you're here at Northern today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you knew that the state of Michigan, Governor Whitmer, just reissued an RFP for, mm -hmm. through the Department of Civil Rights. Um, they haven't found a leader yet to um, lead the research for state of Michigan boarding school research. And um, I wondered if you know of anyone. They, two yeah. weeks ago, just reissued this yeah. and have expanded, added another $750,000. So hopefully we'll find someone um, to do this research directly in our state. And if you know anyone, Send them to Lansing, if you please. That's, that's great to know, actually. I mean, I was aware of the, the first RFP, and it, 
I kind of heard rumblings that they, they were having a hard time finding someone. But it, you know, one of the things uh, that's been great about this work, so you th uh, when you look back a few years, when uh, in Canada they discovered this mass grave at the Kamloops School. Um, and that triggered this kind of awakening of like, this is, it was very traumatic for a lot of people, even here in the United States. And uh, it triggered though this call to like, you know, we know here in the United States, we've got to do something about it. And it, and it led to the work that we're doing. Um, and that has led now to local and statewide efforts to, to focus on what you're describing. And, you know, we're the federal government, so we can, all, we can do things a mile wide, but often an inch deep, right? And so to really know the unique history, it, a lot of this work has to be done at the community level, at the regional, and at the state level. And so I'm really glad to see the state taking that on. We've seen this in a number of places with religious institutions and dioceses and universities and state agencies, uh, and just at the community level, talking about one school. Uh, taking on this work and it's been it, it's been really impressive to see and we often don't have a sense of history until you get to look back at it after a while but I think we're gonna look back at this moment and see a turning point uh, in the beginning of a healing process um, so I'm really glad to see that work you may have just answered the question however um, looking back on your experience <clears throat> what do you feel was a pivotal point where people started to focus on, on this is an issue that we need to, to deal with, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to what popular media over time mm -hmm. projected on the 6 o'clock news? And then the second part of that is, uh, what forces do you have pushing back against um, you know, trying to move forward? Um, thank you for that. Um, I think so the, the, with the first question, you know, we can come in, you can always come into a federal a job or some government job, some political job, and you know, hand out the grants, turn the lights on, shut the lights off, um, you know, punch the clock. Um, and that work is important, right? You want government to function, you want it to function well. Uh, but you also have a responsibility to, um, to address the big things in the future. And as I mentioned, you know, this isn't an academic exercise. We have an ongoing relationship uh, with 574 sovereigns. So you, you can't, in any relationship, I've been married to my high school sweetheart, you know, we've been together for now a majority of our lives. Um, you can't move forward in a good relationship unless you acknowledge the difficult parts that you've had together and, and work to heal from them. And so, uh, you know, why is this work being done? It's, be, it's being done because we've got to, we've, we've got to heal this relationship we're in together. Um, and you got to do that by building trust with one another. And you only build trust with one another when you affirm a common set of facts between you uh, and in a shared purpose to do better. Um, your second question, uh, can you repeat that? Oh, thank you. Yeah. We, you know, um, I've been grateful and impressed that, that we haven't received really like, a, you know, a lot of pushback, especially considering, you know, some of the discourse around talking about history and, and books and, and these things. Like, uh, I've testified, uh, I testify before Congress regularly in this job and and uh, members of Congress from both parties have sponsored legislation um, to set up a national commission. We've testified in support of that. We've had uh, statements of support from governors and, and leaders from both parties. Um, I haven't found it to be a partisan issue and I haven't really encountered a lot of pushback to the extent, I wouldn't even call it pushback. I get a lot of people sometimes ask why why is the government doing this? Uh, you know, what's the relevance? And then when you know, we explain it, they say, oh yes, that makes sense. Um, but again, people don't know. And I think when people don't know something and then they learn it, um, there's a willingness to, to look at it 
you know, with fresh eyes. So we, d we haven't had decades of partisanship and calcified views around this issue. So I think um, I've been grateful for people's willingness to engage in this conversation. I think I've got time for maybe two more. So I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of the government, you know, um, the ability to do this program and the government's openness, do you see this, that applying to other um, cultures, other disenfranchised, like uh, African American? Mm -hmm. Do you, you know, see that applying? Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Um, I, I want to be careful because I, uh, I've, I've learned the hard way and uh, lessons my parents taught me not to talk too much about things I don't know a lot about. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, We've got a complex history here in the United States. The things that uh, relate to the dark parts of our history also point to things that uh, can make for a bright future because we've got characteristics in this country to correct ourselves and to form around common principles instead of common skin color, right? So um, I, I can't speak to whether the federal government you know, what work has been done on those types of conversations uh, and, and what should be done. I do know that the relationship between Indian people and the federal government is also a legal relationship. And, and again, that underpins our work um, and, and why we're, we've pursued this, uh, this effort. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so earlier you mentioned, um, towards the beginning of your, your speech, you started talking about the supremacy clause and mm -hmm. um, treaties. My, it's kind of a two-part question. So my first part is, are these treaties that the United States government holds between like tribes here, are these living documents that tribes are actively working with the government to try and um, amend and continue to change? And the second part of that question is, if they are, does that fall within your purview? Like, is that your job as assistant secretary to help work with these tribes and make those changes? That's a great question. And the answer to both is yes. Um, so I'm going to take my Fed hat off and put on my Bay Millionaire hat, put on my Bay Millionaire Stormy Cromer uh, <laughs> that I got. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, when I was tribal president, we were negotiating with the state of Michigan, and, and, and I was at the table with Dave here uh, about these issues and uh, how to implement and regulate our treaty fishing rights as a tribe while the state of Michigan was regulating uh, recreational fishing and other things uh, that relate to the Great Lakes. Um, that's actually built into our federal budget. So there was a lawsuit. Uh, I, I referenced the a uh, guy from my tribe who had his net seized and went to the Michigan Supreme Court that led to a lawsuit that the federal government actually filed against the state of Michigan and said, stop keeping these Indian people from fishing because we have an agreement with them that says they can do this. So the federal government sued the state of Michigan and uh, my whole life this lawsuit's been going on. Uh, and there are periodic uh, court orders and rulings in that. But as part of the different settlement agreements in that, the United States has said we are going to work with tribes in the state of Michigan to support the management of fishing in the Great Lakes. And so the state of Michigan, those five tribes, and the federal government meet regularly. And their staff work together to monitor fisheries, water quality, all these types of things. They c we co-manage the Great Lakes. And every year, we in the Department of the Interior, under our budget, ask Congress to fund that work so that tribes can continue to do that because that's our obligation as the federal government to make sure tribes have the tools they need to protect and exercise uh, their rights. So these absolutely are living documents. They're relevant today. There are people in my community who uh, put food on the table literally and metaphorically uh, by fishing. That's the case in many parts of the country. Um, there are, are tribes that have uh, uh, treaty-based rights to uh, things like health care and education. Uh, we litigate these things all the time 
uh, both the federal government and tribes and, and states. Um, in fact, there was a recent case uh, that we, the federal government, just won uh, supporting uh, the Northwestern Shoshone Band in Utah and their ability to hunt under their treaty in the state of Idaho. So we actually filed that lawsuit on behalf of that tribe. And that's, that's a live issue that we're still uh, working on and sorting through. So these are very much living documents. Uh, like the Constitution of the United States, it has relevance today. Uh, we have to manage these relationships to uh, make sure these, these treaties are laws. Once the Senate ratifies a treaty, it's the law. And so we've got to implement the law, just the same as we've got to implement the Civil Rights Act and the Clean Water Act and all these other laws. We've got to implement these treaties, and that's work that we do. Thank you. Secretary Newland, thank you so much for being here today. Such a powerful message. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, and safe travels, and uh, hope the weather is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, fantastic. I've been, uh, I've been sending photos back to my parents uh, all morning in different places with my Stormy Cromer hat. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you, so Thank you so much for coming. All right, everyone. We will be, uh, we will be reconvening uh, in, at 1 o'clock, but like I said, there is some food next door, so enjoy yourself, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock.
It's not on? Oh, oh, it's on. Yeah, I guess so. That's the thing about this. Yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, we're going to get started uh, again, and thank you for, I, I, it looks like we were able to feed everyone. That was, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. We, uh, we were able to get more, more people fed. Um, we're going to have a great afternoon. Uh, what a fantastic morning. Thanks so much for all of you who came uh, this morning and who will be here this afternoon. Uh, and I'm really excited to have our next speaker because up until a few weeks ago, I had a empty spot here. Uh, the reason why was I had somebody I was going to be bringing in and they wouldn't respond to any of my messages. And it became very scary. And we were ha I was doing a presentation about the expedition at an event and Beth was there and she goes, well, you know what? I think one of the Bonga member family of uh, the Bonga family was in the expedition. I'm like, okay, first of all, who's Bonga? <laughs> and two, really? And she's like, yeah, I think so. And so when I couldn't, this person wouldn't get back to me. I'm like, okay. I talked to Beth. I said, Beth, do you want to do a presentation? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> well, she dove in and did a bunch of research, and you're going to really like what she came up with. I'm really excited to hear it. So, from the Market Regional History Center, the research librarian Beth Gruber. I think I'm going to pull this a little closer just so you can hear me. Okay. There we go. Okay, is that good enough? Yep. Okay. So you've all been hearing about the Cass expedition all morning. And in his narrative journals from the uh, tr expedition, Henry Schoolcraft uh, mentions an Afro Ojibwa family. Uh, and this is quoting from the journal. Three miles above the mouth of the St. Louis River, there is a village of Chippewa Indians of 14 lodges and containing a population of about 60 souls. Among these, we noticed a Negro who has been long in the service of the fur company and who married a squaw and by whom he has four children. It is worthy of remark that the children are as black as the father and have the curled hair and glossy skin of the native African. James Doughty, who also uh, published his uh, journal from the expedition, uh, has a briefer mention just that there was an old Negro in the employ of the company who has a squaw for a wife and their four children. So what seemed inconsistent to me was that Schoolcraft and Doughty both failed to mention that one of the guides uh, who was on the expedition was supposedly related to this family. Um, and as Dan said, when I heard his presentation a few weeks ago, I asked him if he had come any, across anything on the name George Bonga. George is fairly well known in at least the uh, news sources um, that he was working as a guide and an interpreter on the Cass expedition. Um, so over the last few years, he's talked about quite a lot. Um, there was actually a book published on the family just about two months ago. Um, and there was even a play written on George's life that premiered in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota back in 2016. So many of these secondary sources report that Bonga was chosen to participate in the Cass expedition because he was a skilled canoeist, he spoke English, French, and Ojibwa, and he knew the Mississippi headwater areas. He, claimed, he was claimed to be an asset on long portages, um, that he uh, could carry um, heavier loads than most of the men, uh, and that he was also very good at keeping up the mood with his fine singing and telling jokes. As part of his work on the expedition, George supposedly worked as a translator on the 1820 Fond du Lac Treaty, except there wasn't one. I went back and looked, and when you look at the signatories on the treaties that were conducted as part of the Cass expedition, George isn't there. In fact, when I looked at the official records, he is not mentioned anywhere by name. I have yet to find any primary sources that directly tie George to the Cass expedition. That being said, I can't definitively state that he wasn't there either. Um, well, the Native American guides are listed by name, uh, the 10 voyageurs and the 10 soldiers who accompanied the expedition are not listed by name. So he could have been in one of those 20 people, but I don't have any proof of that. 
Um, he also may have briefly joined the expedition when they were in the Fond du Lac, now the Duluth area, because that's where his family was living, and so maybe he just joined them for a brief period of time, but not the entire expedition. But without that direct connection to the Cass expedition, the Bonga family is still extremely interesting. So who was George Bonga and where did he come from? In one 13-year period in the mid-19th century, George Bonga is listed in various federal, territorial, and state censuses as being white, black, and mulatto. Other records at the time describe him as a half-breed, a mixed blood, or an Indian. This man was described by acquaintances as having coal-black skin, so fairly peculiar. George actually came from the Afro-Ojibwa fur trading family, which was spread over the thousand miles between Montreal and what is now Duluth. His father, we believe, was the Negro who had been long in the service of the fur company mentioned by Schoolcraft and Dottie, um, was of African ancestry, while his mother was Ojibwa. While some scholars have referred to the Bongas as Mati, I have chosen to continue using the terms mixed blood and half-breed uh, because that was the terminology the family themselves used, as well as their um, contemporaries. Within the Ojibwa community, the Bongas were considered to be primarily ethnically French because of their cultural, linguistic, and social affinity with the French and Mati traders. Many of the people in the frontier de-emphasized the specific ethnic and racial divisions, placing greater importance on the spectrum between what they considered to be civilized and uncivilized. So those lines were based more on education, wealth, status, dress, residence, language skills, and even occupation, rather than their racial identity. So to trace this story, we're going to start back with George's grandparents, Jean and Marie-Jean Bonga. So this is a family tree of Jean and Marie Bonga, or Jean and Marie Jean Bonga. Uh, the Bonga name is reportedly common in southern Africa and Martinique, uh, an island in the Caribbean. In Zulu Swahili, it means to give thanks or to give praise. Around 1782, Jean and Marie Jean Bonga, two Francophone slaves, arrived at Colonial Michel Mackinac. Their owner was Captain Daniel Robertson, who was the British officer in command of the post. It's unclear how Robertson acquired his ownership of the couple. There are quite a few different stories in various sources as to how they got there. Some stories reported by missionaries in the mid-late to 19th century um, say that a Bonga ancestor was in fact kidnapped by Native Americans before being adopted into the tribe. Another version states that George's father, who was really his grandfather, was liberated by the local tribe who were incensed by the concept of slavery at Mackinac. Other sources say that Jean was from Jamaica, while other sources claim that the couple had actually been captured in Illinois, probably down in St. Louis, somewhere in that region, uh, during the American Revolution, and then had been brought to Mackinac by slave traders and sold there. In 1872, George reflected on his family history. Quote, I have always been sorry that I didn't ask my father well living if he knew where he immigrated from. I am now inclined to think that they must have come from the new state of Missouri as he did not speak anything but French. My grandfather and his family or fi of five or six children might have been taken prisoner by the Indians and sold to the Indian traders. That is the only way I can guess at it. I un understood my father to say that all his father's family came to Mackinac, that this I am certain of, for I had one uncle and two aunts who went to Montreal with the Indian traders. We do know that the owner, uh, Captain Robertson, had actually been posted to Martinique in 1762, so some scholars suspect that he may have purchased the family there. Um, other recent scholarship has suggested that Robertson may have uh, purchased the couple uh, in Montreal when he lived there before his posting to Mackinac. He could even have inherited them from his wife's family, uh, and they were in the top ten families within the colony of New France in terms of owning um, slaves. So they had quite a lot of slaves comparatively. 
Jean and Marie Jean left a relatively sparse archive. The couple had four children, two boys and two girls. Um, the two daughters were born at Mackinac. The two boys were born probably before they got there. Uh, Rosalie was born in 1782 and Charlotte about 1786. There is a record from 1784 uh, which talks about the old Negro Banga who was carrying a load of wet linen and was injured after walking into the path of an escaped murderer. We don't really know what happened there, but he was injured. Um, the main records from Mackinac consist of church records. Uh, the two girls were baptized, uh, Rosalie in 1786, when her parents were described as a Negro and Negress living with Monsieur Robertson, Captain Commandant. Um, and then it is interesting to note that Jean, Marie Jean, and the two boys were not baptized there, which indicates they had probably already been baptized, which gives credence to the idea that they may have been in Montreal prior to arriving there. In 1787, several of Captain Robertson's slaves were manumitted, uh, including the Bongas. Um, even with Robertson, there is quite a bit of confusion in the story. A number of the secondary sources say that they were freed after his death that year. He didn't die that year. He actually just left Mackinac. Um, he actually returned to Montreal and lived there for more than two decades. Um, the Miami Mission may have been related to the passing of the Northwest Ordinance, uh, which uh, had banned slavery in the Northwest Territories. So after their manumission, Jean and Marie Jean actually remained on Mackinac. They purchased a home and opened what is described as the first inn or tavern uh, on Mackinac. Uh, shortly after that, they baptized their younger daughter, and a few months later, they were formally married in the Catholic Church there. Um, Unfortunately, Jean Banga died just a few months after the wedding in January of 1795, and at this point, his wife disappears from the historical record. Among their four children, as George said in that quote from 1872, um, the three, other children, three children went to Montreal. Etienne, the son, is known to have died there in 1804, and he was listed as a voyageur. That's about all we know about him. We know that the two daughters married uh, into the free Afro, or excuse me, the free African community in Montreal. Uh, they both married and had children and died in Montreal in the early 1830s. The best documented of their children, uh, of Marie and Jean Marie, or excuse me, Jean and Marie Jean, I get the two mixed up when I'm talking, um, was their son Pierre Banga. Pierre had begun working in the fur trade as a young man, uh, working with traders who frequently passed through Mackinac. In 1795, he was at Fond du Lac uh, with John Sayers Company, and five years later, he was working with Alexander Henry the Younger. As many of you, I think, already know, for successful fur traders relied on marriage to Native American women uh, because of their ties to the local communities. Marriages allowed the traders to incorporate themselves into the uh, Native American kinship networks uh, with cultural ties that helped them in the fur trade. Uh, the wives were serving as active partners most often, traveling with their husbands. Um, they were helping with portages as well as things like uh, making um, moccasins, leather garments, and stringing snowshoes. Um, a quote from historian and anthropologist Bruce M. White, from the point of view of the native community, marriages between the native and traders uh, could help achieve the important aim of ensuring a steady supply of merchandise. Ties of affection could increase the likelihood that a trader would return to the community in future years, and he might be more generous with gifts and in the rates for direct trade. Following this uh, practice, Pierre married an Anishinaabe woman, Ojibwe Kwe, the name simply translates as Ojibwe woman, so we don't know if that's her actual name. It appears that it was a marriage a la facon du pay, according to the custom of the country, essentially a common law marriage. Ojibwe Kwe was probably a member of the pillager band of Ojibwe at Leech Lake in Minnesota, what is now Minnesota. Uh, they were to the north northwest or west northwest of modern day Duluth. The group was considered to be particularly difficult to do, deal with due to their warrior-like nature 
and the, quote, uncivilized and unruly individuals. Establishing kinship ties with them was undoubtedly central to the traders' plans uh, and helped with the lo their longevity in the region. Pierre was known as Makdawos, um, meaning black-skinned within the tribe. Between 1797 and 1815, the couple had at least six children, two girls and four boys. Pierre was given increasing responsibility, and by 1805, his successes uh, demonstrated in that his uh, uh, wages were nearing that of the two clerks at the same post. They were each making 800 and 900 livre, livres a year, while Pierre was making 750. Pierre was one of the four interpreters at the post, and he was the only one without other duties recorded. It is probable that uh, Pierre's sisters, Rosalie and Charlotte, were providing a Montreal support system for the family. But when he sent his children to Montreal for baptism and schooling, he placed them under the care of partners with the Northwest Company that was employing him. The children appear in the St. Gabriel Street Presbyterian Church records among the dozens of fur trade children who had been sent to Montreal. The first was Etienne, named after his uncle, later known as Stephen, who was baptized at age seven in 1810. The following year, nine-year-old Blanche and seven-year-old George were baptized. They were, they were sponsored by Pierre's superiors, Angus Shaw and Archibald Norman MacLeod, and they were described as being the children of Pierre Bongo in the service of the Northwest Company by a woman in the Indian country. <laughs> An older son, John Baptiste, was also apprenticed to MacLeod in 1812 at the age of 14. Pierre worked for the Northwest Company until 1817 before switching to work for the Southwest Company, which was a subsidiary of the American Fur Company. He only remained with them for a few years before he seems to have retired, uh, and he seems to have stopped working around 1820, 1821, and he is believed to have died in 1831. So we're going to go back to George, and this is a picture of George uh, from circa 1865. George, as I had mentioned earlier, had been sent to Montreal for schooling. Uh, in, 1870, he, in 1872, he noted, quote, I left Ojibwe country when I was a little boy, as I have no recollection of the place, and went to school in Montreal. After he returned, George spoke several languages, including English, French, Ojibwa, and he is believed to have spoken other Native American dialects. From 1820 to 1839, George primarily worked from the American Fur Company, beginning his career as a boatman. He was reportedly six feet tall, weighed 200 pounds, and was immensely strong. Uh, during the portages, most voyageurs would carry two 90-pound bundles. On one occasion, George is reported to have carried seven bundles, some 630 pounds, for half a mile. I have to think that's an exaggeration of his strength. <laughs> he may have been stronger than most of the other men, but 630 seems excessive. Um, by 1833 to 1834, uh, George was licensed to trade as a clerk at the Lock Plot Post southwest of Fond du Lac. As the clerk, he managed the trading conducted from the post, and it was his responsibility to see that the wintering season was successful. In this position, he supervised the interpreters, hunters, and voyageurs. In 1836, he was tasked with setting up a new post at Otter Tail Lake, although the post did not succeed because of its location situated between Ojibwa and Dakota Territory. It appears that the risks of intertribal conflict were significant enough that the tra uh, voyagers and traders were not willing to travel to the post. Um, the following year, in 1837, George was fairly well known for tracking down an Ojibwa man, Chigawaskung, who was accused of mur murdering Alfred Aiken at Red Cedar Lake, which is now Cass Lake. Alfred was the son of George's boss, William Aitken. George had trailed Chigawaskung over five days and six nights through the winter uh, before bringing him back to Fort Snelling to face trial. The ensuing criminal trial was reputedly the first in what was then part of Wisconsin territory. Unfortunately, 
Chugawaskan was acquitted because Alfred Aiken was half Ojibwa, and the court decided that he, they had no jurisdiction over a case involving Native Americans. Um, George was unpopular with some other members of the tribe because of his role in this case, but he did continue living with the tribe for the rest of his life. In 1842, George married an Ojibwe woman himself, Ashwin. They had at least five children together. In the 1840s, the fur trade started to decline, and so George and Ashwin began turning to lodge keeping at their home at Leech Lake. And for many years, they welcomed travelers. One of the travelers, uh, Judge Charles Flandreau, spent two weeks at the Bongas Lodge in 1856. Years later, he described the visit saying, quote, he was a thorough gentleman in both feeling and deportment and was very anxious to contribute to my pleasure during my stay with him. He loved to dwell upon the grandeur of the chief factors of the old fur company and to show me how royally they traveled. He got up an excursion on the lake in a splendid birch bark boat canoe manned by 12 men who paddled to the music of a French Canadian boat song led by himself. George was very popular with the whites and loved to relate the, to the newcomers his adventures. He was about the blackest man I ever saw, so black that his skin fairly glistened, but was, excepting his brother Jack, the only black person in the country. Having never heard of any distinction between the people but that of between Indians and white men, he would frequently paralyze his listeners while reminiscing by saying, Gentlemen, I assure you that Jack Banfill and myself were the two, first two white men that ever came into this country. Um, as we've previously discussed, I can't prove that George was a guide or interpreter during the Cass expedition, but he is a signatory on other treaties. In 1847, he worked as an interpreter on the treaty with the pillagers signed at Leech Lake. And two decades later, in 1867, he actually traveled to Washington, D.C. to serve as a witness at the signing of a major treaty, reducing the size of the local Leech Lake Reservation and establishing a large new reservation at White Earth. Between the two treaties, George worked as an interpreter for the local Indian agent uh, from 1865 to 1867, and he also served as the superintendent of the government farm at the Leech Lake Reservation. During the 1860s, Bonga was known for writing letters on behalf of the Ojibwa complaining to the state government about individual Indian agents in the region. His letters are mostly held at the uh, Minnesota State Historical Society. The letters point out both his connections with the white government and with the Ojibwa, but he still refers to them as the Indians, as a group quite separate from his own identity. While he was deeply concerned for their well-being and had kinship ties with them, it is also clear from his writing that he considered himself to be vastly different from the, quote, ignorant Indians. George does not appear to have had a firmly entrenched identity as an Ojibwa because he didn't grow up with them. Rather, he reveals a rather paternalistic attitude towards the community. George died in his lodge in 1874 and I have to note that some of the stories told about the family give multiple other dates, sometimes multiple dates within the same article. Um, the family has suffered quite a bit from copy and paste research where people will just find somebody else and just cut it into their own ar um, articles. And so they've confused the death dates of various family members. Um, so I think that's where some of these confusions about the family have come from. Oops. They had already switched over. So George's brother, Stephen, uh, was born near the mouth of the St. Louis River in 1798. He is described as being the first person of African ancestry to be born in the Duluth area, although we think they actually had an older sister. We're not sure where she was born. Stephen was baptized in Montreal, but was reportedly sent to Albany, New York, to study to become a Presbyterian minister. He did not finish his schooling and eventually returned to the Lake Superior region, where he and George went into the fur trade with their father, working for the American Fur Company. Stephen married an Ojibwa woman, recorded as Mary, and they had at least two children. Like George, Stephen was often called upon as a translator, assisting with native and non-native communications. 
1837, he served as the interpreter at Minnesota's Fort Snelling in Wisconsin Territory, or for Wisconsin Territory Governor Henry Dodge, who was trying to negotiate a tr peace treaty between a band of Ojibwa and a band of Dakota. Uh, the treaty was signed, um, and even though uh, Stephen was working as a clerk and serving as an interpreter, you can see here, he did actually sign with his mark rather than his own signature, which suggests that he may have been illiterate even given all of his schooling. Although Stephen left the Presbyterian Seminary, um, he is known for his piety throughout his life. In 1838, he was hired as an interpreter by Methodist missionary Alfred Brunson, who described Stephen as, quote, religious and included to the missions, uh, speaking both languages with fluency and correctness. Uh, this missionary would actually have a significant impact on Stephen's sister, Marguerite, who will be discussed in a few minutes. During the bitterly cold December of 1850, Stephen and his wife were part of a group of 3,000 Lake Superior Ojibwa who traveled 500 miles from Wisconsin to Minnesota's Sandy Lake to receive annuities that had been promised to them by treaties. The meeting place was dis a disguised effort by the government to force the tribe to permanently relocate. When they arrived, they did not receive the, tr um, the excuse me, the annuities, and instead were provided with moldy flour and spoiled meat, leading to outbreaks of measles and food poisoning. Some 150 people died initially, and another 400 died during the trip home due to food poisoning, hunger, or exposure. Stephen continued working as a voyageur. In 1857, he was actually asked to guide artist Eastman Johnson through the Lake Superior region to paint the Ojibwa people and their land. The tour included the present day locations of Grand Portage National Monument, the Apostle Islands National Monument, and Isle Royal National Park. The resulting oil paintings, charcoals, and pastel drawings have gained renewed interest through national ex exhibitions. Stephen died in Superior, Wisconsin in 1884. There we go. So, um, Stephen and George's sister, Marguerite, was probably the oldest child in the family, born around 1797, and her native name may have been Kajiji. Marguerite married another employee of the American Fur Company, further extending the family's kinship network. Her husband was Jacob Falstrom, who is considered to be the first Swedish immigrant to both Manitoba oops, and uh, Minnesota. Jacob was known as a wanderer and had come to Canada working for the Hudson Bay Company. Um, like the other fam member, family members, there are multiple stories as to how he ended up in uh, Canada. After his contract with the Hudson Bay Company, he briefly uh, worked for the Northwest Company and then went to work for the American Fur Company, which is presumably how he came into contact with the Bongas. By 1819, Jacob was near the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers when the U.S. Army arrived to establish Fort Snelling. Jacob and Marguerite married at Fond du Lac in 1823, and they had probably nine children. There's a couple of repeated names that appear to be children that died young and were, the names were reused, but it's not entirely clear how many children they had. Around 1825, Jacob was working as a striker in the blacksmith shop at Fort Snelling and at the nearby St. Peter's Indian Agency. Uh, the striker was usually an assistant and the blacksmith would indicate where to tap something with a small hammer and then the striker would use the big hammer to actually do the work. Um, the Falstrom's home is recorded as a blacksmith shop on a map of the area made in 1832. Jacob was also known for supplying the fort with wood and worked as a mail carrier, taking mail up the St. Croix River, going as far as uh, Lake Superior, and heading as far south as Prairie du Chien. Although it's not possible to confirm at um, this time, he may have been on Henry Schoolcraft's 1832 expedition to discover the source of the Mississippi River. Uh, Schoolcraft does not provide any descriptive details, but one of the guides on the trip was named Ozawindib, Yellowhead, 
um, which was the Native American name used by Jacob, but there were known to be other people with that name in the region. So it's not clear which of the Ozawindibs was the guide on that 1832 expedition. The Falstroms and others had been allowed to settle near Fort Snelling um, because they were considered to be useful. But following a further treaty with the Native Americans, the civilians were finally asked to leave, uh, and those who were resisted were forcibly evicted. The Falstroms simply moved across the Mississippi River, not realizing that was still Fort Land. They were evicted two more times before they finally decided to walk east uh, as far as they could before the sun set to be sure that they would be well and truly away from the army. Uh, the family finally settled on a farm near the Wisconsin state line. As I had mentioned, Stephen had been working for a Methodist missionary and around 1838, that missionary set up the Kaposia Methodist Mission in an attempt to convert the Native Americans. And one of the best converts they had was Marguerite's husband, Jacob. Um, Brunson considered the conversion of the Falstrom family to be his most significant achievement in the area. He wrote in his memoirs, quote, the state of things among the Indians was very detrimental to our operations among them, yet we were not without some fruit. Jacob Falstrom was converted, which led to the conversion of his family and their education, and they are yet doing good in Minnesota. The conversion of this family and their subsequent respectability and usefulness as the fruit of our missionary operations in that country was worth all its cost. Jacob became known as Father Jacob, and he was licensed as an exhorter or lay preacher for the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1840. He was fluent in Ojibwa, English, French, Dakota, Iroquois, and his native Swedish, and he preached in all of those languages. His circuit stretched from the Rum River up to Lake Superior, and he was often away from home for extensive periods of time, traveling throughout the region. And he was considered to be one of the most successful missionaries to the Native Americans in the region. While Jacob traveled, Margaret and her children kept open the house, their house for the weary uh, and sometimes hungry circuit riders. Uh, several Falstrom memories, including Margaret, are listed in class records in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and it is recorded that uh, Margaret, or in this case Margaret rather than Marguerite, uh, was a woman of fine mind. With her limited educational privileges, very few of any age or race can be found her equal. Mr. and Mrs. Falstrom were both consistent Christians and member of the Methodist Church for many years. Their daughter, uh, Nancy Fulstrom, was also remembered as being uh, a woman of rare intellect and accomplishments who served as an interpreter during services and meetings in which the missionaries conducted at Red Rock Prairie. Even with her conversion to Methodism, Margaret and her children retained some of their Ojibwe culture. The family is reported to have spoke Ojibwe at home, and each spring the family visited the maple-covered Manitou Island in the middle of White Bear Lake to make maple sugar. Jacob died in 1859 and is buried in a cemetery on the family farm, and Marguerite survived him by 21 years, dying there in 1880. Okay. So. Um, so this is uh, somebody I'm not actually talking about. This is other family members that we do have pictures of. This is George's son, William uh, Bonga, uh, and then this is a picture, and there are two Bonga descendants uh, in the top upper corners, both corners. Uh, on the top left is Paul Bonga, who was a son of Stephen, and the top right is William Bonga, George's son. So, the last of Pierre and Ojibwe Kwe's children was Jack, and he's the only one of the sons with a recorded Native American name, Enodagan. He was born much later than his siblings, around 1817. Uh, and as part of these um, kin networks, Jack actually married his sister-in-law, Ashwin, George's wife's sister, um, Data Gemwikabe, I believe I said that right. Um, she was known as Data. Uh, in the 1860 census, Jack and Data are listed with seven children, six girls and one boy. And one of their daughters, Canib, extend the family's kin network by marrying William Warren, who was a grandson of uh, William Aiken, the fur trader that George had worked for 
several decades earlier. So these were all interrelated families. The marriages worked to cement Jack and George's ties in the Pillager region, as well among the trader families in the Lake uh, Fond du Lac department. So this last one, uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture of, but this would be George's daughter, Susan. And she was one of the first ones to feel uh, real issues with her, native, or with her African heritage. Her native name was Mukam, yeah, excuse me, Mukam Anukwe. She was born around 1853 and was raised primarily by her Ojibwa mother, Ashwin. Uh, in the Ojibwa culture, mothers typically assumed full responsibility for their infant children until they weaned. And then as the children grew older, they would either go, the boys with their fathers and the girls with their mothers. So in keeping with this practice, Susan was educated differently from her family. Uh, so she attended the Indian boarding school at Leech Lake rather than being sent east like her brothers to attend school. The Leech Lake boarding school was opened around 1860 and was run by a Congregationalist minister. Susan excelled, excelled at the school, learning domestic skills, religious instruction, and speaking English. Shortly after she graduated, she was hired as the school's matron to, quote, cook for all the students while instructing the girls in food preparation, helping them to create their wardrobes while teaching them how to sew, and bathing them while informing them of sanitary practice, in addition to providing a motherly figure. The goal was changing every aspect of Native American households. Uh, there was particularly a drive to transform Native American women and girls into the vehicles of perpetuating civilization into their communities. Susan took on a leadership role among the Indian women, but she was also known for advising the men in her family. Uh, particularly, her brothers kept asking her for advice on their business practices. When Charles Wright, uh, whose Ojibwa name was Nashota, was an Ojibwa Episcopal deacon, arrived at Leech Lake as a missionary in 1880, he took over as teacher of the day school. Um, in their role as teacher and matron, Charles and Susan worked closely together, and their, as their relationship developed, they began to discuss marriage. But there was a question about whether Susan's black ancestry would undermine her position as the minister's wife. One of the other missionaries wrote to the bishop about the situation. Quote, Reverend Charles Wright of Leech Lake asked me to write to you about the propriety of his marrying Miss Susie Bonga, the daughter of the late George Bonga, whom you knew. She has a reputation of being an exceedingly wise, chaste, and good religious woman, one who is exceedingly highly thought of by all the white employees at Leech Lake and respected by all Indians and whites. She is a very good housekeeper, speaks English pretty well, has considerable learning, is of spotless character, and has on all counts been advanced uh, to the position of matron on the, at the Indian school, which she fulfills perfectly. There is no doubt uh, that if she continues as she has done in the past, she would advance his work far more than any other wife he could find, Indian or white. He wishes to marry her. There is only one thing that sticks in his mind, her Negro blood. He has heard that white people look down on Negroes. She shows the Negro blood but little. Her hair is perfectly straight, and her lips are not like the Negro, but her brothers and sisters show it very much. Evidently, the concerns were resolved, and the couple did marry in 1882, more than two years after that original letter was sent to the bishop. After marrying, Susan continued her leadership role among the women of Leech Lake. Interestingly, she appears to have not been as perfectly assimilated as the missionary was indicating in his letter to the bishop. Another missionary, Pauline Colby, uh, referred to Susan as Mrs. Natosha, rather than by Mrs. Wright. Uh, and she also recorded several incidents in which Susan displayed Ojibwe ide ideas about property, referring to the concept of communally owned property and particularly thinking that it was appropriate for people to take food from those who had it to give more to those who did not. She also continued to exercise Ojibwe forms of social governance in the women's work groups, such as making political decisions through uh, consensus and distributing goods to community members. 
So the Bonga family built a dynasty within the fur trade, securing their name, reputation, and fortune for themselves. They had an intergenerational pattern of paying attention to and cultivating the fur trade society's kin networks and the customs of reciprocity to integrate themselves into their communities in a world where fixed notions of their identity were fluid. Because they were good at building alliances and secured advantageous marriages, particularly within the Ojibwa community, they were able to lead the lives of typical traders. Uh, Currently, uh, Bungo Township in Cass County, Minnesota is named after the family, and their descendants can still be found within the local Ojibwa community. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What, this? No. Oh, there. Oh. Oh, Marty's got a question. All right, uh, questions, Marty. So you mentioned William Warren. Yes. Is that the William Warren Whipple? Ojibwe it's history? He, it's his son. His son. Okay, thanks. Yep. There are other questions? Uh, Russ. Russ. And I should say thank you to Russ because it was one of his articles that first introduced me to the bongas. <laughs> did, you run across, did you run across anything of one of the bongas, the, probably the, the uh, son of the original family, mm -hmm. John and Marie, uh, being involved in the creation of a fur trading post, and sometimes they say it's the creation of Menominee, Michigan. No, I didn't see anything about Menominee. But I know I didn't get into everything. There is a lot on th out there on them. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering, how long did the voyagers last? Because that had to be a you know, very rugged life and everything. I don't actually remember. I know they were quite long. Um, do any of the other historians in the room know? I'm not remembering off the top of my head. As to, like, age-wise. How, how, how old was George when he died? Uh, George was about 72-ish. So that actually probably yeah. would have been old for a voyager, and that probably is because he was a trader as well, and so he got out of the business of doing all the work. <laughs> the, uh, the voyagers, the actual guys who did the paddling and everything were, um, I think, uh, in their 50s was probably average if they got that far. Um, because it was incredibly hard. He talked about the weight that he carried. Mm -hmm. Now, they, yeah, they carry two packs each, 180 pounds each trip. But at night, they would often sit around campfires and they would challenge each other <laughs> to who could carry the most packs. And unfortunately, this often led to hernias because <laughs> um, they oftentimes were beveraged, as I'd like to put it. <laughs> um, and I wonder about this myself. I'm a descendant of voyagers, and my uncles and my dad were the same way. They get a few in them, and they'd start challenging each other: who could do this and who could do that. And so it doesn't surprise me that that was the case. Also, many of them could not swim. They were hired if they could not swim because they didn't want them to take chances on the canoes. And so many of them drowned. So uh, there was a lot of different ways. And so yeah, they didn't generally live long. Uh, helpful lives, but yeah. that 72 is pretty good for a, a poor voyager. Well, uh, his brother Stephen was supposed to have been 86. Wow, that's yeah. that's great. Why don't we see their where their feet are? You know, is it the image that's cut off, or or why is that done? What I didn't. Oh, he's wondering why they, their feet were cropped out of all the photos. Those think, were the copies of the images I received. I don't know if that was in the original or whoever digitized the images. Yeah, it's hard to say. That's a good question. Early photography is a, is an intriguing thing. We got a gentleman over here who wants to ask a question. I'll get back to you, Russ. I think in that last picture, there's yep. uh, George has his lips like closed up. Is he trying to hide his African American lips, or is that just? 
I don't know. Okay. Um, it, that was actually the two cousins. So that was Paul and ja um, William. But it could be. It could I wasn't just sure. Be. I just you thought it was something about their lips earlier in the talk. So I just yeah. thought you might, might have been like. I have item. no idea what they were thinking when they took that picture. I mean, it could just be that taking pictures is, takes a long time at that time frame, and you're just not going to smile because it's harder to maintain a smile. It could have been something to hide the African ancestry. I just don't know. I don't have that much insight into their thoughts. You know, I've noticed looking at <clears throat> looking at material uh, with the Bonga family. Mm -hmm. It seems that, I don't know if it's my imagination or whatever, it seems that Minnesota is excited about them and mm -hmm. they show up, et cetera. Yep. Michigan, very little or nothing dealing with, with the family yeah. or the name. When you put the name mm -hmm. online, Minnesota shows, shows up. up. Michigan's. I think that's because that was Pierre, where Pierre settled because the family was only at Mackinac for a decade and a half, roughly, and then they moved to Duluth, the Duluth area and stayed there. So I think that's the primary reason. There just aren't very many records of them at Mackinac. It's those few uh, baptismal and marriage records and then a few mentions in the uh, household of Captain Robertson. Um, everything else it primarily goes to Duluth and Minnesota, so there's more information there. Any other questions? All Beth, right. that is a fantastic research. Thanks for jumping yeah. into the void Thanks. and doing a great research. So our next presentation will be at two o'clock. Uh, Dr. Meinhardt will be, and then after that, we'll be more, learning more about Voyagers, Métis, and otherwise from Dr. Sebastian Millette from the Carleton College of Ottawa. Uh, and he'll actually probably clear up all the myths that I just said about Voyagers, I hope, <laughs> anyway. So.
you all for, for uh, sticking with us. Uh, we still have a few more sessions coming up. Following this, we'll have uh, Dr. Millette talking about uh, the Métis culture and Voyager culture, which I was just talking to him back, backstage. In fact, there was just uh, fascinating. You're going to be fascinated with um, his talk. Uh, and, uh, and after that, we're going to have something very special. A friend of mine who is a songwriter and composer and a uh, multimedia artist has done work about her hometown of Hibbing, Minnesota, and the mines there. Um, that she uh, actually isn't going to be here. It's going to be remote. In fact, it may just be recorded, but I hope you'll stick around for that. It's going to be very powerful and special. Uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, a good friend of mine and a really important part of Northern's educational community uh, and, and the, our link with, uh, with the indigenous people of this region. And uh, he's going to be talking about the uh, Three Fires Confederacy and a treaty relationships with other nations. So would you please welcome Dr. Martin Reinhardt. Oh, buju. Okay, I'm just going to use that map that Brian used earlier. My name is Marty Reinhardt. My family is Anishinaabe Ojibwe. We're a Crane Clan. Uh, I grew up on this side of the U.S. Canadian border as part of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. And my Mom and her dad are from the uh, Garden River First Nation, uh, Gitagon ZB, over in Ontario. So my grandmother was Sugar Island, uh, Sault Ste. Marie Band, and my grandfather was Gitagon ZB. And I was just telling someone earlier that uh, my grandfather would sneak across that the uh, area between Payment and Garden River. It was only, you could throw a rock across the river. It's that close. Um, but yeah, lots of stories about how he met my gram. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, so my wife and I, we are both Anishinaabe Ojibwe. We have two daughters, uh, Niminongos and Bidaban, and they are both graduates from here, uh, NMU, and have gone on and gotten their uh, master's degrees, both of them. Hard to believe that they're that old now. They came here, we, we came here to NMU, they were both little. So, uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about treaty relations. I hope you like the drawing on the title slide, that's an eagle feather, if you hadn't picked up on that. Uh, eagle feathers represent a lot of things in our culture. Uh, one, uh, the most important things, I think, is that it represents the thinking the highest thought. And that's a really good thing to keep in mind as you're learning all of these things. Thinking the highest thought. That's a Dr. Gregory Cajete, a Tiwa professor and friend of mine uh, who wrote, Look to the Mountain, an Ecology of Indigenous Education. He said that, and it's always stuck with me. You know, thinking the highest thought is represented by an eagle feather. So uh, here's a picture of an old white guy. This is W.I. Thomas. He's an American sociologist from back in the 1920s. And he said, uh, if we define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. If you take my classes here at NMU, that's one of the first things we talk about in my classes because so much of what we learn about American Indian people is based on our commonly held beliefs. We get so much from the media, uh, so much that we then extrapolate, and you know, there's really no basis in history for. A lot of it's uh, stereotypical, biased, racist, you know, whatever. Uh, common knowledge. And so it's really important to set the record straight of what we do know. Here's an a old Indian guy uh, who is known as the, pretty much the great-grandfather of Native American studies, Vine Deloria. Uh, Vine Deloria... Uh, had a perspective on treaties. It says the best way to restore dignity to the tribes is to fulfill the original promises made in tribes in the treaties and agreements of former years. Said that back in the 1970s when they were doing the, uh, the uh, Trail of Broken Treaties. You guys remember the Trail of Broken Treaties? Uh, again, in 1999, he says, the treaty process is viable, remains the most appropriate, most fair, and certainly the clearest manner in which to identify and demarcate the rights of tribal nations. I almost met him uh, when I went to Denver. I was in Colorado, I almost met him. I, in fact, I was scheduled to go uh, visit with him and then he passed on. It was quite rude. Was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lewis Cass fought against Indians in the War of 1812. 
He was a slave owner and a leading spokesperson, if you guys know from watching the uh, previous presentations today, a leading spokesperson for the doctrine of popular sovereignty regarding slavery and states' rights. Uh, he negotiated 20 treaties while well, he served as the governor of the Michigan Territory. And after he resigned as governor, he accepted his appointment as Secretary of War under Jackson, the Indian killer. Remember President Jackson, Indian killer was his nickname. As Secretary of War, he implemented Jackson's policy of Indian removal. He advocated for moving all tribes west of the Mississippi River. In light of Vine Deloria's statements, uh, we would be hard pressed to defend that the uh, U.S. treaty negotiations under Cass, uh, that they were promises um, made that were fair and appropriate. Right, so Vine Deloria has a perspective that they were fair, most fair and appropriate. Of course, you know, under Cass, we already know what the outcomes of those were. Hardly anything but fair and appropriate. But regardless of the raw deal that the tribes got from Cass, treaties are still promises made between sovereign nations, between governments, and they are still currently enforceable. These are still good law, and as such, must be honored. So, in the Atlas of Great Lakes Indian History, how many of you guys have, are familiar with Atlas of Great Lakes Indian History? Okay, a few. Uh, Helen Hornbeck Tanner, another one of my friends. I visited with Helen before she passed on. She lived in a high rise in uh, Chicago. We had taken a train from Pennsylvania where I was in my doc program out there uh, at Penn State University from there to Texas and went through Chicago and she happened to be in Chicago, so I called her up, we went and visited her. First time I'd ever taken a shower in a high rise, they go like this, makes you think you're having a heart attack or something. Anyway, uh, but she and I were talking about her book, Atlas of Great Lakes Indian History and her testimony that she gave about the Michigan Indian tuition waiver, the lawsuit uh, that the Anishinaabe people filed against the University of Michigan uh, back in the early 70s. Uh, claiming that we had rights, treaty rights, to education. And she testified against us at that point in time. Good thing I didn't meet her then, because I probably wouldn't have been her friend, right? Uh, she later recanted that testimony. She said she didn't uh, know enough at that point in time, and she changed her mind later on. Of course, that didn't help our, our situation, but by then we already had the Michigan Indian tuition waiver. But had she, she said that had she been able to go back, she would have write, tried to right a wrong uh, from her own testimony. Anyway, according to Tanner, indigenous people had played a significant role in the pre, or in the pre-colonial history, yeah, of the Great Lakes region include three classes. The resident people, refugees, principally from the Atlantic seaboard and temporary allies or opponents coming from the area south or west of the Great Lakes. She explains that indigenous people with traditional homelands in the Great Lakes region include the Haudenosaunee, uh, including Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca. Huron, Wyandotte, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, Menominee, Dakota, Meskwaki, Sauk, Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Maskutin, Miami, and Shawnee. That's who those three classes, or the residents, are composed of. This is a subsistence pattern map from the Atlas of Great Lakes Indian History. It shows the abundance of indigenous plants and animals that were located in our homelands in a pre-colonial context. Notice the manumen, or the wild rice, in the upper Great Lakes region. Uh, notice the moose. Notice the wawash kashik, or the deer, the gigok, or fish, the mandamin, or corn, and the ishkode bijiki, the bison. A lot of people don't realize we had bison here in the Great Lakes region. They're woodlands bison. Uh, not like Circle K Ranch over in Rudyard, but they still taste good. Uh, there's some ambiguity in identity. You know, we, uh, some, some folks were talking about identity earlier. When we're talking about Anishinaabe, it could really mean Ojibwe, spelled many possible ways. Ojibwe, 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 Chippewa, uh, Ochipwe, Chippewa. So there's a number of ways people say our name. Odawa includes Odawe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi has been spelled Bodawatomi, Badawatomi, Potawatomi with a Y. There's a number of ways people misspell our names throughout history because we didn't have the same spelling method as people currently use. 
But given the uh, federal acknowledgement process and the Indian Reorganization Act processes that were set forth, uh, we can also be referred to as the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians or the White Earth Nation or the Nottawa Sepi Huron Band of Potawatomi. So there's a number of ways that people understand us, uh, but what's most important is that how we understand ourselves. I ask my students at the beginning of each semester, what does Aboriginal, Indigenous, Native, North American, Indian, Tribal, First Nation have in common? What do you think? What, what do they have in common? Names that we've been called by others than ourselves. They all pretty much mean the same thing, uh, but, and you know, some people take offense at one or the other. It really doesn't bother me that much unless they say it in a mean way, right? But yeah, it's best when we, if we know about people, to use the terms that are mostly related to them, what they call themselves. It's also very important for treaties because the more specific we can be, the more we understand the content of treaties. By the way, if you go to France, don't call French people Europeans. Yo, what's up, Europeans? Because they're not going to take, uh, you know, they will take offense to that. So just to give you an idea. There are 12 federally recognized tribes here in Michigan. Now you can see on the map where the uh, headquarters are. Uh, here in the Upper Peninsula, we have five tribes. Uh, my tribe, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, we have a seven-county service area that stretches from C uh, Sault Ste. Marie here to Marquette and down to Escanaba. Uh, we have five casinos. We are not a per capita tribe, uh, meaning we don't get uh, per capita distributions from our casinos, uh, although we do have an elders fund, and in five years, I'll be eligible. So <laughs> it's like 500 bucks a year so, for Christmas presents. Uh, there are some tribes in Michigan that are not among the tribes listed as currently federally recognized. These tribes may be at various stages in the process of applying for status. Uh, some of the tribal citizens may have been integrated into other local tribes by the tribes or the federal government. Examples include the Grand River Bands of Odawa Indians, or Ottawa Indians, the Burt Lake Band, Swan Creek, and Black River Bands. All of their citizens have treaty rights but they may run into a lot of issues when trying to exercise them. The Grand River Band of Ottawa Indians recently received notification that the Interior Department, who Brian Newland works for uh, earlier here, uh, found against their acknowledgement. Uh, in lieu of the findings, Representative Hillary Scholten uh, and John Molinar, both a Michigan Democrat and Republican, bipartisan, uh, introduced legislation called the Grand River Bands of Ottawa Indians Re Restoration Act. Uh, hopefully that happens. Uh, some of our students who have come through Northern are citizens of that band, and they're still not federally recognized after 30 years of trying to work on that. They are treaty signature, tr treaty signatory people. So why not? Uh, it's also important to realize that, you know, under federal Indian law, a, a tribe is seen as the entity to sign treaties, right? But a tribe does not have to be federally recognized to benefit from a treaty. So all of their citizens can and should go out and exercise their treaty rights, but they might get arrested, have their stuff impounded, and then sit some time in jail or whatever, even though they have treaty rights. That's the problem. Uh, I found out that through suing the state of Michigan and Enbridge, and Graymont Mining, a couple of court cases uh, over in the Eastern UP where I have treaty rights. Uh, Graymont Mining and Enbridge have done activities in our area uh, where they are destroying our, our treaty fishery and our treaty hunting areas, our, our gathering areas, our rights as individual tribal citizens. I sued myself and uh, five other people sued the state of Michigan, well, not the state of Michigan, but Graymont Mining and Enbridge because the state of Michigan and our tribe would not sue them. So if we felt, well, someone needs to, so we did and we lost. Uh, they said because we lack standing because we're not a tribe. But we, as the individuals, have rights. So it's a taking from our tribe, not the individuals, is how the federal government sees that. In order to understand our Anishinaabe perspective on treaties, it's first necessary to be familiar with our governance system. Medicine Wheel teachings about life in relationship to the world around us provides a fundamental orientation uh, to Anishinaabe governance. The center of the medicine wheel represents balance and harmony in nature. 
You see the medicine wheel over here, the yellow, red, black, and white in the center of that circle. Everything begins in the east, life cycles, days, years, relations, etc. If you turn a medicine wheel on its side, you can see that it's a spiral through time of multiple generations or iterations. The seven grandfathers, those things surrounding the medicine wheel there, provide us with a way to remain as healthy as we can be in our relations. As long as we try to live our lives in line with these teachings, we're taught that we can avoid their opposites. Uh, if we embrace love, we avoid hate, and so forth. They are respect, love, humility, courage, honesty, wisdom, and truth. Besides the medicine wheel teachings and the seven grandfathers, the fu uh, fundamental teachings of our culture, the Anishinaabek also structured our relations around dotum or clans. These clans had specific responsibilities and were always accountable to the larger nation. In fact, each clan was joined by two other clans in a system of checks and balances. These triads guaranteed that when there was conflict between two clans, it would be resolved by a third. Among these triads was the leadership clans of Crane, Loon, and Fish. Crane was responsible for external governance matters. Loon was responsible for internal governance. And Fish Clan, also sometimes referred to as Turtle Clan, was responsible for resolving any conflict between those two clans. In many ways, these three clans are similar to the three branches of the federal US government which is not coincidental as the US modeled its system after indigenous peoples, at least in some ways. So, our first treaty. Uh, in Boros' 2014 book, he explains that Jawenjige is another derivation of Jawenim. It means to hunt. We hear the word used in hunting and harvesting songs. When we sing Jawenim is Jitjige, it means you will be pitied or have mercy placed upon you in your actions and what you're doing. The idea behind this word is that when we acknowledge our relations with the world and our responsibilities to each other, then we'll be all be blessed and find love and compassion. We will be nourished, sustained, and taken care of. The idea of Jawenjige is said to be part of the old treaty made between the Anishinaabek and the plants and animals. As long as we love them, they will provide for us. They teach us about love and how to live well in the world. And important to remember is that this treaty is also still in effect. We also have examples of treaties made between the Anishinaabek and other tribes. According to Williams, the Anishinaabe made a wampum treaty of peace with the Haudenosaunee in 1701 that's called the dish with one spoon. Uh, it's interesting, we were over at Tina, my, uh, my wife and I, we went to visit our daughter when she was at SUNY ESF uh, over in uh, Syracuse, New York, going to school. And they, uh, my daughter knew we were coming to town, she told her professors, and one of her professors, Neil, I can't remember his last name at the moment, but uh, invited us to go lunch after we did a presentation, a guest presentation in their class about indigenous foods. So we got done, we went down the hall, and. We sat down and he brought us uh, beaver tail soup. And I was like, wow, I've never had beaver tail soup before. He said, well, you know, this is a special lunch because we know that you are uh, someone who studies food, indigenous foods, and we wanted to honor the historic relationship between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek by providing this meal. This was the meal for that treaty, the dish with one spoon treaty. So it was, real, it was a real honor, it was really nice to uh, be part of that and to have that be part of our, our visit there. Uh, according to Warren, the Anishinaabe also made a similar treaty with the Dakota in around 1695, in which we agreed to gather annually to smoke a pipe of peace and to visit one another during hunting seasons. It was agreed that we would allow each other to hunt in our shared territories without violence. These treaties are still in effect. According to Corbier, the Anishinaabe treaty process was principally an orally based uh, practice that utilized material objects as mnemonic devices. Once a treaty was established, it had to be renewed, often annually, around a council fire. We also had treaties with other foreign colonial nations other than the United States. Uh, according to Corbier, you can see the 
silver covenant chain wampum there on the screen, along with the silver medal uh, that, goes, that went along with that. Uh, these were some of those mnemonic devices that were associated with the Treaty of Niagara of 1764. This is the foundational treaty between the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy and the British. So this is our foundational relationship because of the United States being a fledgling country from Great Britain and the United States following British common law, we consider this our foundational treaty with the United States. So even though it predates the formation of the United States, we still see this as our foundational treaty uh, with the United States. Uh, interesting, I was looking at the Central Michigan University website on treaties. Uh, I, I uh, worked at Central Michigan University back from uh, 1994 to 1998 when I was doing my master's thesis on the pre-legislative history of the Michigan Indian Tuition Waiver, which I uh, concluded was treaty-based. And on their website, they use a lot of the material from my thesis in the website. But on there also, they have this section about treaty medallions. And so I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not, but uh, when the United States would come across people in our tribes and want to make a new treaty, and we would be wearing these treaty medallions from the British or the French or whoever, uh, they would require us to remove those and to have new medallions affixed to us. And so that they would say, here, let us take that one from you and give you a real one. And then we would wear the real ones because that one was now in effect. Um, so, oh, we'll say one more thing about those uh, treaty medallions. Uh, sometimes they're, uh, these, they're called neck medals, is how our people referred to them, neck medals, right? Medals, and sometimes they were more than just a medallion, sometimes it was like a, a necklace, right, a big necklace. Uh, so in uh, one treaty, the uh, Treaty of La Pointe, in the transcription of that treaty, the neck medal, uh, Wabegun, Wabegun, in our language, the, the metal, right? Uh, once it was placed on the uh, leader's chest, it became wabegak. Now, to some people, that might, like, so what? But for Anishinaabe, that's huge because it went from inanimate to animate. It was then imbibed with life. So that neck metal is considered alive. And as long as that treaty is enforced, as long as we have that metal to commemorate it, it's treated as a living object. So that's really important to understand. Okay, the trilateral relationship. You heard uh, Brian Newland earlier talk about the uh, sovereignty, about the trust relationship between the federal government and tribal governments. In Michigan, we have a, a rather unique situation here. In 1934, Governor Comstock, uh, the state of Michigan governor at the time, made a deal with the U.S. Congress that in exchange for the Mount Pleasant Indian boarding schools, that the state of Michigan would take on responsibility for caring for all Indians resident within the state of Michigan from that point forward. I'm almost saying that verbatim, by the way. So, I mean, I've seen it so many times and have repeated it so many times that that, I can literally almost see it in my head now and remember it. So what does that mean? as far as treaty relationships, as far as who's responsible for uh, making sure that those treaty obligations are met. It sounds to me like the state of Michigan is. It really does, you know, and I just keep replaying that in my head. But yet the federal government's the one that made those treaties. Remember uh, what Brian said, it's a constitutional responsibility for the President of the United States to make treaties, all right? Okay, so just keep that in mind as we're moving forward here. So here is that Constitution, paragraph 2, where it says, The Constitution laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. This is the supremacy clause that Brian Newland was talking about earlier today. The supreme law of the land. And then the last part there, And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. And anything in the Constitution or laws at any state to the contrary notwithstanding. State law is trumped by treaties, in other words.
Uh, this is the Treaty of 1836, an artist's illustration of the uh, Treaty of 1836 at Cedar Point. Uh, the U.S. entered into several treaties between 1778 and 1871 with American Indian tribes. There are 372 treaties and 13 treaty supplements. So 383 if you're, if you're doing the math. That were ratified by the U.S. Senate, which then became law and is still good law today. In 1871, the U.S. Congress included a rider within the Indian Appropriations Act prohibiting further treaty making. One of the first constitutional dilemmas the United States dealt with was Indian law. And why was that? Because the U.S. Congress had the right for, to uh, make appropriations and the U.S. Senate had the authority to ratify treaties. And so the U.S. Congress said, you know what? From this point forward, we're not going to ratify any treaties and we're not going to make any appropriations to do so. So the President of the United States could have said, hey, that's not yours to, to do. That's you know, a presidential power by the uh, US Constitution. The President was silent, didn't contest it. The United States Supreme Court could have said, hey, you know what, guys? That's not constitutional. Someone's going to you know, make some uh, challenge about this. No one, no one made a challenge, or the challenge was never accepted if it was made. It was silent. Maybe they just didn't want to uh, deal with it. But yes, it was a, certainly a constitutional dilemma that the two other branches could have taken on and decided not to. Uh, important to that rider on the Indian Appropriations Act, uh, it does say within there that uh, no Indian nation or tribe within the territory of the United States shall be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation, tribe, or power with whom the United States may contract by treaty, but no obligation of any tre treaty lawfully made and ratified with such Indian nation or tribe made prior to March 3, 1871 shall hereby be invalidated or impaired. So all treaties made prior to that date were still good law. Such treaties and any executive orders and acts of Congress under which the rights of any Indian tribe to fish are secured shall be construed to prohibit, in addition to any other prohibition, the imposition under any law of a state or political subdivision thereof of any tax on any income derived from the exercise of rights secured by such treaty. So what does all of that mean? You're, if you're doing Indian stuff, Indian fishing, Indian hunting, Indian crafting, and you're using your treaty rights, Indian educating, you should not have to pay income tax on it. Now, that's pretty bold, right? And we've had our Indian fisher people in our tribe, in many tribal communities that have fishing rights, have tried that, and the IRS does recognize that that is a right. They don't get taxed. So I, I was thinking about that. You know, back when I got done with Penn State, and I was like, why am I paying taxes? I'm an Indian educator. We have educational rights. So I wrote to the IRS, and I said, hey, you know, I, I want to challenge this. If our Indian fisher people don't have to pay tax, why should I? At first, they said, well, it's different. It's, you know, it's totally different. I was like, tell me why it's different. And they couldn't figure out a good reason, and they sent me back my income tax. <laughs> so now every year I challenge it, and some years I get it back, some years I have to challenge it again, some, so... It fluctuates. The Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi separately and or together are party to at least 73 treaties in the United States. 73 and 48 treaties with Canada and or Great Britain. The treaties include a range of provisions including peace and friendship, land, education, food, health, etc., etc. These are the land session uh, areas in Canada. You can see that many of those are within the Great Lakes region uh, and uh, attached to the lands that, of course, were part of the Lewis Cass uh, treaties that he negotiated on behalf of the United States. Uh, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to play this interactive map, but you should go to this website at some point in time and just watch it. Sometimes I'll bring it up on my screen just to watch how it goes from the East Coast across the United States as it cascades. It shows all of the land sessions uh, that occurred and by date. You can actually see that 
they're color coded. And so it goes through the Great Lakes region. The 13 original colonies on the East Coast are grayed out because those are not US treaties. Those are previous treaties. And of course, uh, Texas and Louisiana down there as well. But worthy of uh, watching, just for one time at the very least. Uh, specific to Michigan, you know, we have this color coded map that shows uh, down at number one in the bottom right hand corner, the Treaty of Greenville of 1795. Number two, the yellow area that cover, encompasses Detroit. And this is the Treaty of Detroit of 1807, the another land session treaty. Number three, the foot of the rapids right there uh, down uh, mid, mid southern state. Saginaw Treaty of 1819, number four, the blue area. Treaty of 1820, Sault Ste. Marie, up number five, way up there up north by the Canadian border. Uh, that one is right on top of my family's home. You know, we have a, a Sugar Island in Sault Ste. Marie is where I grew up. And number five is something that I invoke every time I go home. Uh, treaty six, uh, Chicago Treaty of 1821, that's uh, the green area. That's the Pokagon Band, the Huron Nottawasepi, uh, the Amache Panachewish. Number seven, Cary Mission, uh, down way down the pink area down south there. Chicago Treaty of 1833, that's that little itty bitty spot in Michigan, much bigger in Indiana and Illinois. Uh, number nine, the one that Brian Newland was talking about earlier, the Treaty of Washington of 1836 with the Ottawa, et cetera. Over 13.5 million acres of land uh, seated in that largest of all the treaties. Uh, the Cedar Point Treaty, which I talked about earlier of 1836, number 10, down by Escanaba in that area. And then uh, lastly, the Treaty of La Pointe, 1842, number 11, uh, which covers the western half of the Upper Peninsula. Here's that Royce map that Brian Newland showed you earlier. Uh, these are held by, or taken, created by the Bureau of American Ethnology. This is the land sessions. You can see they're color coded again. And here is what remains after the land sessions under Indian control, Indian jurisdiction. You can barely see them, right? The little red areas? Okay. I like doing this too, flipping back and forth because it really shows exactly what the hell happened here. Here's Wisconsin, treaty ceded territories, the before picture, here's after. Here's Minnesota before, treaty ceded territories, here's after. Now, Minnesota has a little bit bigger reservations than we do, uh, but still devastating, right? Okay, what is the difference between uh, all, the, all these rights? We have three primary differences. Our first that uh, Brian spoke to earlier was the idea of aboriginal rights. These are the rights we inherit from our Indian ancestors. Uh, these come from Anishinaabe. They don't come out of Indian federal Indian law, they don't come from Great Britain, anywhere else, they're right from here. These are reserved rights, unless that are specifically mentioned in treaty or a subsequent federal statute. They're protected as aspects of tribal sovereignty under the US uh, trust relationship. It's a protectoriate relationship that we have established. Now, treaty rights, oh by the way, aboriginal rights uh, are supposed to be protected by the United States, supposed to be. Now, have they done a good job as stewards of those rights? No, I can tell you that, you guys know that. Treaty rights, these are rights that are stipulated for the retention of rights in treaties, that we are going to retain these rights, the United States recognizes it. Uh, some of them stipulate for the removal of a right. And you know that's a hard pill to swallow when it's taking rights away from native people. These are protected under the US Constitution Supremacy Clause, as we've discussed. There should be no doubt about the supremacy of these laws. If we're gonna follow our US Constitution and be a nation of laws, which you know, lately I kind of wonder what does that even mean in our country? But these are supposed to be protected uh, at the same level as the US Constitution. Lastly is civil rights. 
You know, Indian people have the same civil rights as other U.S. citizens, as other residents of the state of Michigan, as other uh, residents of the city of Marquette or wherever we're living. But we also have additional civil rights. We have the civil rights we enjoy within our tribes. So under the Indian Civil Rights Act, we have certain rights within our tribe that maybe non-Native people don't have. So we have additional civil rights. Plus, we also have over 500 laws pertaining to Indian people in federal law uh, that may go beyond what uh, civil rights other people in the United States enjoy. Way too complex to get into today. But let's focus on how the U.S. Supreme Court is supposed to think about our treaty rights if they become cases, because ultimately they will. There are the, they are supposed to use the canons of treaty construction. This is their litmus test for our treaty rights. I like that ambiguity, what happens in vagueness stays in vagueness. That's funny. Uh, so ambiguities in treaties must be resolved in favor of Indians. If there is any ambiguous statement within treaties, it is supposed to be resolved in our favor. They must be interpreted as our ancestors, our native ancestors, would have understood them at the time they were written. And then finally, they must be construed liberally in favor of Indians. I have to really explain that one to my students because when I say liberally, they say, oh, so is it liberal conservative? Is it Democrat Republican? No, it is not. This has nothing to do with Democrats and Republicans. Well, maybe a little bit. But this has more to do with quantity. So if a treaty says the Indians shall receive an annuity for one year and as long as Congress may think proper, then, okay, well, how, how do we determine how long Congress thinks proper? Some people might argue that Congress never thinks proper, right? But no. How does, uh, how does Congress tell the world what Congress thinks? What's their, what's their primary action by law that they're supposed to do? Make laws, right? That's how Congress tells the world what they think is proper. So until Congress passes a law that says we are no longer going to af afford these Indian nations that annuity, that annuity should continue on into infinity. That's a liberal perspective uh, that benefits the Indian party. Now, a conservative perspective on that means, hey, you got it one year, now we decided we're not going to give it to you, we're just not going to put it in the Appropriations Act. No, that's not, that's not specific enough. You can't do that. This is a treaty right. Okay, 1820s. This is one that was negotiated by Lewis Cass. At the Treaty of Negotiations at Fond du Lac, Shingwabo Sin, who had repeatedly suggested he would resist white settlement, rejected efforts on the part of the federal negotiators, Lewis Cass, uh, to change his position. As the conference drew to a close, Shingwabo Sin observed one of the federal government negotiators seated on a tree stump. It might have been Cass, I don't know. Shingwabo Sin made his way to the same stump and sat very close to the negotiator, practically pushing him off the tree. When the negotiator moved to another log, Shingwabo Sin followed him, eventually pushing the negotiator onto the ground. Looking at the man laying in front of him, Shingwabo Sin spoke to him. There, my father, that's the way you serve your poor red children. The great spirit hears me and I will speak. I came and asked you for a seat at which, on which to rest my limbs. You gave it to me. Not contented with this, I urged you for more until you gave. And I again demanded more until you had none left. Many moons ago, our father crossed the big water, the Atlantic Ocean, and begged of his red children a small piece of land on which he might build his wigwam. It was given him, but not being satisfied, he again asked his red children for more. This was given, and still more, until his red children abandoned their homes and hunting grounds of all their fathers to make way for the white man. Now when the great chiefs and braves of their nation are at rest, our, fathers for, our father is sending, uh, for sending us further west to where the sun sets, and sinks into the big lake, the Pacific Ocean. I don't think he was too happy with the negotiator. <laughs> this is an image on birch bark carried by Ojibwe leaders to Washington, D.C. to adjust the boundaries of the treaty. They felt like the boundaries were not being interpreted as they understood it in the treaty. The lines connect the hearts and the eyes of the dotum representatives, catfish, manfish, bear, martens, and crane to each other and to the land and water. 
you can see that one line going off of the birch bark scroll. Uh, who do you think that line connects to? The President of the United States. Yeah, these images uh, that we see, these treaty images, can tell us a lot about how to interpret treaties. It's the one thing that might be less biased in the current contemporary uh, interpretation of treaty rights than either the written word, which was transcribed by the United States agents, or by uh, oral tradition, which uh, for Anishinaabe and other native people could be biased toward us. You know, if you ask me uh, to interpret a treaty, I'm gonna be a little more biased toward indigenous rights. I admit it, you know. But this, this piece, this piece of birch bark here doesn't lie. It shows exactly what our ancestors were thinking at that time. But how do we interpret that? That's how we gotta figure this out. I'm not gonna read the Anishinaab Bamuan here, but go ahead and if you're an Anishinaab Bamuan reader, you can read along with the Anishinaab Bamuan. Uh, well, I will offer it to him, that which he asked of me, white pine. As far as you will cut, well, that is where what I offer you. Not over here having roots, I don't offer it to you. And again, this which I hold, maple, and this oak, and this one grass which I hold, manumen, I so call it this, not these, I don't offer it to you. This is a transcription, a bilingual petition, from the bilingual petition of Lake, Superior's, of Lake Superior 1864 regarding the treaty made at Fond du Lac. So what does that mean? That means that they were saying, go ahead and take the white pine to build your forts. That's what you wanted. But don't take our food. Don't take our, our food plants. That's not yours. That's for us to eat. That's important. I did a study of all American Indian treaties and looked at the results regarding food provisions and treaties, all 383 um, treaties or treaty supplements. There are 295 treaties that include 734 articles that have food in them. We care about food, just like our ancestors did. Among those are some broad categories, rights to hunt, fish, and gather, 88 instances. Uh, goods, provisions, and subsistence. So USDA commodities, commodity food programs, that's a treaty right, folks. That's 204 instances in treaties. Support for farming and milling. Support for farming and milling, 186 instances. So even the idea of uh, farms and mills, educators to show us how to do that, people to make uh, horseshoes, bullets for guns to go hunting, all that is treaty rights. For the Anishinaab Bay in those treaties specifically, we have 25 instances of those 70, remember 78 instances of treaties, we have 25 uh, provisions in there for hunting, fishing and gathering, 53 for good provisions and subsistence, 60 for support for farming or milling and 24 other. Remember that neck metal I was telling you about? That's the one, the Treaty of Greenville neck metal the one that became part of Wabiguk. We have education provisions in our treaties, 147 instances, 147 instances. The first one to include education was the treaty with the Oneida in 1794, the last one with the Nez Perce in 1868. The one with the most is the treaty with the Choctaw and Chickasaw of 1866. Man, that is a long treaty. By that point in time, uh, they were getting it. The native people were saying, you know what? We want everything spelled out. For the Anishinaabe, we have 29 uh, treaties that contain educational provisions. In those are annuities with both ambiguous and non-ambiguous amounts, one-time cash payments, education in general, teachers. How many of you guys are teachers in here? Treaty right, treaty right, treaty right, treaty right, treaty right. Land. Mount B, land, books in our native language. Well, I can tell you that never came true. Ask Judd Sojourn trying to teach Anishinaab Emwin over here. Have to make our own curriculum materials. You know, where's all the books in our language? That's treaty rights. What about tribal control? Tribal control. Yeah, tribes didn't even have self-governance or self-determination until very recently. 
And what about Indian preference? Did you guys know that any entity that's on or near a reservation and receives federal funding can invoke an Indian preference? Does Northern Michigan University exist on or near a reservation? It does. Do we get federal funding here? Dan, do you think we get federal funding? Oh, by golly, we do. Could we invoke Indian preference? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. What happens to our treaty rights in a changing world? This is from uh, Otke's uh, thesis about the Iron Range in the Upper Peninsula. The uh, one on the left shows the forest the way they looked back in 1840, and their one on the right is 1990. Obviously, the forests and the vegetation have changed. You can see that it was a lot more coniferous in a pre-colonial uh, world, and you look at what happened uh, where we're at recently, that's because of the clear-cut mining for the mines. As they were establishing the, uh, the mines up here in the Upper Peninsula, they needed wood to uh, support the mine tunnels, to make the tunnels. They also needed it to fire the furnaces. It was clear-cut. It changed the entire landscape. You guys seen, uh, was it Dan, did you have the picture of the, the clear-cut? Yeah, you had that earlier. That was what it looked like across the UP, guys. No area was, except maybe Huron Mountain and very few other places were spared. It was devastating. The world changed. Here's some pictures from the local Marquette area here. This is our treaty ceded territory. So we have big open pit mines, we have sulfide mines, we have dumps. We have urban sprawl, we have pollution, even on public lands. We have no time <laughs> and climate change. Our fishers, our fisheries, our fishers now have to go further out into the lakes to get the same fish that they used to get closer to shore because of climate change. That's a danger. Miigwech. I'll take a few questions if we have time. Thank you, Marty. Yep. Fantastic, yeah. Sue has uh, questions for Marty. Thank you. Is there a repository where all these treaties are stored? The us? actual treaties themselves? Yeah. Library of Congress has uh, copies. Uh, so there are multiple copies in Washington, D.C., and then some tribes have gone and gotten copies, just so they have them in their own vaults. There's also a digital archives at the University of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and that's the one that I use to do my analyses. You can see on the screen here, uh, this is all of the treaties that were signed by the United States and ratified by the U.S. Senate. I've, looked, I've read through every single one of these for food and education provisions. I'm, I'm currently looking uh, for uh, health provisions because of the whole uh, IHS and healthcare stuff that we're dealing with right now. Also looking for spiritual. But as you can see, there's a lot, right? And your eyes get kind of buggy when you read all through them. So it's easy to make mistakes, especially if you're reading the original treaties, which sometimes are written in cursive and you, know, you can't tell if that's an S or a, uh, F or, or a V or whatever. But yes, there are, there are uh, repositories. Yeah, the, the National Archive is their website. You can go on and read pretty much every one of the treaties. They even have photographs of the original treaty, a photo of the actual one uh, for many of them. A, a number of things that Marty's probably come across this is that there are treaties that you'll see listed, but they're not listed in the Na National Archives, and that's because they weren't approved by the U.S. government. Yeah. So there are a lot of treaties that the natives signed and said, okay, it's a treaty. They got to Washington, and they said no. Yep. So... Yeah, poor California Indians, uh, most of their treaties were never ratified. Thank you. What were the primary differences between the way the Canadian government and the U.S. government handled uh, the treaty issues along the borders? Well, actually, it was treaty issues, period. 
Yeah, one of the main differences is that Canada often waits to see what the U.S. does. So they, you know, try, uh, U.S. does something to the tribes, the Canada waits to see how everybody reacts, and then they follow, do whatever they're going to do. Now, uh, that being said, it's, it's quite different, right? Because in Canada, the primary population of Canada, most Canadians live below Sault Ste. Marie, right? So Sault Ste. Marie is right here. Most Canadians in Canada live below Sault Ste. Marie across Canada, Toronto, uh, Ottawa, What's that, Vancouver? Anyway, they got, most of the populations are southern Canadians, right? So most of the upper Canada is native. So it's a bit different. You know, you can have a Nunavut in Canada, and a native province. You know, we, we used to have Oklahoma here, but we all know what, you know, what happened to Oklahoma. You know, that was Indian country. Well, it's no longer Indian country. You know, so it's, uh, if you haven't seen uh, Killers of the Flower Moon yet, that's what that's about. You know, put, put the Indians on the bad land, not the bad lands, but the bad land, until they find oil. And, okay, now get out of the way. We've got to have the oil. But, yeah, that's uh, Canadian treaties are many ways like the United States treaties. Uh, but, again, they're, they're often waited to see what was going to happen. Well, I've got the microphone. Uh, Self-determination in Canada seems to t have a, a different meaning than in the United States. And uh, I, listening to a lot of CBC radio from the territories and Yukon, uh, I, I'm almost hopeful that at some point uh, democracy will, the, as practiced in the North, will trickle down this way. But you Yeah, know. you know, Canada gets a lot of credit undue. Uh, some of the things that we assume about Canada, we think it's just like this really cool environmental place to go where everybody's doing, treating everybody really nice, and they eat a lot of uh, maple syrup and, you know, Canadian bacon. It's not like that, guys. Yeah, if you're an indigenous person in Canada, uh, there's a difference. It's the Canadian Indian Act, uh, which was being constantly challenged. It's different. They treat Indians different in Canada than they do here. In here, you know, here in the United States, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uses an Indian blood quantum, right? In Canada, uh, it's really based on, uh, at least it used to be based on, a very sexist and racist uh, schema anyway. For instance, my mom, uh, who is a citizen of the Garden River First Nation, married an uh, uh, Irish-American person. That makes me a gibberish, by the way. And... and under that, when she married a non-Indian, her children were not going to be seen as eligible for being Indian status in Canada. But my uncle, who married a non-Indian woman and had children, uh, his wife and his children could be Indians in Canada. A non-Indian person could be an Indian where an Indian person could not be Indian. So, yeah, Canada's messed up. Don't, don't believe all the hype. They got some issues over there, too. Thanks. Uh, another question? Yes, um, people were asking where they could get the treaty information. Well, I have two books here on treaty rights and the Chippewa treaties from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I have a phone number if you, if it, I don't know if it's still valid. I can yeah, Glyphwick covers a lot of the tribes. Right. Uh, they don't, you have to be a, a member tribe of Glyphwick in order for them to uh, watch over your treaty rights and such, but... Some of our Michigan tribes are part of Glyphwick. Right. Others are part of CORA, Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority. So, so you can uh, call this number and get copies of these. One is Chippewa Treaties, and the other is Ojibwa Treaty Rights, and the number is 715-682-6619. Miigwech, thank you. Yeah, Glyphwick is a great or, uh, resource you know, they uh, provide a lot of education materials free, posters, books, movies. I mean, they got a lot of movies. Uh, they're doing some real good work right now protecting wild rice. You know, with, uh, they're putting, like, technology out in the rice beds, these nodes. So they're seeing how the water levels are going, how climate change is impacting wild rice and such. Uh, Kabogam versus Jackson Mining Company. Yeah. What's your take on the, the, the Michigan Supreme Court ultimately ruled in favor of Kabogam was in terms of the definition of marriage, yeah. which was 
critical to that case. Uh, would that have fallen under what the three categories of rights you described? That sounds like an aboriginal right or perhaps a, a rule of construction of a treaty right that the concept of marriage had to be interpreted as the, uh, the tribes would have understood it. What's your take on that? Yeah, the, uh, the Kabogams, of course, are a local family here in Marquette. And in some ways, I am distantly related to them. Uh, they are at least part of their family descendants of White Crane out of La Pointe. And they uh, were here back when the mining interest started coming through. So it depends on how you look at it. You know, you could say, gee, you know, should Kabogam and others of his era have been friendly to these mining interests or should they have fought them? Well, you know, it's, hard. it's easy, right? The armchair quarterback... We can sit here now and say they should have done this or should have done that. Back then, maybe there's a lot more pressure on them. So I'm, I'm careful. But yeah, uh, Kabagam had a name for Presque Isle that, you know, it's Ashkikumane Neyashi is our traditional name for Presque Isle. Uh, but he called it uh, Gawewin. Gawewin. Uh, and Gawewin means jealousy. So why would he have called his place Jealousy or Jealousy Point? I wonder this. Was it because maybe other native people here were jealous of his relationship with the white people and the favor that was being bestowed upon him because of his relationship with the white people? So, you know, that's a, that's a very intriguing question. I, I can't go bask, back and ask him, you know, hey, uh, were you, you know, were you... Were you doing what you should have been doing as a good Anishinaabe, or were you selling out? You know, but it's it's very possible it could go either way. That's probably a very unpopular thing to say about Kabagam, because of course he still has family here nowadays, and so much of what we think about Kabagam, we we prop him up, right? Uh, but we have to, like I was saying earlier about Suzette Lafleche, we have to ask these hard questions about these icons of Native identity in these areas, and what they truly represent. Was he representing Anishinaabe thought and protection of our, our rights? Or was he trying to figure out the best way to live in a time for himself and his family? And other people were like, what are you doing? I think it's both ways. And you can see uh, Tyler Titchler has the new book out. Um, much good in there. I, I had an opportunity to read through it. And there's a lot of good information. It's also maybe taking some creative freedom on, on Tyler's part, you know, on some of the places I thought, but for the most part, I think there's some good information there about that relationship. I think I might be going over, Dan, so we've got to keep an eye on the time. So we have four minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, do you think that um, as time goes on, do you think that the uh, Native American culture is being uh, assimilated to a greater extent in our wider American culture? Yeah, so assimilation, right? Assimilation happens in a society naturally, you know, right? So it depends on the type of a society. Now, if you have a circular society, I'm going to get my sociology hat on here, a circular society where uh, different cultural groups come together and they mean to come together voluntarily, Assimilation happens in a good way, right? Uh, so, you know, Pink Floyd is brought to the United States and we love us some Pink Floyd or Beatles, right? That's, the, that's how assimilation happens in a good way. But we're in a, this kind of society, hierarchical, where European-American forces, colon, colon, colonizing forces, put every other cultural group below and at the very bottom was native people with the dispossession of land and resources. So that kind of assimilation was forced, and it has very negative consequences. That dispossession, that depression, that anxiety that you walk around with every day as a colonized person. It never goes away until we actually get rid of colonization. So if we're going to heal from the original act of oppression, that colonization, then both the colonizing class and the colonized class have to deal with that together and figure out how do we right that first wrong, that original sin. If we can do that, I think we can have a bright future. We can have an amalgamation of ideas from multiple cultures. 
If we don't deal with that, it goes on like this. I don't see how we can ever overcome that if we just bury our heads in the sand. Long, long answer to your question, sorry. Okay, we got a couple minutes left, so. What did you think of the beaver tail soup? Oh my gosh. Okay, so first of all, the taste was excellent. The texture was weird. It was weird. Yeah, so that, that first uh, piece of beaver tail I had in my tongue, chewed on it, it was a little bit strange. I had to sit there and like, okay, you know, overcome the texture thing. This is really important. This is special, you know. I didn't want to gag in front of nobody, but it was a little weird. Yeah, first time I'd ever, uh, you know, chomped down on a piece of beaver tail. Like a mushroom, kind of? Kind of like that, yeah. Like maybe an oyster mushroom texture. Yeah. Like Mike. Michael, yeah, we just got a minute, so. Okay. If we only have a minute, never mind. No, just kidding. I have a I was reading late at night, and I can't recall the details, but there's a treaty <coughs> interpretation in progress, apparently, <coughs> that might give the Kiwana Bay Indian community uh, the land that the city of Lance and Berga now own. Could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so this happens from time to time, these contested areas, right, where the reservation land has fraudulently been annexed by the state of Michigan or the local municipalities. It was just like sprawl, right? They just, it happened over the course of 100 plus years where the, they just thought that they could do that. And there was very little that anyone was doing to stop it. Uh, this has happened up there in Lance. It's happened down by the Little, uh, little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa. That's a pretty famous case that happened a few years back. And in that case, the, uh, the folks who were living in the area that the tribe wanted back freaked out. Uh, you know, down there, what was talked about by the Holy Childhood Boarding School. That's a very expensive place to live. That land around there is so, oh, so expensive. And there were non-native people there with businesses and cottages, summer homes, and they all freaked out. They were like, Oh my gosh, you, you know, the Indians are going to kick us out. They're going to take all of our stuff. And so they interviewed the tribal chairperson, and the tribal chairperson said, you know, I don't know where they're getting these ideas, but all we want is to reestablish the reservation boundary so that we can invoke the Indian Child Welfare Act appropriately to protect the future of our children. So jurisdictionally, we just want our rights. We ain't kicking no one out. Uh, everyone gets to keep their stuff, but guess what, folks? You're going you're gonna to live under tribal law. Why are you scared of that? You know what people said? Well, look what we did to them. Aren't they going to do the same to us? <laughs> okay, miigwech. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Fantastic. <laughs> Great job. All right, we're going to get Sebastian up here and uh, move on to the next presentation. seats. Um, I, I especially want to introduce this gentleman because he traveled, if not the furthest distance, the longest amount of time to be here tonight. 
Uh, Sebastian Millet came from Carleton College in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, I invited him specifically because of a book he wrote uh, in conjunction with a couple of gentlemen about the, his, the culture of the Voyagers and the Métis. Uh, but he spent 12 hours in planes and airports yesterday to be here today. So we want to thank him for uh, his dedication and patience to getting here. Yeah. I just say try arranging flights from Ottawa to Marquette and then back in two days. It's crazy. They, some of the routes were just insane. Uh, we were fortunate to get one that he only had to fly to Newark and then uh, then Chicago, and then Detroit, yeah. So he and he he has to go to Montreal to get home. So uh, he has a trip back tomorrow. So would you please welcome from uh, Ottawa, uh, Dr. Sebastian Millet. Okay, hello, uh, thank you for that introduction. So it's the end of the day or almost, so hopefully uh, I'm gonna have a, a good conversation with you. Uh, I'm gonna try to do that a bit formally and informally to try to capture a sense of conversation among ourselves. Um, it's always special for me to present on these topics, obviously, because this is so much more than just, I would like to think, academic material or uh, knowledge per se, it's, it's a way of being for um, the so-called, back in the day, the French Indian people or the Samele, the Métis, the descendant of the half-breeds, and so on. So for us, the fewer trades, for us, the knowledge that you've been given since this morning, it's part of our living history. And these relationships are still valued for us in terms of uh, who we are and how we walk the day and the night. So basically what happened is that um, it's, it's always nerve wracking to give these conversations. And my, my um, first of all, uh, I'm in French, I'm a French brain, French speaker, so to talk to you in English sometimes can be challenging. And if something, if something I'm saying it's not correct or well understood, please tell me. I've learned English language when I, when I was doing my PhD at the University of Victoria late in my life, so um, meeting John Burroughs, uh, among, among other uh, great folks. So anyways, this is just to say that it's a challenging subject, and I will just like to cue in uh, one thing to uh, Martin, if you're uh, interested into this court case, Boucher 2021, I don't know if you heard of it, in New Brunswick, uh, it's a recent case for non uh, non-status Indians that won uh, Section 35 uh, rights for the first time. Not a lot of people are talking about it, and especially, well, including First Nations are not talking about it due to politics and the fact that uh, Section 35 rights, which are constitutional rights in Canada, uh, are recognized to uh, Indigenous people outside status and outside treaty rights. Uh, it's a first, and that leads to a lot of questions when it comes to identity, when it comes to right, when it comes to sovereignty and self-determination. And so uh, I'm, I'm, if we can talk about it further or after, please uh, let me know. But that, that's a very interesting court case uh, for us. So anyways, I have those slides presented to you. I have some material that looks in the past in terms of your trade, in terms of uh, ethnology, in terms of culture. And I've also give like a present or future orientated um, aspect to this presentation so that we can look on the values of the past for us in the present in terms of identity markers and how it plays out. So about me, well, I want to thank the uh, Beaumier UP Inst Heritage Center for inviting me and the University of Northern Michigan, obviously, for hosting us. Uh, it's also important to understand that we are on uh, the land as guests of the Kichi Nanibini Zibing, if I pronounce that right, uh, which is the uh, the uh, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe uh, Confederacy, uh, and I apologize again for my language barrier sometimes playing out. Um, so it's important for us to understand that we're a guest here, and it's, it is especially important for us, the French Canadian Miti people, to recognize these connections and relationship as we go along. 
I'm an associate professor of law and legal studies at Carleton University. My field of interest is mainly uh, Métis studies, indigeneity, non-status indigenous populations in relationship to law. That's essentially what I dwell into. I work with non-recognized indigenous community up north that are chasing their rights. When it comes to that uh, dream about Canada, for example, uh, there is a huge problem when it comes including to, uh, with treaty rights. Uh, treaty rights are constitutionally protected in Canada per Section 35, but which also means that it comes with the possibility of infringements, uh, constitutional infringements, which means that they are placed under uh, common law uh, order, which means that if for some reason, including economical interest of all Canadians, treaty rights could be uh, infringed. So uh, the self-determination of Indigenous people in Canada, even under treaty, uh, face serious challenges and many questions are still open to that regard. That's just a comment uh, prior to the, uh, the conversations that we had on Canada and so on, which I'm here to answer more questions if you have to. I have French Canadian Métis heritage and native ancestry myself in the family from both my mother, Pierre, the, the, the line is Pierre Chabot and Simforos Marotouekwe, and my father's line is, goes back to Michel Bizayon and Marie Akemasakoy. So um, these uh, lines and family ancestral relations connect us to the uh, Illinois First Nations in the Kaskaskia uh, surroundings. So it's always special for me to come down here in terms of remembrance and in terms of, uh, of uh, side scenes and the relationship. I mean, um, it's, it's bizarre for me to cross the American line, so to speak, from Canada, because these fields always like somehow artificial lines that have been designed over time. And um, I'm part of a family that were among the first settlers of Detroit, for example, and um, other families that were explorers back in the day. The Mallet families are very old families and we have different branch across the continent and different sets of relationship with indigenous people. And so basically it's always weird to go across continent and frontiers and, and to just to experience this as some way we feel home as Miti people in so many different locations. We feel home as welcomed guests, obviously, always in relationship with First Nations and the uh, Inuit as well. So that this relationship of sharing the lands, of, uh, of being together relationally is very still important. So my research include uh, various books that we have written on the subject. Here is the four books that we did so far in terms of research, Songs Upon the River, which kind of address a continental pictures about Miti culture. Uh, and we've tried to tease out the uh, markers of that common cultures and came up with a, a rhizomatic approach to Miti cultures. Um, second in order is Les Bois Brûlés de l'Outaouais, which is a more specific study that we did in terms of the Outaouais region, uh, still unceded treaty territories for the Anishinaabe people. And there is a Miti community there that tries to have Section 35 rights recognized for their community. They're still unrecognized. And so I was hired as an expert to try to make expertise for the courts in this kind of weird battles to get their right recognized. I can speak about this further or um, later on if you wish. That's the English version, Bois Brûlé, next to it uh, at UBC Press, if you want to read it in English, because we thought that this was important to get this message across in both language. And finally, Eastern Miti, a quite a contentious subject in Canada. Uh, I won't hide it from you. Uh, Eastern Miti in Canada are not currently recognized. Uh, in Canada, the Western Métis are recognized from the prairies, but the Eastern Métis are not recognized uh, as formally. They are recognized in the Royal Commissions on Aboriginal People going back to the 80s um, as making claims and as existing, and the elders told their story as well as knowledge provider. But unfortunately, due to politics, in which I'm going to get at this hand of uh, the end of the conversation and the conference, due to politics, including colonial politics and, and lateral violence, uh, the Eastern Miti are still facing an abrupt road ahead in terms of their uh, recognitions, including by other Miti people across Canada and First Nations with whom they enter into conflicts over uh, rights, over fear of treaties, over uh, things like that. 
So uh, just to make um, an anecdote salient, the third book, The Lady on the Cover, uh, we've chose that picture with a very specific message in mind. Her name is Mary Keat on that picture. And Mary Keat, her mother is Marie Cadot. So I don't know if you, if you know that name, but that's a quite significant name for Métis Circle as well as, as Anishinaabe uh, nation with whom we share many relationships. So her mother is uh, Marie Cadot and her father was chief factor uh, of, in Montreal, the fur trade. And Marie Cadot is married to Thomas Taylor, Thomas Taylor, which was Red River Métis, going back to the region of Winnipeg in Canada. So that lady and her husband, Thomas Taylor, were existing and living also in the Outaouais region, in the place we did our work. And they were working at Lac des Sables over there in the fuel trade industries. So that helps to show that the connections, even in Canada, goes to Red River, to the eastern parts of Canada, per kinship relationship, which are really, truly important to us. And also the same cadet family that you will find, for example, in uh, the tra Le Traité de Paris du, de Prairie du um, Chien in 1825, that treaty also includes the cadet family in the United States in this region, as well as uh, the 1835 half-breed census made across this region also include members of the cadet family who are related to that lady. So that shows that the history of Michigan, the history of the Outaouais, the history of Red River are all connected per kinship relationship as well as bloodlines. We still value and we still know. And for us, that is the essence of our responsibility and our people as we go forward. And if we're talking about living values from the past connecting to the present, this is really important for us in terms of resilience. The talk we had before mine was talking about treaty, for example, and the responsibility of being a treaty people. Canadians are treaty people. Americans are treaty people in that regard. We owe responsibility to these treaty relationships, one can suggest. I suggest that strongly. So basically, if there are treaties, and if you want to push them, into real law, real things that can change our lives for the better in terms of, real, of our relationship, we have to take this in consideration with indigenous resilience and the possibility to bring back indigenous populations, communities, and nations to the rise so that an increasing number of people may express those rights, express those values as they get strength, right? But one of the policy has been in Canada as well as in the United States to, yes, sure, ratify treaty in order to secure the land, in order to get the land and resources. But in the same time that treaty policy was made, another policy was for the extermination of indigenous people when it comes to their identity, their numbers, their recognitions of themselves, and so on, right? So the best antidote to that is to rise those treaty rights, for sure, but in the same time to work on resilience and what it means to be an indigenous person today in terms of culture, in terms of knowledge from the past and the present connections. So looking in the past, we know that the case expedition of 1820 hired Canadians as well as voyageurs in which we suspect Miti people uh, are among them but we don't have the proper names and the way in which to search that. But it's the same kind of formula that use indigenous people as well as Canadians, as well as guides, you know, that belongs to various indigenous nations to go forward into the land. Now, if we take another expedition built on the same kind of model to explore the United States, we have obviously the Lewis and Clark expedition, which is another expedition that was modeled along similar lines when it comes to that. And that uh, expedition has been well researched when it comes to the member of that expedition that were named, for example, right? This documentation here, the meaty man from the Lewis and Clark expedition comes from Laurie Barkwell, an historian at the Louis Riel Institute in Canada, uh, with whom I had the great pleasure to have pipe ceremonies by the Red River when I went to visit him in Winnipeg 
Okay, so that um, historian did an incredible work in trying to map the Métis people that were involved in Canadian as well as American history, and you can find most of its work online, free. So we think about Char Toussaint Charbonneau, for example, right, among the expedition of Lewis and Clark, that says. You know, if you're a trader coming from Montreal, part Iroquois, and there's few details here that I just want to bring to your attention so that we can connect the dot later. Pierre Cruzet, for example, of Omaha Indian heritage, descendant of the settlers of St. Louis, right, in the United States, a little bit further down south here, right? You have Pierre Dorion Sr., very important members of that expedition, right? Fluent in various different language, um, again, from marriage alliances, voyageur background, okay, very, put, very important family and instrumental to the success of that expedition. You have Georges Drouillard, who is, by the way, connected to Michigan. He's fr it, he is from this region, uh, so there's a connection even to Michigan within that expedition. He was a very good hunter and a very good protector along the way, and, you know, the different fights and different occurrence that did happen, sometimes involving indigenous people, but also grizzly bears, for example, attacks that were reported or other perils along the, along the line of that difficult expedition. There's just René Gessiome, French interpreter again, bringing further details to it. François Labiche, Étienne Malbeuf, that was also part of that expedition. Peter Pinot, you can recognize all those French names as well as Pierre Roy, also described as an half-breed from the Menden village this time, and the children born in this expedition of Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. They carried a baby uh, with them, uh, parts of that expedition, and so that brought also peace, because bringing a children, an indigenous uh, woman sometimes with them, was not a sign of being a war party. So that provided success for their expedition as they were getting into the land and meeting other indigenous people. So that came uh, interestingly in that research. So all of these examples that we can you know, read further and dwell into brings a unique culture in terms of who are the Métis people, right? I would like to suggest to you that this is a unique cumulative, diasporic, and rhizomatic identity three concepts that I'm trying to develop here in terms of what it comes to Miti culture. Because if I'm asking you, what is a Miti person? What is a Miti culture? What would be your main guess? Anyone? What is a Miti person? Or what is an half-breed? How would you formulate your answer to that question? Yes. That's right. You'll probably raise the point of intermarriages or being mixed, of being like, you know, born out of two people. And that's usually the case, but there is way more I would like to suggest to you than this. Yes. Fiddle music. Fiddle music, that's correct. Fiddle music. There's also, there, there's all kinds of signs and, and symbols that are part of that culture intertwined with various First Nations, as we will see, and we'll get to the very definition of Louis Riel, for example. Have you heard of him, Louis Riel? Miti uh, leaders that led to act of resistance in Canada, famously or infamously an American citizen, by the way, that was hanged by the British up north, which brings a lot of, you know, still contentions to these days. So what I want to bring in terms of markers from these expedition, including the, the case expedition of 1820, are a few points here. So we are talking about Miti people described through inter-ethnic union various First Nations, or Inuit, and Euro-Canadians of usually Scottish, Irish, or French descent, right? You'll see in the historical descriptions, French language and Christianity has a significant linguistic, linguistic and cultural markers. Okay, so you'll see that due to their parentage, having a father Canadian or Scottish, you'll see the children, the Métis children are often Christian, okay, due to their father, but also bearing spiritual qualities and traditions from their mother. So therefore, they're bringing together Christianity and indigenous spiritualities together in strange synthetic forms at time. 
French language will become predominant, but also the possibility of First Na Nation languages held together. But French becomes important in the fur trade as lingua franca, as a language that gets across and allows all voyageurs, as well as Kumi and different staff to work together, essentially. But at times, when people do not know French, and let's say a French a French man meets an English person, they will sometimes speak Anishinaabemowin among themselves if both know that language. So indigenous language are also part of that culture, but plural. You'll see polygamic unions, a different set when it comes to marriage. Maybe the voyageur or the people living among them as freemen will have multiple wives according to indigenous traditions. They are seen as having shifting loyalties from the standpoint of, of uh, colonial authorities. Métis, you're not sure of them. Are they Canadians? Are they Americans? Are they faithful to the British, to the Americans, or to their First Nations relations? What's happening with them? They are a source of worrying into these times of colliding empires. Intimate knowledge of the land, you'll see that through their descriptions, right? Wherever these expeditions went, they've met Canadians on the land. Canadians in the United States, Canadiens, as we used to call them, with First Nations embedded, living among them with cultural practices, right? So basically, the land was known by Canadians, explorer and voyageur, as well as free men living among the First Nations, deep into what they called Indian land. You'll see them acting as cultural brokers, interpreters, diplomacy, knower of both worlds, bridge maker through culture. You'll see specific skill, trading, hunting, surviving, scouting, warfare, navigation among their specific sets of skill, not only voyageur, but also those other um, ways of life that allow someone to survive, not get lost and resist to the, uh, the dangers that may be in the land. If you don't know where to go in the bush, these forests will kill you. You have no way of like knowing where's the river, how to eat, where to go, what plant to know. You'll die in, in matters of days. And you, I, I don't wish it on, on nobody, but these lands are unforgivable if you don't know them. Hence the value of First Nations to survive, to thrive, to develop. Hence the values also of Miti people that were culture, uh, cultural bridge among uh, those uh, elements of culture. You'll see also in historical descriptions distinctive ethnonym being used. For example, uh, Miti, Bois Brule, Afbraid. You'll see those different descriptors, which is important in the sense that we don't have as a people, as a culture, a single name. It's, and that leads to horrible debate these days. Some people will contest, even today, my identity as a Métis person. In Canada, for example, the fact, despite the fact that I descend from French, Indian, voyageur family, and we will see the common descriptors of that, historically speaking, in Canada now there's big powerful lobbies that says you don't have the right to call yourself a Métis except if you are from these people and these region. Right? So even today, in terms of names, in terms of its polysemic nature, we have difficulties when it comes to name. We have also difficulties when it comes to land. We have difficulties in terms of allegiances, because basically we're a people made of relationships, plural with different nations. We were cultural brokers of the early days, caught into a colonial system that sometimes we took advantage of and sometimes we suffered from. We have these dual nature and full contradictions even within ourselves and even within our blood. We are part of colonial history and we were also affected and almost wiped out by colonial history, which brings a very unique touch to our culture and our survival. But we are also a multicultural, multinational people and we like to think among our circles that our very existence is a treaty in and of itself, which makes the living conditions as a people, we are the people. We go across the American lines, across the Canadian lines, across so many First Nation lines so that we get together in bridging these culture. 
Now, in, already in 1687, we see Mr. de la Salle in the area of Saint, uh, Fort St. Louis in the United States complaining about these people that were Métis and the Canadians that were marrying indigenous women as being too freely in their own ways, as claiming that they were the ownership of their lands counter to the French colonial authorities. They were perceived as dangerous people that were giving more loyalty to their First Nations relationship as they should give to their king, the French king in that occurrence, or the colonial authorities. So very early on in the United States, the Métis were perceived as a dangerous shifting populations due to their proximity with First Nations interest and kinship families. We also find expressions of Métis solidarity right before the Clark expedition in the Illinois. They were like center villages made of so-called Métis people, born out of indigenous and French uh, people coming together, creating these settlements. And we find in some of these book description in the Illinois, in the area where my own ancestors are from, villages of Métis that existed and show solidarity when they were fighting the British, for example. The same village in this uh, part, in this extrait of a book, uh, later on, if you look at Our Debt to the Red Men by Oakton, was completely destroyed by American milita uh, militia in 1820s, uh, caught in the colonial war between the British and the Americans, Often the Métis villages held no chance when it came to their existence and loyalty and were just massacred. And the remnant people that were saved from this village were saved, in fact, by First Nations from the historical accounts that made a special expedition to rescue the women and the children that survived this ordeal. Early indication of political consciousness among the half-breed here you have from Buffalo, again in the United States, a group of half-breed coming from the fur trade that wants to gather as much half-breed and meaty people, people of so-called Indian blood, to get together to create a republic for all of those with Indian blood. In 1836, this is way prior to Riel. This is way prior to the West history. That shows that the half-breed and the so-called Métis had a consciousness of themselves as a people, as a cause. It was, just not, it was not just a matter of like being breed of two people, of having like just inter marital relationship or being viewed as different. It was really about a consciousness that was emerging of a specific status and people that stand together. Right, so that is an example that I wanted to offer. Another uh, perhaps extract that you already know from Cole in 1855 about the Métis and the Canadien belonging to the land is my home is everywhere, right? In this report from early ethnographer Cole who interviews Métis and Canadian voyageur back in the days, he asks, où restez-vous? Which in French means, where do you live? I ask once a voyageur. And underline here, you can say, où je reste, je ne peux pas te le dire. I cannot tell you where I live. I am a voyageur. I am a chico. Monsieur, je reste partout. I live everywhere. My grandfather was a voyageur. He is dead traveling. And his father was a voyageur. He was also dead traveling. I will die traveling, and another chico will take my place. Such is our life. So you can say that for the Miti experience, being of various land, decentered when it comes to land, truly existing among relationship rather than ownership of the land was part of the cultural trait that infused Miti culture and our relationship with the land, right? So all of these examples are made to show that there's a very specific milieu of socialization for the Miti culture, shaped, yes, by intercultural encounters and indigenous kinship, but also mobility due to trade, independence, wanting to be free, wanting to be you know, tax-free, especially from colonial authorities, uh, specific cultures coming together, French cultural brokers, as I mentioned, shaped by regional conflicts, including among fur trade companies and contraband, for example, among the voyageurs, Métis people, 
a quest for freedom, often in tension with colonial authorities, an awareness of their specific identities, and also their Indianness or their indigeneity, if you will, is always at the fringes for the Métis people. Okay, so um, time is flying by and I just wanna make some strong points along the way. The Miti people, at least in Canada and parts of the United States, was carved by specific experience. And that specific experience is a rejection of their indigeneity. And that rejection of their indigeneity is along the line of patrilineal descent model, by which Indianness in Canada was attributed according to who is your father. So in the times of annuities in Canada, for example, colonial Canadian authorities had big problems when it comes to money. They had treaties, they had responsibilities to indigenous people, but some indigenous people were living across the medicine line or the borders between Canada and the United States. So they come in and off, they're inviting their cousin and stuff like that, and Canadian authorities, they were pulling their hair. Who should we pay? Who should we consider so-called Indians? If we are restricting increasingly their right, how to implement these restrictions or benefit? How to do it when there are so many French Indian men mingling among them? How would we know? And when we went to the archives and we dig into the Indian Affairs Department letters that they were exchanging themselves, we found that basically the Indian Affairs Department is answering back to their Indian agents, look at who's the fodder. If the father is reputed as white or a Canadian, then their family is white, despite the fact that they could have an indigenous mother's or bloodline through their mom. But if their bloodline comes from their father's side, they can get on the Indian band list or the annuity list and so on. So basically, it's in, it's in part due to a patrilineal descent model that a huge chunk of indigenous people were pushed away as indigenous people. But that common experience is, li is livid. It's, it's there for the Métis people to recognize. So all of us that identified as Métis people in Canada or French Canadian Métis or by different names, all our indigenous so-called ancestral relationships come from women, indigenous women. And that is the main differences due to colonialisms that we have been created that way. Now, Canada now is backtracking that kind of discrimination against indigenous women due to different court cases and the way in which non-status indigenous women fought so hard in Canada to get their right recognized. Now, the government of Canada is giving back Indian status to a lot of non-status and a lot of Miti people that wish their identity recognized. But in doing that, they're not changing their assimilation policy, which means what? Which means that if you are a Miti recognized by Section 35 rights in Canada, your rights in terms of indigenous rights will be perpetual for all eternity because you're outside of the Indian Act. But the Indian Act has clause in it that if you marry out an Indian person twice, you know, if you have two subsequent marriage outside of the Indian status, your children will lose their Indian status. So it's still a policy of assimilation and per demographics alone, in less than a hundred years, it is predicted that people with status are endangered to lose it all. So it pays off the, the Canadian authority basically, to give back status to people in which they can assimilate back in time per the colonial policy that are still in force. Do you understand that kind of argument? So for the, the major threat for Canada right now when it comes to colonialisms is the existence of Métis people that will have rights that are recognized in their constitution, infringement possible, but still rights that will stand for all eternity, and the same thing with non-status hence my indication for the Boucher case, for example, right? But there's another problem with this, is that when they are giving certain constitutional protections and privileges to segment of the Métis population in Canada, they're telling the old strategy, or oh, you're special. But these guys that only have like remnant of ancient blood so far back that wish to play native, these guys are there to steal your rights. And so there's a lot of 
divide and conquer policies in Canada that puts Métis people of the West against Métis people of the East, against the North, against the South, and First Nations dealing with their treaties, for example, the Anishinaabe people dealing up North still with the treaties in Ontario and parts of Quebec, are really nervous about that because they say, we've worked so hard to get these treaties, and now these newcomers are coming with old bloodlines, and they claim to be us, and the government is giving them a voice, and so you see the mess we're in in terms of Canada, in terms of that politics? So who's indigenous now is a high source of anxiety, and so that's why you see in the news these kinds of you know quests for pretendians or people that would be shifty in that regard. And even myself, I have been at the center of this controversy, for example, because I'm working so close to non-status indigenous population that are extremely vulnerable to these types of criticism. So here, a uh, few more minutes for your patience, but here, this is Louis Riel's assessment of who is a Métis person. The Métis has, have as paternal ancestor, former employee of the Hudson Bay and the Northwestern Company, and as maternal ancestor, Indian woman belonging to various tribes. The French word Métis is derived from the Latin participle mixtus, which means mix it. And then Louis Riel in 1885, in, it, in its literature, uh, suggests that it represents the ID well. So you see here the patrilineal coding even of Métis identity, right? Father from French and, and Scottish descent mainly, and indigenous women from different tribes, different nations, which brings a diversity in our people. When a bunch of Métis people get together, like those expedition of Lewis Case or these other, you'll see Métis people with different language, different possibility, different nation, the Homaha, you know, uh, the Anishinaabe will be recognized, the Mohawk will be in there. So when we get together, basically, we are like kind of a, a living wampum of so many different nations coming together, not only by blood, but culture as well, as well as language. That was back in the day, and this is still true in terms of our resilience today, which makes us kind of a, you know, to give an image, the first internet back in the day, right? Or the way in which to communicate among so many different tribes and so many different political interests. And that's no uh, secret that this is why the Métis are so successful in terms of being cultural brokers or involved into diplomacy, okay? Another, this is Louis Riel's picture here, and I just want to bring this to your attention. Riel is describing in, uh, in those days, in 1877, what would be the Métis nation is trying to create out of this culture which already exists. This consciousness that forms at the frontier in so many different directions, it's already there. But he says, until now, this is my translation from the letter he wrote to his cousin, his cousin Paul Pru. Until now, it, the name Métis, has served to designate the race emerging of the mixed blood of European and the savages. But it is also proper to identify a race of man who would be recruited by the mixing of all bloods between them and white, and while, sorry, shaped by the French-Canadian mold, would keep the remembrance of its origin by calling itself Métis. And then subsequently in the letter he says, the name Métis would be agreeable to all because it is not exclusive and have the advantage of mentioning in suitable ways the contingent by which each nation would contribute to generate a new people. So you can see that the willingness of bringing a diversity of people in one people and accepting the contingent element of all this is truly revolutionary for the days. And it still is a problem today. That's the original a letter here of, uh, of Louis Riel, uh, written down in 1885. So it is still a problem today. Here is Louis Riel saying to Gabriel Dumont, one of his uh, main general into the act of resistance, that he should be a le meaty leader for the western parts of the country while he would be the Métis of all, the leader of all Métis across North America, or at least the British possessions of North America in that extract. He also recognized the existence of Métis people in Eastern Canada is in correspondence in 1885 with similar rights than those Métis in Manitoba. He wrote that himself. And yet today, in closing, because I'm still, I only have three minutes, but we can talk during the period of questions, I'm sure. But 
still today, there is huge battle in not recognizing the existence, like I said, in the eastern parts of Canada. But why is that? What is the policy if even Louis Riel himself did recognize the existence of Miti people all across continent, including in the United States? Now see here, down south in the United States, south for us, from Canada. So um, Miti are not recognized. Miti are not recognized as, as an indigenous people at all. Sometimes they will be recognized by indigenous nations here in the United States as part of their nation or certain branch of families that were Métis and now including in First Nations identity, and that's fine. But up in Canada, they make a distinguished, very unique form of identity recognized now in Section 35 of our Constitution. Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution recognized Indians, Métis, and Inuit as indigenous peoples of Canada with specific rights. But now the battle is up for identities. Who are the Métis? Who could be Inuit? Who can be Indian is still really much debated in terms of colonial politics, privilege, access to recognitions, and more. So I would be, I've prepared way too many slides. I was too optimistic, but I would be happy to answer any questions you may have for the remaining 15 seconds, and I thank you for your patience and your time today. All right, fantastic. So. Is there any Métis people who were white passing enough that would just say they were white and French and then that lost their history of being mixed? Absolutely. Um, so in all the families that I've traveled to in Canada, went into the West, North, South, even Métis families are often divided amongst themselves. So there's part of the family that will reject that heritage and say, no, 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 we're, we're just white, it, it just happened. And other people that are really kind of, it's at the forefront of their identities. If you go back in history, the Miti people were also playing on the line, like I said. So for, for sometimes, like uh, Johnny Grant, for example, who had ranches and was a famous Miti person, he wrote an autobiography of himself, you know? And at one point he says, I'm a Canadian. In the other part of his biography, he says, I'm Métis. And in the other part of his biography, he says, I'm Indian, right? So, so basically those identity that you guys hold as separate, here's the white, here's the Indian, they never should be come together. These should be segregated. The Métis people is bringing them together. But with all the contradictions that it takes, so even among ourselves, we're like, so sometimes back in the days, Miti were like, hey, I can claim to be an Indian and jump into that treaty, for example. So I'm going to take treaty rights. Oh, I'm tired of those treaty rights because now it's, it's pinching on me per certain restrictions due to the Indianness. Hey, 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 I'm white and I'm going to take 160 of these acres of land. And so the authorities were like, are you white or are you Indian? You have to make your ways. No, well, I'm Miti. And people, the colonial authorities in Canada said, we don't deal with Miti, like they say in the Treaty of 1850, for example, with, uh, with your people. They said, like, look, either you put yourself under the tutorship of these Indian chief, or either you accept to be white, and we will kill off your Indian blood uh, rights by giving you 160 acres of land. And this is what they did in Manitoba. They gave the script to extinguish the claim of Indian in indigeneity to these people. So it was by blood at first that people had a special rights to the land by connecting to different nations, right? So it is a very tricky and complex history, but yet we are born out of these contradictions. The Métis people are bearing that history, these connections and these responsibility. And we, we have to have the courage to say, yes, we have contradictions, but we're still a people with relationship, with, with responsibility, and a significant part of that history, including American history and Canadian history. I did want to uh, mention a documentary you should watch. Uh, the film star named uh, Roy Dupuis did one on the relationship between Quebecois and also Native Americans called L'Emprunt. Yeah. It? Yeah, it's a beautiful film, really looking at how Quebecois culture tried to distance itself from its Native American roots, when in fact much of Quebecois culture is deeply influenced by their Native American uh, connections. So. Uh, Yes. I think you've done a great job of trying to answer what my question is, but let's make sure I have the right question. <laughs> is it about money? 
or is it about culture? Well, it's, it's hard to say. It depends on the people and the individuals almost, right? Some people will say, well, what, what can I get from this? Uh, when I'll get free education, that first question comes. And for other people, it's about rec recognizing themselves. It's about becoming whole again, right? Resilience, indigenous resilience has many aspects. But sometimes I'm challenged by that question and say, look, these people just want to have money. They just want to, you know, ride uh, that, that wave that indigenous people did hope in, and then they play the so-called Indians. And what I suggest to those people is that we don't know who's going to be the next Tecumse or the next great leader. If some people have ancestral connections, for me, I respect their ancestral connections and their possibility of resilience. If they come with bad ideas about this, I cannot control that. And maybe their children who are brought into the culture will become the next leader that we need for different sets of situation, which I don't know the future. So therefore, if individual have bad intent when it comes to indigenous culture, I think that the most important valuable lessons is the belief in culture and the strong culture will, will protect future individuals, hopefully, against misleading ways by bringing them back into their culture. But can we protect indigenous culture from all possible aspects of fraud or money or bad intent? That would be really hard. But can we push indigenous culture to resilience and to accept individuals that have been lost to them? I think that's a very valuable enterprise, in my way. Just a follow up. Um, <clears throat> most people in power like to keep those not in power divided and fighting among themselves. Is that at play? In Canada, very much so it is at play. And what's even more brutal about it is that, unfortunately, um, First Nations could be involved into this. Uh, you know, there's huge tension with non-status and Métis people in First Nations in Canada right now in certain part of the country. And as example of this, I was... I am working on a book for the Eastern Métis populations in Acadia and other parts of town. And the Mi'kmaq First Nation, which I have huge respect for when it comes to their history, their culture, the thoughts that they have, you know, uh, many of their chiefs came out. And we didn't even publish our result yet that they've asked the government of Canada to stop any founding of our research because they didn't want this research to come out on the, uh, the Acadian half-breeds. Uh, due to the fact that they're still negotiating treaties. So sometimes we find ourselves fighting among our own and our own relations because we want to get what? We want to get colonial recognition, certain pockets of money and certain rights. And we forget that perhaps there's other way to get across these conflicts. Old diplomatic ways that were already there at the time of First Nations dealing with Miti people. And we have to keep in mind that the First Nations people were there first and their intrinsic right negotiating with a Métis or a Canadian or an American won't change. So the Métis people have to adjust to that reality. And just like indigenous people are negotiating among, among themselves, it is possible to make a space and make a place for Métis people to exist, yet with the understanding that this comes with responsibility when it comes to their relationship as well as other indigenous people that may exist uh, uh, next to them, that's for sure. Much is, or I've read much of the R Riel Rebellion. Um, was that a rebellion of self-determination, or what other factors weighed into it in terms of it spilling across the border into the uh, U.S.? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, we call it most likely to resistance. Uh, some people are particular about the word rebellion versus resistance, but. Uh, the two at play were a bit different, right? So, uh, the, but it was definitely about securing land and the securing the possibility of existence in the aftermath of uh, the American and English war with more loyalists coming up north and taking up lands as well as new sets of newcomers and immigrants pushing the Métis people to having no rights recognized due to the Royal Proclamation. The Royal Proclamation in 1763 said that all of these Indian lands, so to speak, were now protected by the king and you had no rights on it. 
except if the king would allow you to live there or get you know, proper property and things like that. And for the Miti people that were existing there 100 years prior, they found themselves with no rights at all and no indigeneity recognized to them almost, basically due to patrilineal lines like I've explained it earlier. So they were in a no man's land trying to find rights for themselves and identities and that has led to resistance when the British came and says, we will survey the land now. We will take the best land, prepare it, and give it to our settlers. And the French Métis did resist in alliances with, for, with a number of First Nations that also led into battles and fought uh, colonialists at that time. The second resistance was crushed by Canadian military. And basically from there, they captured Louis Riel, and he was hanged and executed in 1885. But all these memories of struggle have built a very profound sense of Métis nationalisms out west. And these stories belong to the Red River Miti Nation. What I'm suggesting in my research is that other Miti communities across the land did exist as well. And we share a culture that is rhizomatic, which means by this that we don't have a unique center of culture. We have many dots of culture that connects and weave through the history of fur trades and its subsequent developments across uh, various colonial lines and borders. And that culture is shared and takes different coloration and different history per their localities as well as the different relationship they have locally with indigenous people. And all of that can coexist. Now, some people disagree with me and says, no, Sebastian, because all of these other Afbraid and Métis people didn't acquire historically a sense of themselves as a people. Only the Red River Métis, through their resistance, acquired that sense of maturity as a people. And they're using that argument now in universities and across in politics to discount the experience of other Métis across Canada that we yet even sometimes don't even know due to the lack of records and the fact that we didn't take it seriously for some times due to colonialization. So I'm asking these Red River Métis proponents, for example, to just accept the fact that we can coexist, honoring our differences, and all be descendant, proud descendants of Métis people or uh, Samele, but it's it's still a hard quest, right? Because basically, the, a lot of Miti people, unfortunately, mimic the categories of colonization by which they want to mirror those those political language. They want to mirror those political existence and say, "We are a nation too." Yes, you could be a nation, but you don't have to mimic the violence of colonizing nation into what you're doing. I don't know if that's too much of a long answer, but. Uh, uh, there's another documentary being shown tomorrow night at 9 o'clock on PBS. It's called Medicine Fiddle. I made it. It's, uh, it's about Métis fiddling. But one thing I want to mention, uh, in the course of making it, I was told a story about Sugar Island, a guy from the uh, same Sugar Island that Marty is talking about, uh, a guy from the Bureau of Indian Affairs of, uh, was visiting so the, the people wanted to, the native people wanted to honor him. So they imported headdresses from the Sioux, even though that was not their mm -hmm. custom, just to put on a good show. Yeah. And they had a drum. And as soon as he left, they broke out their fiddle and started dancing amongst themselves. When I was trying to figure out what to name the film, the first idea I had was to call it Devil Shake a Half Breed, which is the name of a very, very popular uh, Metis tune. And because uh, the Catholic Church tried to suppress it and so on, burn the fiddles, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the older people thought that's a great title. A younger person, a friend of mine, Kathy Narcooli, uh, she said, That'll cause a race riot. Uh, and so we called it medicine fiddle mm. and escaped that particular issue. But that tune, Devil Shake a Half Breed, really kind of captured it. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you for that comment. Very much so. Oh, <coughs> so, S Sebastian. Yes. Uh, great uh, presentation. I had a uh, question regarding. Uh, Wannabes and mm -hmm. pretendians. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we, we often, uh, if it's localized, Wishinabes. <laughs> anyway, um, it seems like, you know, as far back as I can remember, we've had this label for people who want to be Indian, but they have no ancestry whatsoever that they can show right. uh, proof. And we refer to them as wannabes. We've seen it uh, happen, I mean, as far back as, you know, uh, gray owl, right? I mean, we can see instances in the media and stuff. It seems like there was always this tendency in the United States to glom on, the wannabes wanted to glom on to Cherokee. The, the old joke is they all have a Cherokee princess. So, I mean, either this woman had a bunch of kids right. or there's a lot of princesses out there that we didn't never yeah. know about, right? But then they started to also glom on to Blackfeet or Blackfoot. They, you know, both titles, they said, okay, you know, I'm not going to say I'm Cherokee because people laugh about Cherokee. I now I'm Blackfoot or Blackfeet. So now we have people who are starting to say I'm Métis. And it's w becoming one of the wannabe categories, how are, how are Métis people who are truly Métis uh, reacting to that? Well, that's a good question. Um, I react myself with the teaching of Louis Riel. So basically, when people are challenging me to identify it as Métis, I'm, I'm, I'm referring back to Louis Riel. I'm saying, what is a Métis? Well, I come from French Indian backgrounds, from the fur trade, uh, a dissentered people from various places. Um, but there's people who disagree with me. I will say, no, you need to be specific to a nation, and it will bring primordialist argument into it. Going back to that question, so there's no clear answer, but going back to anxiety about the indigenous questions, that's a very old thing. That's a very old team. And I would say it's a predominant white team, predominant colonizing team. People that will say, well, they're afraid of who's not really indigenous. Because, like, remember that, I would like to suggest that for the white folks around is that an indigenous people is their past. It's remnant in the zoo. It goes back to authenticity. You have to hold it together, and that shows the departure line by which civilization offshoot and the white, you know, progress happen, future oriented. And you will forbid the First Nations to be in the future. They'll be in the past. They'll be dwelling on the past. They'll be arguing still for their treaty. But they have no actualizations of their rights and their possibility of a living culture that says, we are an indigenous country. And if we are an indigenous country, and if the culture is predominant, then you will bring people, newcomers, as indigenous people eventually. Just like you make them Americans, you can make them into indigenous cultures. Now, the bad thing is that when people don't have ancestral connections and they claim that they're, they're having ancestral connections, uh, they're, they're, active, they're taking the place, it is suggested, of indigenous people, and that is, is seen as bad, you know, including for the Miti people. I'm saying just be authentic with who you are. And the path of the Miti people, to take just that example, is a path of humbleness, at least for me, in my experience. People says, do you have indigenous ancestry or ancestral relationship? And they will challenge that. And then you say, yes, I have. Then the next question is going to be, well, you don't have enough. Or it's too far. Or it's too little. So what is enough? What is, why are we thinking in terms of blood quantum when Louis Riel himself said, you don't have to have blood quantum to be a Métis person. Louis Riel says that himself in 1885 in his, in his letters. So basically, a Métis, when is a Métis assimilated once an, 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 an question was asked to an elder? And the elder said, when that Métis person decide to be assimilated. So for the Métis people, because they're part in boat canoe, they always have this existential choice of blending with whatever culture they may choose. So people are like, that's unfair, because I didn't have that choice. I was on the res, and I was under like duress, and my grandmother went to residential school, and I say, yes, that's true. And as a Métis person, as a white passing Métis person, you don't have the same right in terms of historical responsibility when it comes to uh, you know, compensation, things like that. You don't have the same, it, it's not pan-indigeneity here. We have to make specific claims, specific relationship per our own experience and being humble about it. And I think that the path of a Miti person, at least in my case, it's a path of humbleness, claiming what you are in terms of relationship and the possibilities of resilience. Is it a perfect story? No. Is it full of contradictions? At time. But I think that the pretendian conversations and the fake identity conversation, 
it has certain truth to it that we have to honor, but it's extremely dangerous as a game, I would suggest, because it crushes the possibilities of resilience. And I had numerous students with ancestral relationship that are now shy to like, am I gonna go up front and talk about my, my relationship? No, because I, I, I'm afraid of being shy about it. I, I'm gonna be ridiculed about this. I'm gonna be told like, what are you? Have you have lived experience of indigeneity? Do you speak the language? So you see that the witch hunt for the authenticity of indigenousness is handless. It will pursue itself till itself devour itself. And I think that at some point we have to make it stop in terms of self-determination, in terms of sovereignty for indigenous people, but we have to take into consideration that there's a number of indigenous people there that are still um, trying to come to self-determination and recognition. Some people are not there yet, and we have to make sure that these people have a right to exist as well and to self-determine themselves. So it's a complex answer, but uh, complex answer, but hopefully that, that puts it a little bit. Okay, well with that, we're gonna have to move on thank to you the so last much, session. Guys, thank you so much, guys, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, it was wonderful. Oh, sure. Is it? There we go. I don't know why it's doing that. Sorry, I think that bomb. Do we, well, you didn't introduce this question, but whenever we're going to have somebody here, it's just the, the next presentation is uh, Kate. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. You uh, are going to stick around. Please uh, don't leave and take your seat. Um, though it's going to take me just a second here to open this file up. Uh, yes. So our, our next presentation is something a little bit different. Um, our presenter is Sarah Pienen. Sarah Pienen is a musician, a scholar, a composer, a multimedia artist who grew up in Hibbing, Minnesota, uh, later went on to study at the uh, Sibelius Academy in Finland as a, for fiddle or the violin, depending on which way you want to look at it. And we, she wanted to be here in person to do this presentation, which is more of a musical and philosophical journey about the effects of mining on her hometown. Uh, unfortunately, she's having health issues and can't travel. She was going to do it live via Zoom today, but she couldn't do that for health reasons. She just wasn't feeling up to it. So today she recorded this and emailed it to us. So I'm just gonna play it. And uh, if you do have any questions for her afterwards, I can get you her email and, uh, and she will be happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm not getting any volume. Okay. Well, that might have something to do with it. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Bayunen and I am here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people. 
but I grew up on the Iron Range of Minnesota, which is about three hours north from here. And the Anishinaabe people have been living in that area for hundreds of years before my family ever arrived there. And I'm here to talk about my project called Mind Songs, Sounding an Altered Landscape. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person or even live virtually. I'm dealing with some health concerns and so I'm recording this video day of, but I uh, hope the symposium has been wonderful and I, th I thank uh, Dan Truckee for asking me to present some of my artwork here. My family uh, came to the Iron Range of Minnesota from Finland and Slovenia about 100 or, and then some of them 120 years ago. I have spent time in Europe. I lived in Finland for many years and um, I'm interested in the change that happened with European immigration, the, the change in our connection with land and environment. The Iron Range of Minnesota started, started off as um, underground mining, but pretty quickly moved to strip mining, open pit mining of iron ore um, in the late 1800s. And so I grew up learning the violin um, around all these pit lakes. Um, if you're familiar with mining areas, you probably know that once you extract as much as you can from an area, the pits are left open and they fill with rainwater or spring water and become this beautiful azure color often. And then also there are the overburden piles. And so the, the landscape is completely transformed when you have an open pit mining region. And I didn't think much about it as a child. It was just, it was just my home, my home landscape. But later in my life, I just became more interested in knowing the land in a different way. Because I feel as a European American, um, my ancestors and most immigrants, you know, entered um, environments and this became more interesting you know entered um, entered extraction industries entered a relationship with the land that um, stemmed from profit and it was you know resource driven and in a non-renewable way which was very different than the way that Anishinaabe and Dakota and other native peoples uh, had been relating to the land for centuries or millennia. And so now in this current time, 2023, you know, we ask ourselves, how did we, how did we end up here? So that's part of my inquiry with this project, getting to know the landscapes around me better. I am trained as a violinist and as a musician, and I uh, became interested in field recording, environmental recording, sound recording, um, some years ago, and in that field, you use uh, different types of microphones to record sounds in the environment. So the types of microphones that we're used to record sound through the air, but I have microphones that can record sound through water or through vibration, through surface only, such as metal, for example, um, that can record um, uh, like radio waves um, that can record uh, just uh, softer sounds that we wouldn't normally be able to perceive with the human ear. 
So some years ago when I started the project Mind Songs, I set out to just explore the region with uh, these microphones and listen. Listen to both the man-made environments and also to the natural environments. For me, listening is, um, it's a meditation. It's a type of, um, is a way of slowing our brain, it's presence. And it's a way of, of, of really communicating something. Well, it's listening to something. <laughs> it's literally listening, uh, listening intently and with focus. And so I wondered how listening intently would change my environment my childhood environment, um, how I could flip these relationships or um, question the relationships that I had with the land because of extraction industry, because of uh, immigrant culture and the way that everyone entered a system that was profit driven. And just the way that I could find more groundedness and peace for myself in an environment that I loved and felt like my childhood, but didn't feel like my ancestral home because I've also lived and spent a lot of time in one of my major ancestral homes. And the connection that I feel with the land there um, is something much more profound and generational than what I feel with um, the Iron Range of Minnesota. So I'll share some examples of the work now. Um, it's, it's compositional work. It's not only just environmental recordings. I, I added violin because part of it for me was a very personal journey also with my artistry to combine interests and ground myself in, in my artwork, continue searching for what felt like a full and true representation of my life on this planet so far and what I was, where I want to go, what I'm interested in and honoring where I've been.
Tällä pohjan tähden alla Alkaasimamme Mutta tähden tuolla puolen Taisen kohdun saamme Täällä on kun kukka sillä Aika lyhyt meillä Siellä ilo loppumaat on niin kuin enkeleillä Täällä syyden huokailee Itku silmän täyttä, siellä sydän iloisee ja silmä vie mun näyttä. Sinne toivon siivillä, sydän pieni lennä, siellä ilo loppumaat on niin kuin enkeleillä. Tässä on pyritään. Tässä on enkel. I wish I was a little bird, I could fly to heaven like an angel.
and if on hindered 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 the American hindered should and if on hindered and if on Profitable and successful industrial projects. Better automobiles. Better automobiles.
She is slag. She is slag. She is crushed. She is crushed stone, stone unburied, geologic, masabi iron. I slide over her body, the excavation. I drift over knee and she shin and float stone. over her shattered self shattered heaped self. upon the earth. Over boulders submerged, emptied and made into freight. A cold current from the drift, the bow lifts. She is bedrock, the bottom of the continent. Through her, runs dark and invisible rivers without shore. She, she is, is the divide. divide. In seams of the tectonic plates, she is lit, she is lit with dynamite and extracted. Extract carried by trains to the ship, a of shoulder of iron, in, in place of her head, a deep shaft. Okay, um, did she join on Zoom yet? Okay, so why don't we pull her up on the screen. Uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah has decided to join us. She says she's feeling up to it, so we're gonna have her come on and she can talk a little bit more about it. If you have any questions, you can ask her. So here, why don't I stop this? There she is. Hello, Sara. Hello. How are you feeling? I'm okay, thanks. Yeah, I it's I'm I'm actually fighting a pretty serious breast cancer at the moment, so I had a difficult morning and I just couldn't speak live about things, but I'm happy to join you for some questions if there are any. Yeah, does anyone have any questions you'd like to ask Sara about what about the film? We've got one coming here. I was wondering where the images came from. Who made them? Yeah, I, I make all the images. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. an audiovisual artist, so mm -hmm. they all come from me. Uh, I do a lot of drone work. The first, this was a compilation of many Mind Songs pieces. Um, the initial one that came is archival footage from uh, a mining film right. made in 1936, Oliver Mining. The rest are mine. I had the feeling that it was too bright in here. Oh, <laughs> probably. You know, usually yes. they are projected in bright light. I mean, often projections happen in too bright environments, and I had the yeah. feeling they would be more um, atmospheric even. Um, in a darker place. <laughs> yeah, probably the lights should have been off. They were just, this work was just um, exhibited in the gallery space. Okay. And yes, it's dark usually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> With okay. headphones. Thank you. Any other questions for Sara? Excuse me. 
Did you do all the singing yourself? Uh, <clears throat> uh, some of it. Some of it was archival from the Alan Lomax collection of uh, recordings um, from Michigan, Upper Midwest. And uh, the Lament, which in Finnish is called Itku Laula, uh, Laulu, it was uh, sung by a friend of mine, Emmi Kuitinen. As she lives in Finland, it's it's traditional Karelian lament singing from the eastern part of modern Finland. It was written actually. Emmi made that that lament specifically for my grandmother, who died in uh, 1936 when my father was just a few years old. She died pretty tragically, so Emmi was kind enough to make a lament specifically for her. And that piece actually showed the destruction of the boarding house that my great grandparents ran. My great grandparents raised my father, and that boarding house, uh, where and that was where my grandmother was born, was destroyed over the period of a few years. And I documented it. And all of these works are in their full forms um, on my Patreon page. They probably make more conceptual sense when you sit with one and you read the descriptions. And all the descriptions are on my website as well. Are there any other questions? Michael has one. Just a second. Phil Donna here. <clears throat> uh, it's a, obviously a very dark film. I feel like after a long abstinence from drinking, starting drinking again, uh, which I won't. But I was wondering, Right toward the very end, <clears throat> if I heard the narration correctly, there was a river flowing through a mining pit. I, I saw all this sort of ragged s sandstone along the cliff, but yet I, I saw water that looked clean. And after all these scenes of destruction, I, I was wondering, about what was in that particular scene. Yeah, that piece uh, is called In the Water-Filled Mine Pit. I, I just want to preface that this, what you saw right now is not a, a full film. It's excerpts from uh, audiovisual works that are meant for galleries uh, or to be viewed online. So it's not an entire narration in itself. It's a compilation of many different things in this project. And that piece was based on poetry by uh, the Finnish American poet, Sheila Paka. And she recorded in her own voice as well. And that uh, it's a, that is a tailing, I mean, it's a mine, it's a mine pit. It's, it's a water filled mine pit. So the water that you see there is in the mine pit, like a lake, um, except it's not a natural lake. And it's, uh, it is pretty clean and clear because it's been filled with rainwater and, and spring water, and it's not very old. And they're very deep on the iron range on the Masabi Iron Range. They can be up to five hundred feet deep. Any other questions, Sarah? Comments? I just want to say I just thought the visuals were fantastic, um, and the music. What a Wonderful combination, and in the footage, the initial footage that you uh, that you had the the the, uh, the film footage of them doing the uh, the shipping and all of that, I thought that the music was just a different. It's such a dichotomy to how we often think of things like that, which would have like ragtime music or you know big band music. You know, oh, here they are at work uh, to have this very atmospheric and almost ominous sound to it. Was that something you were going for? Yes, I think it is very ominous what has happened. <laughs> and I think the reason we had ragtime music or um, some music like that is because we were trying to celebrate, um, you know, uh, new America and the ideals of new America, extraction industries and um, capitalism, basically. So I do see it as, as quite ominous. Um, and you know, very beautiful as well, and interesting, and hopeful, and all sorts of different things. Um, yeah, and the compositions are based, they're, they're somewhere between sound art and music. I wouldn't, they involve improvisation, um, some, you know, chance music, field recordings, so 
um, also like sound art, and they really came from me listening to the environment for really long periods of time. And I would say they're best taken in with headphones. So the gallery exhibit had headphones, and then you're really immersed uh, in it. Hello. Uh, thank you for your work. Um, any ealing from mining? Any what from mining? Ealing. Ealing? Yeah. I don't know what that is. Ealing. Getting your health back. Healing. Healing. Sorry for my French accent. Oh, from, from mining? Yeah. So you mean, um, has mining caused me to heal, or is the harm of, am I healing from the harm of mining? Well, the way in which you want to answer it. E both. Both. Absolutely. I love where I'm from. I love so much of the history. I just think it's a lot broader than what we've been told. Um, you know, there's a... Yeah, <laughs> that's a very complicated question for somebody that's dealing with very serious cancer and thinking about um, epigenetic trauma, thinking about the trauma of immigration, um, you know, that all, I think, you know, European Americans still carry, thinking the trauma all around us and, and, and on the makeup of America, thinking of my own, you know, family trauma and also loving where I come from and knowing all the beauty of it. I mean, life is just a lot of contrasts. So, yes and yes. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, Barb. You know, it just seemed it was a really fitting, um, fitting presentation uh, for this day. I felt like it really pulled everything together, and um, I really appreciate it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and for your beautiful work. And uh, hopefully we can bring it as a gallery installation here. Uh, at Northern sometime in the future. We'll work on that, so. That would be nice. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that's the 23rd Sondereger Symposium, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience and being here all day and, uh, and for your comments and uh, to the presenters as well. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate it.